Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to Ask About Asthma 2022. Uh, you are all very, very welcome. Um, my name is Stephen Goldring. Um, I'm a paediatrician uh, in London, and I'm also the uh, lead for the Northwest London CYP Asthma Network. It's absolutely brilliant to welcome you and people from all around the country to this really special uh, conference. Um, just whilst people are joining, um, you'll notice there's a QR code on the screen and if you link that uh, and open it, it will take you to um, a feedback uh, which we're just going to kick off with uh, in a few slides time uh, just to get a feel for what's happening in uh, across the country. Um, the question which we'll come to is what are the biggest challenges you're facing in CYP asthma at the moment? Okay, next slide. So just whilst people are, are joining, um, let's just run through some uh, instructions. Uh, it's a Teams live session, so it might be different to something you've been on before. We really want to get, make this an interactive meeting. Uh, and one of the great ways of doing that is if you can put your comments uh, into the chat box. Now, the speakers will try and answer all the questions or we will answer all the questions if it's a technical issue we've got a technical team will you provide you that the support you need um, if it's it's a question for the speakers then they'll either be answered in the chat or we'll put them to the speakers at the end uh, live i'll be um, chairing the first session and we'll try and get through as many um, as questions as we can uh, and can you if you can like um, the questions that you think are particularly you know strong or if you were thinking the same question and, and you just like it then it's more likely we will answer that so um it's kind of democratic uh in that in that way um we're going to record this conference um and we will be sending out the slides so you don't need to be taking notes um or, or such like um we're using menti so have your phone nearby um we're ready to scan for qr codes um, and if you could complete the survey monkey evaluation at the end, that will really help us to make sure that we, we're, we're kind of setting out to achieve our objectives. Um, just sort of thinking again about the chat and making this as interactive as possible. There's so much good work happening across um, the country with asthma now, where we're all revving up with the national bundle. Um, and, you know, I've been to this conference since it started six years ago and every year I, I just bu come away buzzing with ideas and enthusiasm and uh, if you can share things that you're doing in your in your local area in your locality um, in the chat just just shout it out um, because we, we pick up so much that way uh, nowadays. So running through the, um, the, the, the plan for the day, we've got a, a brilliant lineup of speakers. Um, it's really diverse um, and we're thinking about things in all different ways. Um, we're going to start off um, with um, the kind of getting the, the bigger picture, if you like, from um, Oliver Anglin, um, who's um, the Clinical Director for Transformation for London, um, and then Jen Ten Townsend talking us through the National Bundle of Care. Um, and then we're going to focus in on health inequalities um, uh, with a panel Q&A and then after lunch, and we want to the next slide, we're looking at air pollution and asthma, uh, then teenagers uh, and transition. Uh, and finally, we're looking at data, the all important data to drive imp improvement. Um, and then we'll finish with how do we put this national asthma bundle uh, into action um, with two great talks? So it's a very packed day. Um, it's it's worth saying, obviously, we're very grateful to all the speakers for and for yourselves for rejigging your diaries. Uh, we all know we had to move the meeting at short notice and the team, the technical team have done a great job of rearranging everything, but many of the um, presentations are pre-recorded because people just couldn't, um, you know, had commitments which they couldn't change. So bear, bear with that, um, but a good proportion are live as well. Um, so there'll be plenty of um, live discussion. So uh, if you would like to 
scan the QR code or go to Menti um, and enter the code, which you can see there. It is 21986432. Um, give people a few moments to do that. And the first question, what are the biggest challenges you are facing in CYP asthma at the moment? And um, I think when the, the team are ready, we can mo go on and see um, how what, what people are saying. So let's have a look through capacity. Compliance with young people and their medication, always challenging. Not enough time. Knowledge issues. And of course, we've got the training package now addressing that. Variability in practice, and I think that's a real key theme for today, that, that sense of, of things being unequal. Using data to understand. Some great answers coming through here. So keep those coming through. We've got 23. The numbers are going to keep shooting up, I hope. If you want to join this, if you go to menti.com and use the code there so it's easy to log in on your phone, um, put the code in. If you've got any technical questions joining the menti, put them in the chat um, and the team will support you. The September spike, yes, agreed. Staffing. Yeah, so lo lots of challenges, huge amounts of challenges, um, which, we, which we're also familiar with. Trying to get an asthma nurse. Not enough nursing hours. These are really, really, really helpful to have this information. Um, OK. Good, OK, it's good to see you all joining and sharing. Got 41 now, fantastic, 42, so it's zooming up. So I think we are going to be almost ready to start uh, our first speaker. So as I said, this is um, the first speaker is Dr Oliver Anglin. Um, he's a GP and he's the kind of clinical asthma lead for CYP in um, asthma in London and he is pre-recorded um, statement but uh, he's going to talk us through health why health inequalities are the focus for our conference today so I will hand over to Oliver. And um, uh... I'm very sorry that I'm not able to be joining live um, with with the rest of you today. Uh, my name's Oliver Anglin. I'm the clinical director for children and young people transformation for NHS E London region um, and uh, very delighted to be part of um, Ask About Asthma for 2022. Um, so what is Ask About Asthma? So this is a fantastic campaign that we've been running um, in uh, London now for the last uh, six years. So this is, our, this is our sixth year of the campaign and just so pleased to have been part of it over the last few years and um, seeing it grow in importance. Thanks to the wonderful commitment of the um, wider team, the whole sort of whole system that have, uh, that have really championed um, children's asthma and, and specifically this campaign. So uh, thanks to all of you who have joined us again this year. For all those who are new, it's great to have you on board. Um, so the Ask About Asthma campaign um, typically coincides with week 38, um, which uh, which is basically the time after children come back from their summer holidays. And we know that statistically we see this increase in paediatric admissions and attendances to the ED department. So the campaign is always timed around this time of year to highlight um, uh, highlight that you know the the events of week 38 to raise the profile um, amongst um, the workforce, but also importantly um, amongst the wider population as well. We've always had three key asks, so we've tried to keep the campaign simple by focusing on three areas of priority. One that each child or young person with asthma ought to have an asthma uh, personalised asthma action plan. Um, each child or young person with asthma should be able to use their inhalers effectively and should be uh, taught how to do that on a regular basis. And every child or young person with asthma should have a review um, 
uh, every year and importantly after every attack. And this year we've decided to add a fourth ask. Um, this is um, kind of quite timely and, and something that a lot of us will be made much more aware of recently um, is to consider the um, to consider the impact of air quality and air pollution on lung health and specifically as this applies to children with asthma. Um, we've got some really interesting um, presentations and conversations around this this new area um, later on in the day an opportunity to to kind of pose some questions for you all. Um, so as well as adding this fourth ask um, around that we, we we decided this year to, to, to theme the, the day theme the conference around um, health inequalities. So you, you'll hear some really interesting stuff around that threaded through all of the different presentations as we go um, as we go through the day. So um, I think we're all aware of, um, of the fact that there are variations in outcomes across London. I'm going to come to a couple of really interesting um, data slides um, shortly. But then this is just to highlight some kind of key messages that I think a lot of us will be aware of. So if we look at these levels of predicted um, of, of uh, current recorded um, asthma prevalence, we'll see that these um, that there is some variation. But importantly for all of us, our predicted prevalence should be closer to nine or ten percent, um, depending on the data that you look at. So it does seem like our recorded prevalence versus predicted prevalence of, of children with asthma is uh, is quite low and this is something that we we all need to be aware of and and, and are working towards developing um, developing systems improvements that will actually address this sort of issue. <clears throat> also importantly the map shows these areas of deprivation these kind of hot spots of deprivation just to just to demonstrate again that um, we we have these kind of areas of deprivation across all of the different ICS um, footprints um, and that um, uh, uh, and that as such we need to be aware of the impact the deprivation has on outcomes for children and young people with asthma. And why are we including the fourth ask? This is a this is a I find just a, um, a, a really interesting a really interesting slide and we'll have more information around um, impacts of air quality and on, on asthma later. But I think uh, we we now know that um, air quality does um, uh, adversely affect uh, lung health and um, we are very aware of the fact that in in areas of higher pollution that we see um, poorer asthma control children more likely to develop exacerbations when exposed to poorer air quality um, and the data now behind this is is so strong that it's become a really important part of um, of, of, of discussing asthma with children and also um, ch you know, children and their families and also you know um, the importance of raising the profile of this as an issue amongst those of us who work with children with asthma. Um, increasingly now we should be thinking about how we raise these issues and support children and young people around um, this, this kind of information. What information are we giving them? How are we helping them to understand it? And importantly, what can we do that will um, support them to then take um, action which will support their, support their lung health? Now coming back to the deprivation piece, as I said, we're going to thread this through the course of the day. The deprivation is such a such a key issue around um, uh, health inequalities um, broadly um, and also deprivation in particular um, uh, really has an impact on um, on outcomes for children and young people. We know that children and young people living in areas uh, uh, with high levels of deprivation are more likely to be exposed to triggers such as um, uh, mold or uh, parental smoking or these other um, these other issues also more likely to be in areas where there's poor air quality. We know that children and young people growing up with homes in homes of mold and damp uh, are much more likely to be prone to coughing and wheezing. And we also we also know that um, children and young people from those most deprived areas who, who suffer with asthma are much more likely to end up with an exacerbation requiring um, admission to e admission to hospital or ED attendance. And the data is really kind of strong around this. Also thinking about um, health inequalities, um, we have to think about the role of ethnicity. Um, and I think this um, this graph speaks um, 
speaks to that really quite dramatically. So this graph is showing the percentage of children and young people from um, who were um, uh, who were admitted with asthma, depending on their um, ethnic background. And I think it's really quite remarkable that, that it's so striking that we see this disparity, this over representation of um, of people from um, BM, BAME uh, cohorts. And the other thing which is, you know, um, also kind of fairly obvious here is we don't seem to be shifting the needle yet on this over representation. So something really to be aware of. And again, why we're, we're sort of focusing on on inequalities and the impact on outcomes for children's asthma. Then another area just to just to think about is the, the role of gender. And the evidence is coming out now in terms of the imbalance between um, uh, between the sexes, depending on depending on the age. We see in terms of asthma related admissions, we do see it in the younger age groups. We we see uh, boys more than girls being um, uh, being admitted into hospital with with exacerbations. But what's been really interesting and has become much more apparent now is in the uh, young people age bracket, those 19 to 24. Again, this kind of real disparity in terms of um, uh, or uh, disparity in terms of um, admission admissions data. So something which we're only just beginning to become aware of is that um, these 19 to 24 year old uh, um, uh, female patients with asthma are, are are much more likely than their male counterparts to actually be developing um, uh, exacerbations and worsening of their asthma and and this is really quite interesting it's something that's fairly new into the public domain and something that I think a lot of us weren't previously aware of so some again you know another example of of of, uh, of, of inequalities within within outcomes uh, that brings me to the end of my introductory presentation um, as I said I'm sorry to not be there I've been so closely involved with um, asthma um, improving asthma outcomes in London over the uh, over the last few years and importantly being part of this really valuable um, conference, this opportunity where we all get to get together to um, recognise the issue and to, to campaign for the problems around children and young people with asthma, but also um, celebrate some of the fantastic work that we have been doing together to really influence and improve outcomes for children and young people with asthma. So um, I hand you uh, Back to our chair and I um, uh, hope you all thoroughly enjoy the rest of the presentations today. OK, well, I'm going to say thank you on behalf of everyone um, to Oliver for a great talk there and for setting the, the scene so well. Um, and it's a great pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr Jen Townsend, um, National Lead for CYP asthma uh, for NHS England and also a consultant paediatrician in uh, Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, so you are very, very welcome and, and over to you, um, Jen. So first of all, thank you everybody for asking me to be um, involved in this conference. As, as Oliver said, it's, it's um, a fantastic conference and a great opportunity to share all the fantastic work that's been going on. Um, so the purpose of my talk today is to first of all define exactly what do we mean by health inequalities and specifically what do these mean for children and young people with asthma. We're going to look at the extent to which health inequalities and asthma exist nationally and have a think about some of the drivers behind them and then look at what the National Asthma Bundle of Care is doing to help address these inequalities and improve asthma outcomes for all children and young people. So when we talk about health inequalities, what we're talking about is the preventable differences in health outcomes between groups. And these groups can be separated by a number of factors, but for example, it can be socioeconomic status, it can be geography, it can be ethnicity, it can be any number of things. But we know that health inequalities are one aspect of it, but inequalities in general, we know affect every aspect of a child's life. They can affect their ability to go to school, get a good education, do their homework, can affect their housing environment, their social environment, and all of these things knit together to uh, affect the child's health outcomes. And whilst health inequalities have always existed, 
we now know that there's a widening gap between the health of children from wealthy backgrounds and those from deprived backgrounds. So as Oliver's pointed out, we know that there are multiple health inequalities that exist in asthma and there's lots of different drivers for them. But for the purpose of the talk today, I've looked at um, four main ones, which is poverty, ethnicity, culture and geography. And um, the what a huge driver for inequalities in asthma, as Oliver has alluded to, is poverty. Next slide. So when we talk about poverty, uh, uh, when we talk about poverty, what we're talking about is um, households where their income is 60% below the medium national income. And the latest uh, data tells us that almost one in three children now are living in poverty. This means that nearly 10 children in every school class are living in a home where there isn't enough money for them to meet their basic needs of food and fuel. But there's also inequality within inequalities. So this graph looks at the percentage of children living in poverty divided up by region across the UK. And you can see that the worst areas in the country have nearly double the levels of child poverty to some of the best areas. This slide looks at the um, percentage of children living in poverty according to region, but over time. So we can see how the, there's been changes over time and the different coloured lines represent the different regions. And you can see that some regions have actually had some real improvements in child poverty, particularly the East Midlands and the North West. But at the same time, other, other regions have seen almost exponential rises, particularly Yorkshire and Humber and the North East. Um, and the North East now for the first time has actually um, gone above London and now has the highest rates of child poverty in the UK. So we know that um, poverty exists, but what about deprivation as a driver for health inequality in asthma? Well, as Oliver's already said, we know that children from deprived communities have worse asthma outcomes than those from wealthier communities. If you live in a deprived community, you're more likely to develop asthma. The, incident, the incidence rates of asthma um, are 36% higher in children from deprived communities compared to those from the least deprived. And not only are you more likely to have asthma, but you're more likely to have uncontrolled asthma. Of all the uncontrolled asthmatics, 50% of them come from the lowest income category. So it's no surprise that not only are you more likely to have uncontrolled asthma, but you're also more likely to go to hospital with your asthma. So this graph looks at emergency admissions for asthma um, based on deprivation profile, with one being the most deprived and 10 being the least deprived. And this graph is looking at emergency admissions in the northeast and North Cumbria, but the picture is the same across the country. And you can see that there's a strong correlation between deprivation and emergency admissions. But worse than that, the most deprived children are disproportionately represented. So you're twice as likely to be admitted to hospital with your asthma if you're in the most deprived decile. And if you are in the bottom two deprived deciles, that accounts for nearly 50 percent of all hospital admissions. And these inequality, um, if you can just go back. These inequalities persist right through into, into adulthood. We know that um, Poorly controlled asthma is a risk factor for developing COPD in future life. And data tells us now that children from the poorest quintiles are five times more likely to develop COPD as adults. And the reason that deprivation is such a strong risk factor for, for poor asthma outcomes is that the, the uh, factors associated poor asthma outcomes are also associated with deprivation. So if you're living in a deprived community, you're more likely to have to breathe in um, polluted air, be that outdoor air quality or indoor air quality from poor housing with damp and mould or secondhand smoke exposure. We know that it's more expensive to have a healthy diet, so you're more likely to have a diet that's high in fat and sugar. You're more likely to be overweight or even obese, and these are associated with poor asthma outcomes. If you're living in, in a deprived home, there may well be more family chaos and more maternal stress also associated with poor asthma control. And there may also be lower health literacy, which means you'll have less tools available to allow you to self-manage your asthma. And we know that good self-management results in an up to 25% reduction in hospital admissions. 
So we know that poverty is a huge driver for health inequality and asthma, but that, that's not the whole picture. There are many other things. Um, so ethnicity is another one. So um, we know that children um, from ethnic minorities independently have a higher incidence of asthma, but they also have higher levels of poverty. And what we do know is that these risk factors, they have a synergistic effect. So when you add them all together, they're greater than the sum of their parts. And this probably accounts to a degree for some of that exponential growth that we saw in those higher levels of deprivation. This graph looks at um, hospital admissions um, for children and young people with asthma based on their ethnicity um, over time. So the, the light blue um, line is, so is children from a white background. And you can see that over time, there has actually been improvements in um, asthma admissions for this group of children. But compare that to the other, the other blocks, which represent the other ethnic minorities. And you can see that there's been very little, if any, improvements um, in these groups. So we need to equal up these graphs. The, the improvements need to be equitable across the board. Culture is another driver for health inequalities, and this can be due to language. So um, they're not getting the same out of their consultations. They're not getting the same information, but it might also be related to health beliefs that aren't addressed appropriately. And these communities can also be quite isolated. And then geography can be another factor, and it can be something as simple as just your distance to adequate health care. So rural communities and coastal communities, they have much further to travel to get to good health care. Um, but as is the theme for the day, air pollution is a, is a real significant driver, not just to um, the number of ex exacerbations, but also the incidence of asthma. And this can be a real problem, particularly for travelling communities that of, often set up their sites near busy roads. And this was um, brought into stark reality with the, um, that cor the now famous coroner's inquest, which showed that um, for the first time, outdoor air pollution was a significant contributor to, a de to the death of a young girl from asthma. So we know that health inequalities exist and we now have some understanding of the drivers behind them. But what can we do as healthcare professionals and as communities to try and address these health inequalities? So we're all aware of the debates that are going on nationally about um, air pollution and the cost of living crisis, but this is not the whole picture. There's lots that we can do right now as individuals and as healthcare professionals to try and mitigate the downstream effects of these issues. And this is one of the drivers behind the National Asthma Bundle of Care. So the bundle provides a framework for local systems to help them lead on a range of improvements to support children and young people with asthma. And I was interested that one of the um, challenges that came up at the start was about variability in practice. And this is one of the one of the key outputs that the National Bundle of Care wants to achieve, which is a standardisation of care across the country. So all children have access to excellent asthma care wherever they live and whatever their level of deprivation. Systems now have a set of deliverables and these reflect the very basics of good asthma care. But crucially, these deliverables are coming with support and resources to help them um, act on them. Um, and if we want to have the biggest impact, this needs to be done as a whole system approach. We all know that children don't live in isolated silos of education and home life and socialising, that they just flow seamlessly between them. And so if we want our interventions to have the biggest impact, they need to do the same. And this is why the formation of the ICSs and the ICBs is such an opportunity, because it's going to allow systems to deliver interventions um, in an integrated way, hopefully crossing those previously pretty much uncrossed boundaries between health, education, um, local authority and social care, so that interventions can be across the whole system and on all aspects of the child's life and hopefully give them the best possible um, success and outcomes. And by understanding the drivers for these health inequalities, the bundle has been able to use these as targets for change. And the first one has been education. So if you, thank you, move to the next slide. So um, one of the key outputs that we want to achieve as part of the bundle is that 
all professionals who have, who come into contact with a child with asthma have the skills and the tools and the knowledge to do this effectively. Um, so one of the one of the things that we've produced has been the national capabilities framework for children and young people with asthma, and this outlines the key skills and knowledge that professionals should have depending on the level of care that they'll be offering that child. So they these are tiered capabilities from tiers one through to five. Tier one is really aimed at non-healthcare professionals that have frequent contact with children. Um, and then as you move through the tiers, um, the knowledge and skills that you need increases. And this reflects the input that you have in that child's life. And aligned to these capabilities, there are now education modules um, with modules one, two, with tiers one, two and three being free. Um, and these are aligned to the capability so that learners know if they do the modules, they've been given the knowledge that they need to help them meet those um, learning outcomes. And as part of this, it's about raising awareness of health inequalities so that professionals know their impact, know that they exist, and then they're able to have those conversations openly and without stigma with their families to really understand the impact the health inequalities are having on them as individuals. And then we as healthcare professionals with that knowledge can advocate for our families, we can form relationships with, with um, other organisations and offer targeted interventions. We've also been working with OHID, previously Public Health England. So um, knowledge about asthma is, is now part of the schedule of interventions. So health visitors and school nurses will, will understand more about asthma and will be able to identify those families most in need and signpost them to the relevant areas. But it's not just about educating healthcare professionals, it's about educating families and the young people themselves, because we know that by self-managing their asthma, they're going to have the best, the much better outcomes. So there's now lots of resources available through Asthma and Lung UK and also Beat Asthma. And the Beat Asthma resources just this week um, have now been translated into the six most commonly spoke languages in England. So, they, so that will hopefully um, give those families from different uh, cultural backgrounds um, access to, to better resources. We've also got some age specific resources. So there's the fabulous Asthmanauts comic book, which is available on the Futures platform, but also on Beat Asthma. And this is aimed at five to 11 year olds and using characters and stories and games. It talks them through what asthma is and what their different treatments are um, and, and how they work. The Moving on Asthma team in Sheffield have also developed a range of really fantastic videos aimed specifically at young people so that they can get access to the information that they need, but in a format that they want. So lots of videos, there's some raps, there's some patient stories, and they're all hosted on the Beat Asthma website as well as on the Moving on Asthma web website. And for those of you that are more sort of technical minded, there's the Digital Health Passport Asthma app, which will allow you to manage your asthma on your phone. Another driver for health inequalities in asthma and the theme for today is air pollution. So we know this is a, a real driver um, in asthma. And one of the other things the bundle is hoping to achieve is that people are more aware of, of, of air, air pollution and um, the impacts it can have and the things that people can do to mitigate its effect. We want it to be part of every conversation. So healthcare professionals are educating our young people and our family that this is a real issue. There's lots of resources now about how we can form asthma friendly schools um, and school streets projects that can help reduce the impact of, of air pollution and also signposting to other local initiatives like the London Mayor Air Pollution Alerts and Greener Streets. Poor quality housing, it can be a, a real problem, particularly for the more severe asthmatics, where their indoor um, air quality is thought to be um, contributing significantly to their poor asthma control. And through the bundle, we're trying to help support systems to form those relationships with the lo local authorities so that these children can be prioritised. Um, and as Stephen mentioned earlier on, it's, such, it's so important to have the data so that you can understand the needs of your area. We've now got an asthma, asthma dashboard, um, which at the moment is, is collecting secondary care data on admissions. But by the end of this month, we'll also be collecting data on deprivation. So looking at um, index of multiple deprivation and ethnicity and how this relates to, to the hospital admissions. And shortly in the next iteration, we're hoping to be getting primary care data, prescribing data, um, 
um, data on how many people have been trained, um, uh, maybe on school, lost school days and also hopefully on air pollution. And having all of this information will be so important for um, systems to understand the needs of their areas so that they can target interventions where they need them most. They'll also be able to benchmark their outcomes against other areas of the country and specifically about areas of the country that have similar populations to them. And then outside of the bundle, there's a really um, exciting pilot project that's going on um, in one ICS in each of the seven regions in England. And this is about um, identifying children who are most at risk, who have got the worst outcomes and putting high levels of intervention in, in place that are specific to their needs. So the pilot involves funding for two asthma practitioners, a band seven and a band eight A at each of the pilot sites. And also they will have access to a digital risk stratification tool, which gives them lots of information about um, children and young people with asthma in their particular patch and allows them to identify those children most at risk that they can then target. And the ambition of the pilot project is that the children and young people who are most at risk are identified um, and there'll, there'll be a better understanding of why these children are most at risk. And then the practitioners can work at a systems level, both horizontally and vertically, so through primary secondary care, as well as through local authorities and education and other arms length bodies to um, offer targeted interventions and hopefully improve outcomes. There's also going to be regular meetings with the other ICSs and the, the practitioner leads across the country so that we can share good practice. And ultimately, if we show that this leads to significant improvements in outcomes, they can lead on scaling this up across the country. So in summary, we know that there are significant health inequalities in asthma and we have some understanding of the drivers around them. Next slide. There's lots that has been done and there's a lot more still to come, um, but we firmly believe that by working together, we really can level up these graphs and improve asthma outcomes for all children and young people in the country. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jen. That was superb. Um, you have done a brilliant job of summarising the kind of synergistic effect, uh, that was the phrase you used, of all these multiple factors. Um, it can feel quite overwhelming. Um, poor air, poor diet, family chaos, lower health literacy. How, where do we start? I think where we start has to be individual to, to the, the family in front of us. So there's lots of tools that, that are now available out there and it's just talking. I think the first thing is having the conversation with those families, because I think in the past, due to lack of awareness and lack of knowledge, those conversations haven't been happening. So I think the first place to start is have those conversations, see where the biggest challenges are in those families and where the biggest impacts would be if we could make changes and then look at the tools that we've got available um, to 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 tackle them, but also acting as advocates for our families and trying to make links across these boundaries because we can't just do it in health. It's got to be a, a whole system approach. Thank you. One question from the audience um, was around the involvement of education and the role of school teachers and other personnel at, at, uh, at, at schools. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so it's when we so I, I along with Oliver as part of the sort of the training capabilities work stream and um one of the areas we were worried about was education because we don't really have um, any levers there in the sense of, you know, we can't really sort of, we can encourage them to, to do the training and know more about asthma, but, but that's about it. But interestingly, um, so the tier one training, the training that rolled out first, and in the first three months, we've had um, 5,000 people complete it, which I think demonstrates that there really is an appetite um, for teachers and schools to know more about asthma. I, I've run, run various workshops with young people with asthma and what came out so strongly each time to them was their biggest fear area was going to school because mm. they didn't feel that the teachers had the knowledge um, to safely manage them if they were having an asthma attack and I think talking to teachers I think they felt the same way too so I think giving them the knowledge is something that they, they're really welcoming and now with um, asthma, for, asthma for any schools being sort of high on the agenda I think this is only going to you know improve and really make a difference to to how those young people feel when they're in school. Absolutely thank you I mean I think the, the other 
area that people have come in that's a, a, perhaps an even harder area than schools because I think there is a tradition of health education in schools and we're building on those on those sort of background work. Um, housing is a real challenge and I know from submitting my uh, bundle objectives but it's still red and it seems to be red for a lot of people up and down the country. Where, where do we start with housing? So I think that you know this is going to be a real challenge um, but I think the, in terms of where we start it's got to be about forming those relationships so at least those um, conversations are being had the people that work in the local authority and in the housing are at least aware of the impact so that when they're approached this isn't a kind of out of the blue what earth is going on um, it's on their radar um, and I think we've, we've got to start there at least and then just build to the, together um, what opportunities we can specific to the local area. Can I ask what um, engagement there is at a sort of high system level you know in terms of housing and um, and schools, is there is there very senior buy-in to, to these uh, concepts? Because it, I know at an ICS level, it can even be hard to find out who the lead is. But who would you talk to about housing? And do, do you have a sense of who who the person's door we should be knocking on? So I think at, at a senior level, um, the conversations are had, but I'm not I'm not sure those relationships are particularly developed. I think it's very mm. much been a case of individual regions and areas need to build mm -hmm. those relationships themselves because it's all so different and um, that it's got to sort of come down to that sort that sort of level. Yeah okay um, I'm going to pick up a few more questions in the chat uh, so I'm looking at my screen apologies. Um, I'm a school nurse um, we complete care plans and training for all staff so that's a nice positive comment. Um, one of the main problems in our area is overcrowding in private rented accommodation and no availability for council houses that are large enough to accommodate them. Yeah, I can't answer that. I mean, absolutely, it's, yeah. a, it's a real issue. Yeah, lots lots coming in about housing. It is yeah. it is a challenge, isn't it? I mean, if you had a uh, just thinking, we've just got, you know, one one more minute or so. What what would be your, you know, ne next best step, your key kind of take home message for how to get to get started if you're you know in your locality what to take away from this whole day where to make a start and put the national bundle into action yeah so i think the the uh, different regions are at different stages but i think really build your asthma networks make sure that you've got key links across all areas in your ics and in your region with education housing local authorities social care um, and get everybody involved and invested right at the start because i think if you're finding the solutions together at the beginning you're much more likely to get the buy-in and then get the right solutions being built so i would say the very first place to start is get your network sorted and start from there OK, thank you. I think we'll end on that really positive note. And thanks again for summarising everything so well. Uh, thank you, Jen. Um, so great. So um, we're going to move on to our next session, um, which is hearing from young people. Uh, and actually, we're going to hear the voices of young people. Uh, and I think this is a well, this is a pre-recorded with uh, Emma Sparrow joining with some live mentee. So uh, over to the next um, session. Hi, I'm Demi. Our group comes from all across England and we have collected voices from children and young people and their families during our clinic chats across the UK. We as a group joined up together from all over the country. Some of us personally are affected by asthma and others are affected through people they know. So we are on a mission to improve asthma care and services for children and young people and we hope to help young people's voices to be represented and actions being taken due to these voices rather than being shrugged off. We need your help and hopefully we can fight for the rights and health care of young children. At the moment things need to change. Although asthma care for children often isn't in the spotlight, one in 11 children have asthma and yet there's just not enough support. 76 of people in England can't afford prescriptions, meaning many families with asthma can't get the medication they need. Some don't even know what to do when they get an asthma attack, with only less than 25% of children having a personal asthma action plan. Over to you. All this together leads to the highest asthma deaths in the last century, 
and has increased by 40% in the last decade, something needs to change. In fact, the UK is one of the highest rates of asthma deaths among 10 to 24 year olds in Europe. One in six people don't know asthma is fatal. We need to change this. Every day, more and more people die from asthma. With your help, we can save lives. Over to you. During the last few years, we as a group have been involved in providing feedback on a NACAP report that investigated the experience of children and young people with asthma. We went through the report together and discussed what, what we liked about the structure and content of the audit and what we thought we could do better. We found that the report was not in the best format for children and young people to understand. and We wanted this to be a key feature of how it was presented. To solve this issue, we designed three leaflets divided into three groups four to seven, eight to 15 and 16 plus. We felt that these three age categories were important because of the difference in understanding that different ages of patients will have. The content of these leaflets includes what care an asthma patient should receive upon entering a and &E, as well as what plans should be in place when leaving the hospital, such as a personal action asthma plan, PAP, and a suitable plan in order to maintain education about asthma within the young person's school. Alongside our leaflets, we are also in the process of creating an animation about the same information, which we hope can help children and young people to understand the report. We have also worked on our own independent project, investigating the quality of asthma care and information that different services provide in order to improve our own support structure. We did this using mystery shopping of different services websites and also by interviewing members of the multidisciplinary teams within those services. This has helped us find out about what information we should put into our section of the RS, RCPCH website, which is now live. While we have already made, up, made a large amount of progress condensing the report for children and young people, we still hope to be able to distribute these mediums nationally so they can have a bigger impact across the whole country. Listening to the voice of others and sharing our own experiences, we have identified a number of inconsistencies of care. The level of care that is offered at our GPs. Arriving at a and &E if you have an attack. Knowledge, awareness and understanding of school staffs, staff and teachers. Today we'll be asking you to make a pledge and sign up to make a change in your clinics. That will improve patient care. So get your thinking caps on. We have a mentee that we'd like you to take part in. So if you could please log into menti.com and put in the code that's on the screen now to take part, we'd appreciate it. Okay, so this is where hopefully you can hear me now and um, we'll be needing you to go on menti.com so m-e-n-t-i.com and use the code 36274401 so i'll just give you a second for people to join and then we will start with the questions that have come from the young people and this is where we get a bit interactive mid video just to keep us all on our technological toes so go to menti.com and um, then go to code 36274401. And I can see that people are starting to um, get into it and do your, your heart, which is fantastic. OK, we'll get a few more people joining and then we'll go to the question. So the question should come up on your device, whether you're doing it on a a computer or on your phone and I've got it on my phone just to make sure that it's working and then um, there's a couple of questions that have come from the asthma and me ambassadors and it will help them with their projects so I'm going to go to the first question so what area of asthma care do you think needs the most improvement and you can slide your answers over for all four so is it inhaler tips and techniques so you can have strongly disagree or agree, mental health support, having good up to date personal asthma action plans and links between services. 
so you can do yours now it might be that you think that they're all super important you might have different scales between them and then just click submit and then you can see that the numbers are rising at the bottom We'll just give that a few more seconds. And then we'll be going to the next question. All looking fairly similar um, in how much we agree if they're important or not, but it's um, links between GP, hospital and schools, which is just in the lead at the moment. OK, last chance to join in. As we go to the next question. OK, so how do you gain the voice of children and young people in your clinics? So this one you just um, type in an answer and if you're not working with children and young people, don't worry. Um, you can either say not working with them or you can say um, another suggestion that you would maybe use because I know that it's a mixed audience. So yeah, if you just type in your answer and I'm just doing mine now, then you can see that they will start to come on screen. And this is a way for the Asthma and Me ambassadors to get some ideas, but also to see what's working and how they can provide some different resources to help the different ways that you're engaging with children and people in your clinics. And Menti could be one of the ways that you may be using, which is what we're doing today. And you'll see that the, they'll start to roll round as more people do it. So the young people have been working so hard on this presentation and these questions, um, which and they've been doing it for a couple of months now. So they'll be following on Twitter on the hashtag just in case you uh, want to give them a shout out and obviously share the pledge that Jamie has asked for just before we went to the questions. Some good ideas coming in, so surveys, doing face to face, um, asking them, speaking to them, doing it one to one with the parents or without, doing questionnaires, going through community organisations, focus groups, that kind of um, stuff. So also a really good way to get some ideas from other colleagues if you're thinking of doing this or would like to get going in the future. OK, I'm going to go to the next question. So they're keen to find out if you check inhaler techniques at each appointment. So do you always do this? Do you most times do it? Sometimes you do it annually or you never get the chance to do it. So that's it, just keep popping in your answers. We can see that always is uh, at the moment leading, which is fantastic. And they'll be keen to, to see these scores when they meet on Saturday. So we'll be able to share all your answers with them then. OK, last opportunity. To do this one. And the next question is. What do asthma services do well? So this is where again you can just type in your answer. And it might be something that you're really proud of that you're doing with children and young people or in your other services if you don't work with children and young people. It could be something that you've seen with others. It could be um, something that you've had a really good comment from a patient or a family and you, you know, want to shout about it because it is about us finding out what people do well so that we can duplicate that across the country. So I'll type in one that the young people were really 
impressed with. So Croydon Hospital at Home have got a really good Instagram. And if you haven't seen it already, the young people have had a chat with them. They've reviewed it. They've put it into their newsletter that's gone out to all the paediatricians. But definitely have a look if you haven't seen it already. This is always a hard bit where the audience think that they're able just to, you know, watch and take in all the information. And this time the young people are trying to get information from you. So we've got flexibility with appointments, um, asthma friendly schools. That would be really interesting to hear about. Um, signposting around mental health in a structured way. Looking at education and health promotion, having specialist clinics. Making sure that children and young people have got their care plans and their personal asthma action plans. Listening to families, communication support. Running a hotline, fab. Young people from our side would really like to know more about that. Um, also some education on the risks of poor asthma control, having um, specialist nurses, doing transition and transfer appointments, asthma friendly schools. So lots of these they would really, really like to know more about and they've got a little bit of a call for your support um, towards the end. So last couple of opportunities and if there's anything that you've wanted to say but the question has gone on too quickly then the email address comes up at the end and, and please do just take a minute to email the young people so that I can pass it on. Okay so this one is what does asthma mean to you as doctors and nurses? And there could be other allied health professionals or commissioners online so do just pop in a word or two. And then it should come up as a word cloud. So they're keen to understand what it means to different people, because again, this will help them to target their messaging, to improve their resources, but also to know what words are being used when people are talking about it. Um, so what does it mean to you? And just pop your words in. And then they should come up on the screen. And we'll be getting close to the end of the questions, then you can hear back from the young people. They've got a couple more bits to tell you about. As you can see, education's currently um, been said the most amount of times, which is why it's bigger. This is how the word clouds work. So if it's been said more than once or twice or however many times, the bigger the word will get. But it's a really handy um, little system mentee to do things like this instantly. So we use it all the time in our sessions as well with young people. OK, so inhalers is coming up. Chronic inhalers and education are now kind of equal so many words they're gonna they're so gonna love this when i show them on saturday i might also um tweet it straight after the session okay so yeah education's still coming up strong so we've got lifelong inhalers long-term condition chronic condition breathing controllable um, good control, all common words that have been used a few times. And then I will just see if there's one more question. OK, so from your experience or your knowledge, do patients receive their medication in the first hour of admission in an emergency situation? And again, <clears throat> excuse me, the answers are always, most times, sometimes, annually, never. And then it'll be time to get back with the video. So always, most times, sometimes. Annually, probably not an option if they're going in as an emergency situation. 
or never glad that no one selected that one yet. So always, most times, sometimes. And we can see most times is in the lead at the moment. So we've had one response so far for never. And again, if you're aware of the NACAP, um, which is the National Asthma and COPD Audit Programme, they've got information about this and have been collecting data on this for children and young people's asthma. Okay. So don't forget if there's anything that you wanted to tell us that you couldn't tell us um, because the questions went too fast, don't worry. But I'm just going to um, start off the video again and try and line up in the right place. Now you might just hear Demi saying the questions. We'd appreciate it. Just at area of asthma end, care do you, just do you in case we had her reading out the questions as well. What do asthma services call? It's a nurse medication within the in an emergency situation. So what are our next steps? First, we had to continue our mystery shopping, looking at different organisations and the quality of asthma supports offered. Is it truly in 80 young people? What could be improved? We are also in the process of designing a two minute animation about our asthma priorities following on from our audit and the level of care children and young people should be receiving on arrival to hospital. Another thing we hope to do is to go out to clinics and examine the asthma care available there. We hope to get information from young people on what they want their asthma clinic experience to feel like. What type of support do they want from their doctors? Are they currently receiving that level of support? Based on the responses, we hope to make ranked guidelines on what a good asthma service looks like, with a strong emphasis on the responses most recurring by young people. This feedback will be given to clinics, a really useful way for them to see exactly what improvements need to be made so that young people feel relieved and at ease when they walk out of the clinic doors after an appointment. We would love to do this for schools as well. So how can you help? We would love for you to sign up to have your page reviewed so we can give you feedback in our mystery shopping project by emailing us. You can also share the information leaflets we designed in your clinics. There's still a lot of work to be done to improve asthma care, but the RCPCH and DUS asthma ambassadors are passionate about making change and working with you to make this happen. Thank you for inviting us to speak today. We hope that we can work with you again and together improve services and outcomes for children and young people with asthma. So just in case you did want to email in any other thoughts or questions and the email address is and underscore us at rcpch.ac.uk and they've just finished their animation so they are keen to um, show you as the first people that are going to get a chance to see it. They're doing the voiceover on Saturday but they wanted you to see it. and this is something that they've created for um, you to use in waiting room areas, on your social media, on your um, websites. So I'm just going to read it out as an example as to what the anima the voiceover will do. So hi there, I'm Charlie the Cricket and I have asthma. I need medication to help me breathe. Last time I went to the hospital, this happened to me. After arriving at A&E, I received medication in an hour. They checked me to see if I knew how to use my inhaler correctly. Next, they created a personalised asthma action plan or PAP just for me. This tells me and others like school or family what to do when I need help with my asthma. In hospital or at the doctors, they might ask you if you or anyone in your household smokes. And this is important for the doctor to know a secondhand smoke can affect your breathing. It's good to know what to expect when you leave hospital too. I had a follow-up appointment, a medication review and an inhaler technique checkup. 
but do remember to attend your follow-up appointments so that they can watch, they can see other patients if they weren't able to see you. Fun fact, did you know crickets don't have lungs? Thank you to the young people from the Asthma and Me Ambassadors, part of the Children and Young People's Asthma Audit NACAP for making this video. They've also made leaflets to help you when you go to hospital when you have an asthma attack. Go to www.rcpch.ac.uk forward slash asthma dash ambassadors to download them. So that was the movie premiere of their um, animation that they've created to go with their leaflets. And their final question is um, on the same code as before, so menti.com 36274401. They just want to know if people would be happy to share when we finished it. Um, and we've done the voiceover at the weekend in waiting rooms, websites and social media, and it's going out on our social media this afternoon as well. So I will leave that running so that you can answer it. But thank you very much for listening to the Asthma and Me Ambassadors. Well, thank you very much. That was absolutely fabulous. Um, I think you've all given us some really good ideas there, um, which we can take towards, and we would love to help. I think is the is the is the collective thumbs up. So generated lots of support. Uh, thanks very much, Emma. So we're going to move on um, to our, our panel session. Um, so we have um, three twenty-minute presentations. Um, which we're going to watch uh, sequentially and then a panel discussion at the end which will take us up to lunch. So uh, first is um, Rachel and Emma from the Association of Young People's Health whose title is Clarifying What We Mean by Young People's Health Inequalities. So that is over to you Emma and Rachel. Hi everybody, my name is Rachel McKeown and I'm here with my colleague Emma Rigby today from the Association for Young People's Health um, to set the scene about why young people's health inequalities are a really important topic when we think about asthma and young people's health generally in the UK. Um, at the Association for Young People's Health we work to better understand the health and well-being needs of young people aged 10 to 25 in the UK context. So we do this through research, through engaging with young people and through advocacy work as well. We're not condition specific, so we take a broad look and look at young people's health generally, which provides us with a really great overview and context for this conference today. We're delighted to be here at the Ask Our Asthma event today, um, and we're really excited to talk about two topics that are really important to us, young people's health inequalities and also young people's voice and young people's experiences. Um, how we're going to do the talk is I'm going to talk about young people's health inequalities and then I'll hand over to Emma later who will talk about young people's experiences. We hope that our talk today provides a kind of background and context, context to the rest of the speakers and presentations that you'll hear from through the rest of today. So why are health inequalities is important and why do they matter for young people specifically? So this is a really important topic for us at AYPH and for me specifically as I work on a dedicated project looking at this topic. So th this is part of a wider Health Foundation funded programme called the Young People's Future Health Inquiry, which takes a broad look at what's important to young people's health for now, but also for the future. And we're looking at health inequalities as a really important area, as we know, even through COVID, but the cost of living crisis at the moment, how important this is for young people. So why young people thinking about that 10 to 25 age range? Well, they represent 11.8 million young people in the UK. That's about 20% of the population. So it's a really huge number and it's important that we meet their needs appropriately. Adolescence is a really key period of development. So that's social development, but also brain development keeps on growing until the age of 25. Young people are transitioning through different life events. We know this through education settings, um, going through primary to secondary school and then maybe into tertiary education or higher education after that, but also other different life events, moving away from home, different friendship groups, those kinds of things as well. It's important to reflect on this age group because often the general narrative is that young people are considered to be a healthy age group, but we know that there are specific needs of young people and we need to get this right now if we're going to prevent future ill health in the future. 
A lot of long term conditions, including asthma, become onset during this period, but also things like mental health problems as well. We all know the statistic about 75% um, of mental health conditions are brought on before the age of 24. Um, and it's really important to think about the interplay between different physical and mental health conditions as well. And also thinking about those long term conditions, young people are often developing their own habits and self management techniques during this period. And it's important that we get those right and thinking about how young people can foster healthy behaviours going into the future. So I guess in terms of my focus on health inequalities, here's two really key resources that I'd like everyone to take away from today's event. What we've done at AYPH through the programme is kind of set out the soul about why health inequalities are important for this age group. I think the narrative is often focused on um, when we think about life expectancy and the older age groups, or maybe even when we're thinking about children and young people, often the focus can be focused on the early years and not to five. But we want to make sure that when we think about health inequalities, we're still thinking about what happens in that 10 to 25 age range as well. So what we've done is we've put together this briefing paper clarifying what we mean by health inequalities for young people, and it really sets out all of the context for why this is important. And then on our Youth Health Data Hub, we've collated a range of different charts and information about really giving the evidence base about this is a really huge problem and it's something that we need to address. So I'll go into these. I won't go into these in loads of detail, but give some snippets and highlights from both of them through the rest of my talk. In our briefing paper, we wanted to go back to basics and give a bit of a definition for why what health inequalities are for young people. So this builds on the NHS England definition, but really makes it specific to the age group. So we've got here that health inequalities are the avoidable and unfair differences in physical and mental health outcomes between individuals or groups aged 20 to 25. And these are caused by the economic and social differences that influence the conditions in which young people live, learn, work and socialise. These factors influence current and future health outcomes. So it's not just about young people's health now, but really thinking about the influences now and prevention in terms of the future health as well. And as we've mentioned, young people's developmental and life stages makes them particularly sensitive to changes in their environment, providing an opportunity to improve or worsen health inequalities. So those changes and transitions are kind of a crucial time period in thinking not just, OK, things might go worse, but there's opportunities there for, in, for us to intervene and create positive health outcomes as well. So building on this definition, what we did is we created a conceptual framework to think about the processes through which different health outcomes, be that in mental or physical health, are caused. So this um, conceptual model is really thinking about those pathways. So on the left hand side, we've got the um, real causes or drivers of health inequality, and those are the things which we know fairly well. So thinking about those economic structural inequalities and the wider social determinants in the environment. So I know there's a talk later this morning on this in more detail, but thinking about those things such as transport, education, housing, the built environment, how all of those things have an impact on our health. What we've tried to unpick is this middle section here, which we've called the levers. So how are those economic and social determinants translated into different health outcomes for different young people? So we've got four general topics here, which again might not be surprising to people, but is useful to think about and think through how our work might influence these areas. So firstly, we've got accessing services and support. So access is a real um, key issue here, and we think that could be things in terms of language, communication, or more physical access barriers in terms of how services are designed, um, digital barriers, those kinds of things. Really closely linked to that is the second point, which we've got experiences of services and support. So do people have a positive experience? Are they likely to re-engage with the service in the future? And when we think about services and support, yes, health services is so important in this, but we kind of wanted to take a broader look at services as well. Where, where are the other places that young people are interacting? Is that schools? Is that youth centres? Or is that other areas of support which we don't know about? Thirdly, we've got health behaviours on there. We know that we don't want to make young people the centre of the solution. So it's not about young people to solve this problem themselves, but recognising that health behaviours are shaped by the environment in which young people live and recognising that health behaviours can prevent future health outcomes. So 
really focusing in on those um, positive health promotion behaviours, so things like sleep, diet and exercise as well. And then finally, we've got relationships with others. So we know how important for young people, especially as they go through those transitions, relationships can be. So that can be the relationships with professionals, but it can also be relationships within the family, with the parents and carers, but also with peers. And we know how much influence that can have on young people's behaviours, development and whether they do access these services. And we just included the Aragon background as we know that this kind of uh, cyclical relationship here, it's not linear. Um, and really when we think of these levers, it gives us a bit of a frame of reference to think about the work that we do in the day to day. Is there anything we can do in these areas to really help limit and reduce health inequalities for young people? So I mentioned on our Youth Health Data Hub, we've got some of the evidence base. We've actually got over 40 charts on there looking specifically at health inequalities faced by young people. And what we've done to make it clear is we've divided it up into those three sections of our conceptual model. So we've got charts on the causes, charts on the levers, and then charts on the health outcomes themselves. I'm not going to go through 40 charts now. I know we've only got a quick amount of time. So I've just picked a highlight of some charts here. And firstly, I've chosen mortality rate for a couple of reasons. Firstly, often when we think of inequalities, we think of infant mortality rate and we can really see those clear, um, those clear differences in terms of infant mortality. But what we've got here is more data to supplement that, looking at the mortality rate of 10 to 24 year olds. And again, we can see that linear relationship there with more deprived groups of young people being unfortunately more likely to die than the least deprived young people. I think this is important to reflect on because we know that deaths in this age group are not common, but they can be prevented. And also it makes us think about um, mortality rates within asthma, which I'll get on to a little bit later. Secondly, I've put in a chart here on hospital admissions for the age group across 10 to 24 years. What we can see here is really striking in that the most deprived young people are more likely to be attending hospital. And again, this is for all causes for attending hospital, but I'm sure if we looked at this data just by asthma, we'd see similar trends as well. And then I've also put in a chart here on um, experiences of GP practices. And I think firstly, what's most striking is that for this age group of 16 to 24 year olds, we can see generally fairly low numbers of young people saying that they had a very good experience in their GP practice, which is really important because um, that's going to affect the level of which young people re-engage with these services in the future if they don't see them as really valuable and have haven't met their needs. Um, but we can also again see that linear relationship with the most deprived young people being least likely to say that they had a very good experience of their GP practice. And I'm not going to go into too much data on asthma because I know that will be covered in other talks, but I wanted to reflect on a piece of work we did a couple of years ago at the Nuffield Trust, where we compared um, a range of different adolescent outcomes against other countries around the world. And this chart here shows asthma mortality rates, and we can see here the inequalities by different countries. And UK is unfortunately towards the bottom of the list in terms of greater number of asthma mortality deaths. And again, reflecting on this point, it's really important to think that these deaths are preventable and there are things that we can do to reduce these inequalities. Finally, just to mention, one of the most common things I get asked when I'm doing presentations on health inequalities is, well, what can I do um, to do to help with this? Obviously, the main thing it seems that we need to tackle is po child poverty and those broader social determinants. But I might work in this hospital and I don't know what I can do. And I think what we try and say is, well, think about those levers that we spoke about, access and service, experience of service, health behaviours and relationships. Is there anything I can do in these areas? Um, earlier this year in this um, QR code here, you can find a link to a list of resources we compiled, which kind of thinks about these different areas and thinks about some of the maybe quicker wins that might be able to be implemented in different services. And we know that there's kind of no one silver bullet when it comes to health inequalities and there's no one thing that can be done. So it's thinking about a range of different things and what's kind of within our own gift and what can we do. So hopefully that's a bit of um, hope about things that we might be able to do locally. I'll now hand over to Emma, who's going to talk about young people's experiences of health inequalities and asthma care.
Thanks, Rachel. That's great. Um, hello, everyone. As Rachel said, I'm Emma Rigby um, and I'm, a, I'm the Chief Executive of the Association for Young People's Health. Um, and as well as all that really important work on um, data and health inequalities, something that is woven through Rachel's work um, are young people's experiences of health inequalities. Um, and that's something that's really important to us. And I'm going to just tell you a little bit about a couple of bits of work that we've done, specific, some one specifically on asthma and one um, more broadly around young people's experiences of health inequalities. So if we can go to the next slide, that would be great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so this first piece of work um, is, you, some of you may have seen this before, um, took place early on in the pandemic. Um, and uh, it was a piece of work which focused on better understanding the challenges and barriers that children and young people face when they are managing chronic asthma. And it had a specific focus on understanding the experiences of communities of young people and children, children and young people who were more likely to experience marginalisation and potentially face health inequalities. Um, you can um, access all the resources on our website. So there is um, this um, engagement report, but there's also um, a scoping review of relevant um, research in this area. Um, uh, but the, the, they, the focus was really on um, how those young people felt about their asthma care, what kind of things worked for them, what services um, they thought really supported good asthma control for them. Um, and really importantly, we worked in partnership with a range of organisations, including Friends, Family and Travellers. So we worked with young people um, from the um, Gypsy Roma Traveller community, as well as the Race Equality Foundation, working with young people from um, particular um, minority ethnic groups. Um, and RCPCH and us um, and their work particularly focused on um, the areas of um, clinics and, and services in areas of um, higher deprivation. So if we can move on to the next slide, we, this slide really highlights some of the things that young people told us um, in this um, uh, engagement work that you can see in the report. Um, and there are a couple of things I wanted to highlight here. One is that we really just it's really important to speak to specific communities because whilst there are um, commonalities and common themes that were highlighted in this piece of work, there are also specific issues for particular communities. And that quote at the top left really highlights a particular issue around um, pollution um, for um, young people who are living on particular traveller sites. Um, and there are other issues um, that were raised that were specific to particular communities in this work. There's also some cut across to other health issues and that second, the, the middle quote at the top, um, highlighting some of the concern um, related to being overweight and obese. And I think that's one of the things that's really important to highlight is that you know inequalities are not in particular boxes. We often in the system work on particular priorities, but these um, issues um, are intersectional and um, cut across. And there is a real importance of thinking about not only national priorities around asthma, but how and they link to national priorities around um, reducing excess weight as well. Um, that top right quote, I think, just reminds us that um, whatever group of young people we're working with, they are facing maybe uh, general perceptions about them using particular health con conditions to get out of doing something, um, uh, in this case PE, and I think that's really important that we remember that message throughout the work. Um, and then down the bottom, I think those quotes really highlight the importance of um, information and communication. Um, on the left, that one about um, using um, sources of um, support on the internet, thinking about how we understand where young people are getting their information from and making sure that they are um, as much as possible being able to access trusted sources of information. And on the right, the real importance of that personal relationship um, that um, young people have with um, a clinician, whoever that might be, um, and, and really um, thinking about how we can maximise the opportunities for those um, to happen. That was really highlighted by the young people we spoke to. So if we go to the next slide, on this slide, we I've just highlight the um, the young people's the recommendations. So these are the kind of common themes that came out of the engagement work that we did. Um, I've talked about um, access to trusted information in formats that work for young people, um, and and um, 
the second one kind of follows on from that really, um, that youth friendly services um, in non-clinical settings that young people can access um, easily with those opportunities to build relationships with staff was also really important. Um, the work also highlighted um, the, the importance of anti-prejudice training for healthcare staff um, and a recognition from children, young people and families that there are um, some, some challenges that we face in terms of reducing um, prejudice that some groups of young people can face around their asthma care um, and thinking about how we um, tackle some of those broader issues. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about myth busting in communities that was certainly highlighted as an important theme um, and I think a real opportunity here to look at how um, relationships can be built with community organisations that can help um, clinicians and others to um, have those conversations and think about strategies to, to look at myth busting with particular communities that you're trying to target. And then that final point about the broader education in the community. And I think the quote at the end really highlights why this is so important. So if you, um, this young person saying if they were a traveller, you wouldn't get support because they just didn't like you. Um, and that was both at school and the doctors. And those are the kinds of um, quotes which really highlight why this, um, by tackling these issues um, as really important, as well as understanding what young people are saying. So if we, let's move on to the next slide. And this is the, the final slide really is to highlight another piece of work um, that we have done uh, more gen generically around young people's experiences and understanding of health inequalities. Um, and after our slides, we'll show you a very short video or a very short animation, um, uh, which tells you a little bit more. But this is a tool that um, is designed for young people. There are other tools that are there um, for um, professionals as well. And it's not about young people solving health inequalities, um, which is Rachel reflected on, but it is about understanding that this is an important topic that we need to be able to talk to young people about. Um, and this tool helps young people think about what their rights are and what um, is really important for their health in relation to accessing um, equal and fair um, opportunities to achieve good health. It thinks about what young people can do to support positive change without putting the responsibility at their door for solving these really complex and huge issues. Um, and also some tools for young people to think about how they plan what they want to do. And this, along with a whole um, uh, um, set of lesson plans for schools, um, is uh, a resources which you're really proud about, about trying to get some of these conversations happening with young people um, in the places and the communities that they are working in. So then final slide just um, gives you our contact details. We would love for you to keep in contact with us and um, you can get all the resources on our website. Um, our email address is there um, and you can also follow us on Twitter. Um, but without further ado, that is the end of the presentation and I'm just going to ask Rachel now to um, share the animation um, and um, thanks very much. It is important for young people to stay healthy but for some, it can be harder to stay healthy than others. A research project funded by the NIHR School for Public Health Research wanted to find out why by asking young people what they thought. Here are some of the things young people told them. Local activities are too expensive for young people in my area. And they also don't always feel safe in public spaces and have been harassed. I've discovered that you have to find allies and that you can start to change communities in small ways. Find out more about our ideas in the toolkit. Now we're going to move on straight away to uh, Sarah Woolnow, um, CEO of Asthma and Lung UK, who's going to look at this through the lens of women's health uh, and uh, inequalities. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Hi there. Thanks very much, Stephen. I'm assuming someone will put up my slides or I. Yeah, there we go. Um, so yes, um, I, I'm Sarah. I am the, the, the Chief Exec of Asthma and Lung UK and a word about what we do before I get into um, 
the, the meat of the presentation. Um, so we are um, a national lung health charity. We are the merged Asthma UK and British Lung Foundation. And we do three main things. We fund medical research so that we understand more about asthma and other lung diseases and how to tackle them. We provide advice, support and services. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that later. And we also campaign and advocate for change in order that people with asthma and other lung conditions um, get swifter diagnosis, um, better access um, to services, uh, can breathe cleaner air and so on. So if we um, move on to the next slide, um, I've been asked to give you um, a flavour of some of the work that we're doing with a particular focus on, on health inequalities in asthma outcomes. So next slide, please. Um, this slide will be very um, familiar to, to many of you on the call. Uh, we know that around one in 11 children has asthma. It's the most common long term condition for children in the UK. We know um, that sometimes quite often it's taking quite a long time for people to and children to get diagnosed um, and a big part of our role is to raise awareness to fly the flag for um, fantastic asthma care but also um, as part of our new organization coming together and our new strategy new name um, it's to try to rebrand um, asthma and other lung conditions to try to tackle some of the stigma i mean i'm just fascinated listening to the last Last couple of presentations um, you know we know young people can be embarrassed about feeling out of breath um, and using an, and carrying an inhaler and some of that plays into for both children and adults perhaps um, a, a lack of optimum um, self-management so one of our jobs we feel is to say look lung health is everyone's business we should all take care of our lungs um, it's nothing to be embarrassed about um, and we're very focused on uh, raising that in all the ways we can. But yet we absolutely know, um, e even though asthma is a long term uh, and uh, highly prevalent condition um, in, in amongst young people, that inequalities play um, a big part in the development of asthma, diagnosis of asthma and uh, treatment and, and management. And so Michael Marmot is our president at the charity and he talks an awful lot, um, as, as I'm sure most people on the call will know about the social determinants of health. And we see that through many lung conditions um, asthma being no exception. We keep going that's it. So um, there are lots and lots of figures that we could all pull out and, and we've heard some of them this morning already. Um, but we know um, we use this quite a lot with policymakers and politicians. People are seven times more likely to die from a lung condition. That's not just asthma. That's all lung conditions. Um, if they live in one of the most deprived communities um, across the UK versus the least deprived. Um, and we know that people tell us they're more likely to um, uh, live with uncontrolled asthma symptoms if they live in a poor and more deprived community. There are lots of other markers and 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 um, stats that we could pull out. Whichever way you look at it, inequalities plays a big role in asthma and in lung health. So um, just to, to to roll back a. a, a a step or two um, we're very interested in understanding as much as we can about the key drivers of the development of asthma and if we move on to the next slide uh, we list some of them as I say we fund medical research so we are funding um, quite a lot of research to continue to understand more about the causes of asthma uh, different genetic and environmental risk factors that can make developing asthma more likely uh, we do know a lot um, we could know more uh, we know that family history of asthma plays a, plays a part, um, premature or low birth weight, sex hormones, and I'll come on to say a word more about that in a moment, exposure to tobacco smoke amongst other risk factors. Some of you will have seen there's a big story across the press um, today talking about um, air pollution and uh, tiny particles of pollution found in uh, the lungs of newborns and um, embryos. So um, environmental Mental plus genetic plus um, uh, fam familial risk factors are all playing a role in the development of asthma um, and we want to both understand that and then of course tackle some of those factors. 
if we move on, I wanted to say a particular word about tobacco um, exposure. Um, and on the next slide, um, I, I think we, well, some pictures that give you a sense of um, our continued focus. I'm working closely with NHS colleagues on both raising awareness of the link between tobacco smoke and asthma, uh, the influence of parental smoking in, in a home on, on asthma development and, and um, flare ups and so on. Um, and then something we do is to campaign for smoking cessation services um, and a very brief advice. And this idea that, uh, as many of you will know, you know, tobacco prevalence has declined in certain uh, communities. Um, we still have pretty high prevalence uh, and it's something that we can't be complacent about. We want to see really good cessation services. Uh, we signpost um, when people call our helpline or come along to one of our support groups or access us via our WhatsApp service. Um, but this is something we, we, we want to keep raising the profile of the importance of tackling um, tobacco smoke, particularly in some communities. OK, then um, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about sex hormones in women, but also girls. Um, this is some new work that we've been um, involved in, um, and it's both funding research, but also then explaining the issues as we see them and campaigning for change. Um, I didn't know when I took this job coming up to two years ago that women um, are often more likely to have worse asthma and more severe symptoms. Um, I didn't know that more women than men die of asthma and I didn't know that, um, well I did know more boys than girls um, get asthma but then th that flips um, and it flips um, often in uh, teenage years and we don't know nearly enough about why um, and we have set out on a mission as a, as, as a charity and as a research funder to try to understand more. So one of the things that we do and we did was convene a group of leading academics um, to understand what, what does the research currently tell us, what do we know, what don't we know about this issue and we published a report in April, Asthma is Worse for Women, which summarises some of those discussions. Um, I think if we move on to the next slide, yeah well, I mean this just shows you mortality, uh, women versus men and um, the following slide, what can be done? Um, so, I mean, I think the long and short of it is we don't really understand enough about the role that sex hormones play, but we do know they are playing a role. Um, and so we are funding um, nearly a million pounds worth of research to better understand the role of sex hormones. Um, we're also trying to raise the profile of the issue. So around um, puberty, menstruation, pregnancy and menopause. So actually girls, teenagers, years through the female life course um, thereafter. Uh, we know that often uh, at, at during periods or just before periods um, asthma will flare up um, and some women know this but not nearly enough do and some uh, teenage girls will, will, will understand this but not nearly enough. So one of the things we want to do is start sort of embedding this a little more in the conversations that people have about asthma. We're trying to work um, well, we are working with the Department of Health and Social Care on their women's health strategy for England um, and campaigning to say, come on, this is an issue that we need to better understand and we need to take more seriously. OK, and um, a few words then about asthma triggers. Um, of course, there are a range of common triggers um, that can lead to asthma exacerbations and flare ups. Um, and again, it's really important that people know about these and we do our best to tackle them. They include pollen, dust, cold weather, smoke and fumes and of course, respiratory viruses. And we know, bringing it back to the theme of inequalities, that people from um, some more deprived communities are more likely to be exposed to these asthma triggers. There's been some discussion already this morning about poor quality housing, damp, cold, mould, um, overcrowded housing. Um, we see this um, through people that contact us um, as an organisation and it's something we feel very passionately about, about tackling. So what are we particularly doing at the moment? Well, we've been really active on air pollution and that's something that will continue. Um, we've been most active around outdoor air pollution, although increasingly we're working on indoor pollution too. In terms of tackling outdoor air pollution, 
we're trying to work at national, regional and local level. So, I mean, fundamentally, this must be tackled at national and even international level. Uh, we've been calling on the government for bolder clean air laws, um, working in coalition with many others. We've also been working at regional level uh, with city mayors, for example, um, to campaign for clean air zones and other measures to improve active travel, to reduce air pollution. But almost the most important, I think, to, to many of our beneficiaries and people we support is understanding um, what air pollution is like where they live, where they work, where they go to school, um, where they access public services, learning more about that and then understanding what they can do in their daily lives and understanding the evidence. We published a report a year or so ago called The Invisible Threat. You know, we can't see air pollution. Um, awareness is rising and it definitely is gaining momentum as a, as, a, as a political and as a policy issue, but there's still more to do to raise awareness. And we know people often call us knowing that air pollution is a trigger for their asthma but not knowing what they can do about it and and we say to them well look we're active um at a range of levels but there are things you can do you can um you know try to understand what air pollution is like where you live you can um you know walk on back streets uh, rather than main roads you can absolutely make sure you're you're trying to manage your asthma using preventer inhalers um uh, daily and so on um, and i think giving people a bit of agency and trying to empower people as well as helping them campaign campaign at local level um, does feel a positive step, notwithstanding the, the national and, and regional action that we need. Um, next slide, please. So the importance of good self-management has been talked about. Uh, we know this, um, of course, and we have a range of resources on our website, um, child action, asthma plans, adult um, action plans. Um, as I say, we've got a nurse helpline. We take about 30,000 calls um, a year. We've got both respiratory nurses, but also healthcare advisors increasingly giving financial advice and support linked to cost of living. Uh, we've got a WhatsApp service. We run a forum. We've got support groups, including parent and carer support groups. So a big message is um, please do contact us, do, do use the support that we've got and please comment on it if you think it could be improved or you'd like to see amendments. Um, but, but as I say, we've got quite a lot of, of resources available. Next slide, please. I did want to touch on the cost of living. This is something we have become increasingly concerned about, as I'm sure many of you on the call have. We started over the summer getting many more calls and inquiries, people really worried about paying energy bills, affording prescriptions um, and just feeling pretty frightened about this winter and what's to come. We ran um, a survey, we had over three and a half thousand responses to that and actually last week we put out a media story. We know many thousands of people, um, hundreds of thousands of people living with asthma are already making changes to their lifestyle and we've been particularly worried about people saying they, they're worried about heating their homes and affording um, en energy. Of course the price cap will help but it doesn't alleviate the problems. We're also hearing a lot of people saying they can't afford their prescriptions and as a consequence they are cutting down on medication or they're going without or in some cases they're using a relative's inhaler. Um, um, so we have been synthesising what we've heard, we've been playing that back to the government and we've been saying, come on, we really think you must do more for people with lung conditions. It is an oddity that people with many lung conditions are still paying for prescriptions um, and we'd like to see that changed. We also want more targeted help, if possible, for people with energy bills if they have an underlying lung condition. So we'll keep doing that as a national charity. In the meantime, we've updated all of our financial advice and support and signposting that we that we give people and um, so that we've got the very latest information um, about, for example, prepayment of prescription charges and where they can go for more advice and support. Um, it's something we'll keep working on. Uh, we'd love to collaborate and work with others. We're working with some other conditions, but if this is something you're hearing about or you think we could be um, doing more in a particular way, please do let us know. Next slide, please. Yeah, I think this is my summary slide, really. Um, 
We do um, really try to partner and work in collaboration with health professionals to improve um, uh, asthma care, to champion fantastic practice and to support you in working hard to um, help people. We know that um, written action asthma plans, inhaler technique checks, annual reviews um, and enabling people to look after themselves are just critical components of good asthma care for children, for young people, for adults um, and the inequalities sometimes make that harder to, to deliver and to receive um, and so we do all we can to partner um, and, and provide resources. Choosing the best medication is important um, and of course our campaigning role for clean air both outdoor and indoor as well as funding medical research. So um, thank you for, for listening and having me and happy to take questions when we get to it. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, that's fantastic to hear all that information. Um, we're going to move on, then we'll come back to questions. I know you need to leave by 11.55. 11 so um, final uh, or third section, um, we have Dr Ingrid Wolf. Um, it's a pre-recorded um, slot um, thinking about social determinants of health and asthma care. Um, and then um, we were going to bring this all together and have uh, a bit of a discussion. Hello, my name is Ingrid Wolf. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to the Ask About Asthma conference. I apologise for not being able to be there in person, but I'm very pleased to have all this amazing technology that has allowed me to record in advance and be present virtually. Um, and I also want to say thank you to my colleague Nina Somerville, who is joining you for a discussion uh, on the panel uh, thereafter. So my name is Ingrid. I'm a, a paediatrician by background and a public health consultant and a, an academic, a reader in paediatrics and child health. Um, and I um, am the director for the Children and Young People's Health Partnership, um, which is behind a new model of care for asthma and other um, things. It's an integrated population based uh, model of care for children. And we're going to focus today on asthma and in particular the social determinants of health and asthma care. Um, why? Because this is important and also because we have a response to these problems that I want to share with you. So thank you again for your kind invitation. So let's start by talking about uh, what are the problems that children have um, with asthma that mean that a biopsychosocial approach is important. So I think we all know that um, there's more to health than health care. Um, and I'm not the biggest fan, to be honest, of these um, proportions of contributions with each other. So whilst health care has been cited as anywhere between 10 and 20 percent responsible for health, there's no question that health care has the opportunity to influence sort of through a kind of a filter, all of the other things that determine health. So in other words, people who have who live in more deprived uh, conditions will have challenges in access to care. Um, so you can see that what I'm what I'm getting at is that there's a complexity there that's really important. So it's crucial, I think, to think about the whole picture and how all of these various factors um, interact with each other. It's a very complex um, intersectional problem. Um, now, another thing that's really important to think about is on the right side of this slide, which is unequal social patterns. And I hope this really brings home um, some of the issues that we're dealing with. Now, forgive me for the abbreviations, ACT score, that's an asthma control test. So some, this is some research that my own group has done. And what we found in measuring asthma control test scores for a very large number of children is that girls tend to have lower scores than boys, even after controlling for other factors. Um, and also, unfortunately, black, Asian, mixed and unspecified, as this D that means that there wasn't a declaration on the form, have um, also lower asthma control test scores than um, than white children, significantly lower scores. That's hugely worrying. And similarly, even more um, dramatically, more deprived groups and populations have um, uh, lower average asthma control test scores than their wealthier counterparts. That tells us a lot about where we need to be directing our efforts in healthcare. 
So um, the other thing that we are very clear about is that children have multimorbidities in the same way that adults do, but children don't get quite the same attention for their multimorbidities. So this is looking only at the physical conditions. There's an overlap. I think everybody knows there's an overlap between asthma and eczema, but there's also overlaps with other conditions. And, and one of the most common everyday conditions, of course, is constipation. But what I'm not showing you here um, is what the overlap is between asthma and psychosocial problems. And I'll come on to that a little bit later. There's some research coming out from my group quite soon to show you how many children with asthma also have got quite significant anxiety and depression symptoms and have significant social uh, concerns too. And of course, these things interact with each other and they're very important to consider when you think about health care for children with asthma. OK, so what are we doing about all of this? Well, um, this is what we've come up with after many years of work. We've come up with a framework for improving health and care for children. And what this looks like on the surface is a clinical model of care. That's what's delivered. But underneath it is the way that we deliver it and the system underneath that. The way that we deliver care is through population health approaches. That's a very data driven approach. And it gives us the opportunity to use what we know about child health to shape and tailor a better care model for those children, but also to shape and tailor our response as a system so that we can differentially, proactively direct our care efforts to children who live in populations of higher need. Underneath that is a learning health system, a strengthened health system with all of the, the in infrastructure that is needed in order to be able to do those things. And so that means collecting data and joining it, linking it. It means interoperable clinical notes. It means a workforce that is trained and fit and ready for working across organisational boundaries. And it means conducive incentives and financing models. I won't linger more on that. I just want to just remind us all how much sits underneath a clinical model of care that is integrated and effective at dealing at, at uh, providing joined up care that is holistic for children's needs. OK, so what does that look like? It looks like a platform of care and it's but it's distributed by local neighbourhood, really by the primary care networks that are now so important. So what we formed is a child health team that has at its heart a GP, a paediatrician and a specialist children's nurse. Those three people are the core and, um, and they, uh, irrespective of where they're employed, they work um, really in primary and community care settings and they work closely together, but also with an expanding child health team. So community paediatrician CAMS, um, social prescribing and so on. And there are two broad aspects to care. One is the local child health team, which really works as a kind of cross between um, what GPs have always done and what general paediatricians have always done, but through referral in hospitals. So it's an integrated joined up approach in primary care. That's for children with all and any conditions. Um, and then there's targeted early intervention, and that's for children specifically with long term and everyday ongoing health care conditions. And asthma um, sits on that side. So um, what does that look like? It looks like um, a triage meeting where we get a list of patients that we have collected together proactively. I'll go through that in a little bit more detail in a minute, um, but that's what it looks like. And, um, and then a specialist nursing uh, service that sits within that child health uh, clinic and benefits from a multidisciplinary approach to dealing with the biopsychosocial aspects of care that we've talked about. Just like I've shown you in that in that ring diagram, that there's a wider health team um, very much joined into this uh, care delivered at primary care level. So specialist asthma nursing, they these um, nurses, Nina is, is, is one of them, they are truly amazing. They have specialist clinical knowledge of long term conditions, but they also have a very intensive focused education program that is available for parents and also other staff. They really bridge the gap between primary, secondary and tertiary care so that we have a nice joined up model that goes all the way from primary care through to specialist care and delivers consistency of care. That care is also very timely. We've been able to reduce referral times and provide real time support so that children and families with asthma know who to contact for questions and, and, and more urgent support. Um, and the team is very good at escalating and de-escalating care as they need. So let's go through a little bit more what that service actually looks like in terms of a pathway. 
Um, the first thing that happens is referral. And that's so sort of, um, fairly uh, conventional in many ways, but what we've done is widen it. So we actively case find, we look at the whole primary care list of patients, so we know who in the community has asthma, and we can contact them proactively. Um, and that's how we deliver early intervention. And the way that we then triage it is through the data that we collect. So the next thing that happens is a health check. So a, a, um, a call recall, that is the, the public health system of contacting people in the community, a call recall signal goes out, text message, letter and so on goes out and then with a clickable link that parents can then um, go to a, a patient portal and online they fill in an asthma control test but also psychosocial questions including the validated strengths and difficulties questionnaire that gives us really good information about children's mental and emotional well-being. Importantly, patients and parents can also self-refer, so that improves access to care and, of course, the traditional referral models. OK, so we get a, a, a quite a lot of data about children and we, we have that list of, of children who've responded and we can then go through them in a multidisciplinary way um, where the nursing team leads and triages that list and looks at children who have poorly controlled asthma and, and, and prioritise them for, um, for proactive early intervention and then deliver that care that includes a tailored health promotion message, um, a health promotion pack, together with um, a very holistic approach um, to care um, that is led and delivered through the nursing team. OK, so what I want to show you here is something that is pretty hot off the press, and that is our emerging population health dashboard that includes the biopsychosocial information that we are gathering about children. So this is a map of Lambeth and Southwark you see at the top, and that's the numbers of children that are in any particular neighbourhood. And what I've done here is filter for children who have poorly controlled asthma, and then um, that is asthma control test scores under 20. And, um, and then underneath that map, you'll see in those uh, ring um, graphs, the donut graphs, what we have learned about those children in terms of um, their, uh, so their social concerns, their family social concerns, that is housing insecurity and food instability, um, their um, uh, mental well-being and whether there's smokers in the household. So this allows us to further triage care and tailor it appropriate to need. And um, so what is the impact? of all of this care? Well, um, what we've discovered, which is truly shocking, is that uh, to me, and I hope to you too, is that around 50% of children in the community have uncontrolled asthma. Those are children who need clinical care. Those are asthma control tests that, um, have, that are poor, show poor um, symptom control and, um, and symptoms that need care. And I'm pleased to say that over 90% of them, those children achieve well controlled symptoms afterwards. Uh, and um, not surprisingly, I suppose, but um, uh, it's nice to have that documented. Um, what's really um, hopeful is that it looks like each time we do this sweep of core recalls across the population, the proportion of, un of children with uncontrolled asthma is going down. What's also very interesting is that around um, between a fifth and a quarter of children uh, with asthma and other long term conditions have moderate to severe unmet mental health needs and that that's also significantly improved through our biopsychosocial approach to care. Um, and very pleasing to me as a public health uh, paediatrician is that 100% of children are supported with health promotion as part of their care. And then as you'll have um, gathered, I'm also very proud to say that this proactive case finding mechanism means that we reach the children with greatest needs first before they come to hospital. Um, and then um, also importantly, especially in this day and age, the reduction in acute care um, use means that the cost savings can be reinvested in disease prevention and health promotion. So this is really just more of the same. We've been able to reduce um, uh, service usage and save costs. Um, now, this is just to highlight to you what population health approach means. Um, and it's a catchy 
thing that NHS England, I think, came up with about five eyes. It's about using intelligence well to identify children early um, and to use that data and evidence to deliver insights that shape care. The interventions are very much about personalised holistic care, but we need that data to do it and that that then drives improvement, which of course must be measured robustly. So this is some new, um, ah, this is about measuring quality of care. Now, this is a particular bugbear of mine, and that is that we don't measure care quality routinely. And I say that um, judiciously. We measure uh, numbers and we measure flow and we measure costs, but we don't measure compliance with guidelines or other good quality care indicators routinely. We measure them as big national audits and we measure them as local audits and quality improvement projects sometimes, but we don't measure them as routinely as we could or should. I think that's going to improve and change as we all move towards um, new electronic health records. But I want to show you what we've done in this programme. We um, took some of the NICE guidance and some other um, uh, quality indicators and we devised specific ways of measuring quality routinely. And what did we find in our outcome? By the way, I must say that um, uh, we've run the evaluation of this programme in, a, in an, a, a rather innovative way. We've done a service evaluation ongoing, and you've seen some of the results from that. We've also run a very large cluster randomised controlled trial, which we are still um, analysing. I'll show you some of the emerging early results. Um, if you look at the far right side of this slide, CHIP service data, um, you'll see here a con comparison of the CHIP model or the child's framework um, compared with enhanced usual care. That's our control. So our control isn't usual care, it's enhanced with health promotion. And what do we find there? We find that um, between three and a half and four percent more likely odds ratio, that is three to four times more, more children have an asthma action plan done for them, written down, agreed with them, and that the children can then use. That's important because these are life saving measures. We didn't measure asthma annual review since by definition we're doing that, so that would be 100%. Asthma control test, that's a measure of wellness uh, and symptoms. That's three times as likely if you have this holistic model of care. Documented height is um, was easy to achieve, uh, but it's not done regularly. 11 times as likely. It's important, of course, for prescriptions and so on. And again, we didn't measure um, prescribed spacer since that would have been 100%. What we've shown on the left there is that unfortunately we were not able to demonstrate spread beyond um, our integrated care service into primary care yet, but we're hopeful that will um, happen. This is very early days. It's only 12 months of, um, of a fully embedded model. OK, so um, just about ready to wrap up. I want to just um, reiterate that this service improves access to care, specifically through active case finding, self-referral and professional referral. It integrates well with primary care and it has a whole child biopsychosocial approach. The ambition and what we think we're starting to achieve is to reduce inequalities by differentially favouring children of higher needs. So I want to leave you um, with just some thoughts about the future. That's the same slide you've seen before. But what I want to just um, reiterate here is the, the potential future for having this richness of data, because what we're doing now is some predictive modelling whereby we can, without having to do the tests that, ha that, that we do for, um, for uh, pre-assessment and triaging and tailoring care, we ought to be able to use that data as we're getting more and more good at understanding local needs, be able to predict, well, who is going to run into trouble and deliver even earlier intervention. So um, that's all I want to say. Thank you so much for your um, attention. And again, thanks to Nina for um, appearing on the panel um, for discussion shortly. Thank you very much indeed. OK, thank you very much. Uh, wow, we've got a, a huge amount of uh, really relevant information from the uh, three talks there. Um, we're going to open this up to a panel discussion now. Um, I am going to field some questions from the audience that have been sent to me. Uh, I'm going to welcome Nina Somerville, who is uh, you're representing um, uh, Ingrid. Uh, so thanks for joining us. 
and also Emma and Sarah. So let's get started. I'm going to start with Sarah because I know you need to leave a bit sooner. Um, what can we do to make sure young women have got the same outcomes as young males? Quite struck by that data showing that rise um, in in women as they sort of reach that sort of late teenage kind of stage. And it'd be really interesting to think about how we, how we, what we can do as professionals um, to improve things. Well, it's a great question. I mean, I think the single thing at the moment that health professionals can do is, is, is talk about it more and acknowledge it as an issue. Because um, I think what we, what we have felt is it's not well understood um, uh, and clearly we don't really know what, what interaction sex hormones are having, hence the need to fund more research. We're also liaising and talking to lots of the research bodies, so NIHR and others, to say, look, can you reanalyze some existing cohorts, data set studies by sex? Because we may be able to glean more. So we will be very active in funding ourselves, but trying to influence research around this but I think so many women and girls we had conversations with said oh yeah now you, now you come to mention it I often do get a flare up before my period mm. or um, yeah you know in pregnancy my asthma got better or it got worse so there is something about starting this conversation mm. and helping women to talk about it because you know what we what we also sometimes hear is well I didn't really have the confidence I felt so it's it's really opening this up as something that feels important to talk about even if we don't quite have the answers but perhaps as a way into better self-management keeping diaries understanding risk and flare-up and so on. Thank you um, Nina Emma I mean I'm just just sort of the whole morning I've been struck by the sense of these real synergistic um, inequalities but there still seems to be some biolog there's some of it has a biological basis um you know we, it, we can't so much of this relates to air pollution um and you know thinking about the kind of you know um sex hormone changes but then you've also got all the other inequalities kind of linked with that how do you see that panning out for the specific issue of improving women's health is that something you've come across in in your topics uh, with the with you Emma? I mean not specifically I mean the thing that strikes me is that um, I think that it, it, always what we do it's about having you know those specific conversations with young I mean in our in our um, kind of age range with young women and understand their particular perspectives and we know there are you know significant changes that happen in young women's life a lot of transitions and also differences um, in the way that um, young women um, approach physical exercise approach other um, aspects of their health and well-being so I think as part of you know alongside the data that Sarah's talking about which is really important important really understanding those young women's perspectives and thinking about how we manage those particularly in the transfer and transition period not and when I talk about that I mean there's lots of transitions in young people's life but in terms of that healthcare transition and um, is really really important because we know that that is another risk point um for um for things kind of falling down the gaps so I guess I mean as a kind of participation person that would be my thought mm. I think the other thing is that there are some real opportunities there I mean I, I support the youth board members who are involved in the NHS um, Transformation Board and there are young people who are part of the national asthma work and I think there are young people out there who would who who can be part of this conversation um, and it makes me think about how I'm going to have some more conversations with them about this issue. I'm going thank you I've got a, a question about this is sort of for everyone uh, but vaping um, the impact of vaping which I think is uh, is you know emerging and is, we're going to realise this is a big, big, big mistake, how much vaping is taking place. Uh, do you have a view on that and in thinking it through the lens of social inequality? Uh, uh, maybe um, Sarah, do you want to have an opinion and then? Yes, um, before before I ran Asthma and Lung UK, I worked, uh, I worked in cancer for many years um, and, and I have been a former trustee of ASH, so have have been quite close to these issues. I, I mean, I have a, a personal view, which is we need to be cautious and careful. And, um, you know, I, I completely understand the strong desire to 
get people off smoke tobacco in kind of whichever way we can. But we've got to be really careful about the unintended consequences. And I think we're beginning to see some of those. So I think we need to be very sort of steadfast and strong in our messaging that, you know, vaping hasn't been around for very long. We don't know that it's not it's not safe um, it, and, and we don't quite know um, in many instances what it's doing to your lungs. I really think we need to tackle the the social acceptability the you know it's it's what groups of um teenagers are doing on the streets whereas 20 years ago they would have been smoking cig cigarettes and you see as you saw with cigarettes a really um sinister marketing strategy from the vaping companies some m many of which are owned by the tobacco industry mm. in marketing to young people certain flavors certain colors and images and all the rest of it and i think we need to be united as a health community that yeah. that is not on yeah thank you that's a very good clear statement there's no model of breathing in hot gases which is good for your lungs is my my uh, message that i took from professor bush <laughs> um OK, a question for Nina. Oh, sorry, I was going to just say something on vaping. Oh, vaping. come in, come in yeah, then, Emma. Sorry, thanks. Sorry. Um, no, I just I just wanted to completely agree with Sarah and say from the, I mean, from the very beginning it is a complex um, area, but we have said from the very beginning um, that we had some concerns that we need to think about smoking. Obviously, smoking cessation is really important, but we but we need to think about smoking cessation through the lens of young people's health and think about how these things are impacting on them. Um, and um, and that it hasn't been the case broadly you know we think about other groups of the population it's part of the concern that we have sometimes that we we don't necessarily think about this age group specifically but this is a real issue it is a real issue that schools are really really having a difficult time managing at the moment I know from a personal um, perspective with a teenage daughter and I also know um, from a kind of broader perspective that we are seeing massive increases not only in primary in secondary schools but also in primary schools um, and um, and we really need to take this seriously without undermining the messages for other parts of the population but if we don't we, we there's the kind of the whole knock-on effects um for um the rest of young people's lives are, are really significant so sorry i just wanted to add that in thanks no, th thank you thank you very much um gonna direct the next question for nina um some questions a lot of interest in your model uh, that you described um, um, at St Thomas's. Um, is this accessible anywhere? I mean, if we were if we were to pick it up and try and replace it in another sort of area of the country, what what, what how would we get started? Yeah, so that's what. Um, so the framework that Ingrid was talking about, so the Charles framework, that is the kind of framework which is um, almost like a recipe book of mm. how you can pick this up and move it to your area. So what we've done to be successful in our area. And it gives you kind of different ingredients you would need, um, you know, such as, you know, the access to the paediatrician, a specialist nursing team, data agreements, sharing access, all of these things which helps the programme become really successful. So you can definitely contact the child's health team um, to get some more information on this if you'd like to replicate it. Well, I think there's an awful lot of interest because um, I think it goes it goes to the heart of the issue is, is we have a lot of data and we're beginning to get the platforms to measure these variables. Um, at, but the, the levers, I think um, Emma talked about the levers are still a little feel quite rusty um, or not necessarily that you move something and something necessarily happens. Um, what would you say, um, um, Nina, it would be the first step. What's the key sort of place to start to get that model of care moving and to make changes to address specifically inequality? Well, I think it's it's been quite interesting because I think we did touch on this in the nursing webinar early in the week. So Bev um, Bostock um, spoke about it, kind of being more proactive rather than reactive. So I know um, a lot of initiatives are kind of based off who's attending hospital, who's attending A and E, and actually we're able to pick up those people before they even go to hospital. So I've actually lots, met lots of children, their asthma has been terrible. They've never accessed their GP and they've never gone to A&E, but their asthma is actually they're kind of chronically grumbling. And they've also got, um, you know, maybe other things going on in their lives. So there may mm. be financial issues. They may be emotional and mental well-being issues, not just for the child, but also for the family. And actually think having this more rich information about the families, which we sometimes don't really get in specialist services because we don't um, always know the families, you know, as intimately as perhaps their GP does that actually gives you a lot of information 
before you're meeting the family. And what mm -hmm. we've tried to do is so um, the health check, which you complete, so it is an asthma control score, which we then triage weekly as the nursing service. But even if you don't meet the criteria to access the nursing service, you're given a health pack, which, yes, does tell you <clears throat> what asthma is and about your medications. But it also talks about the psychosocial aspects of health. So we give you lots of links to, um, um, you know, different financial support within Lambeth and Southwark. We talk about clean air. We're highlighting about air pollution. We're actually giving people more information because a lot of the time people don't actually know about all these different triggers. And it's actually um, been a really rich conversations we can then have with families about this. That actually they're kind of thinking, oh, so, you know, it's not my fault about this asthma. You know, it's something else that's actually impacting things. But there is something people can proactively do and then the added benefit is that we're actually stopping them going to hospital. Thank you. Uh, question uh, for Sarah. Um, thinking, I'm just thinking about listening to all the talks this morning about the, how important it is that we engage right with young people um, and that we, you know, we haven't always done that very well. Um, going to be specific about asthma action plans, which I've always obviously used from Asthma UK. Um, I, I, it, being the ability to email them uh, and get them, it's one of those things that's frustrating. I've just went down to the urgent care centre this morning because we're doing our ask about, ask about asthma kind of publicity in the hospital. And there's still that little bit of disconnect in getting a busy GP in an urgent care centre to just go through an asthma action plan. Do you, I mean, do you think there's another level of communication engagement with young people that will really get them onto a level that they can truly engage with I mean, anything that's sort of innovation that's coming ahead or how we tackle that? It's a great question and I mean it is a difficult nut to crack isn't it? We we survey every year, we do a big uh, annual asthma survey and the reality is you know we know primary care is really stretched. P people haven't got as much time as they often previously had to talk through some of these plans. Um, so I suppose there's a couple of answers. One is you want to create different moments and different opportunities. Mm. Um, one of those is, is is through primary care. I mean, there, there may well be others. And, and I think the idea of schools, support groups, you know, other opportunities to, to, to go to young people where they are um, is, is a fantastic um, way of coming at this. We, we've set up a clean air champions programme that is actually going into schools. It's primarily talking about the importance of clean air, but with a link to asthma. Mm. Uh, and so we're running assemblies and we've got lesson plans. And so that may be a way into some of this. If you've got asthma, you know, then then looking after yourself and an action plan. Uh, self-management plan. Um, I think there's also an innovation point. Um, we work with lots of innovators and, and researchers. There are loads and loads and loads of apps out there. Not many mm. of them are well used. And our starting position as a charity is you must design this stuff with people and users at the heart of it, at the centre, involve young people. How do they? How are they likely to engage? Um, so I think you, you know there's 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 more work to do. We we held an innovators meeting um, not long ago. It was so well attended because you've got tech companies and digital innovators desperate to create this stuff and they also understand there's a really big market for it if they get it right mm. um, but there's a bit of a disconnect at the moment so I think trying new innovation getting to where young people are uh, plus sort of shoring up and reinforcing the importance in primary care I think is um, I think it's all important plus the role of the charity I mean what what people are often saying to us on the helpline at the moment is they're just some of our healthcare advisors will have time to unpack things. Now, it's probably more parents calling than it is young people, but I think it's really understanding the ecosystem. You know, what's the full range of stuff we can throw at this? Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. I Any just add something in, comments? yeah, Stephen. I was just going to say, I think that it's really important that if we, um, when we, when we, in order to get innovations and ways of communication that work for young people right, that we really need to identify at a local level the particular young people that we want to target, and that we really take co-production. And by co-production, it's not just talking to young people and engaging with them and having a conversation about what they might like. It's actually working in a co-production process to um, support young people to work alongside clinicians and other people in the system to create those things that work for them 
content and that that takes people who you know understand how co-production works and can involve young people right through um, and I think if we can have models that target particular communities and do that within the context of ICSs and Core 20 plus 5 then we can start to understand the bit the bit more the, the specifics and get those things that might work better for those communities we really want to reach. Okay, thank you. I think we we that's going to that draws the end of the questions, um, and so we're just going to start close a few minutes early, which I think is reasonable. People can go and grab some lunch uh, and uh, be ready and come back for the next session. So I'm going to finish by saying a massive thank you to all our speakers, uh, both the uh, live and the pre-recorded. Um, and for people being so generous with their time and flexible. Um, so it's absolutely been a, a great morning. I've taken a lot away from this and I hope you have too. Um, so I think we return at, uh, let me just double check. Lunch is technically 11.55 till 12.25. So in the afternoon session starts 12.25 and that will be Viv Marsh taking over as the chair. And we have a panel session starting on air pollution. So I think we will see you back at 25 past. Thank you very much. I smell can take away your life in a sec, so always have your pump on your side like a tech. It's so peak, it can take away your breath in a second. Leave you all blue in your face. Watch your step, watch your step when you race, watch your breath and your pace. Worst case scenario, step is a case. Can't catch your breath, leave you resting for days. Tight chest, fast heart, leave you stressing in ways. Hey, hey, that's my enemy. Don't stop, just take your medicine. Cause you're running out of breath now. Just use your pump to pass the test now. Hey. Asthma is a lung disease Don't stop taking your medicine If you wanna live your life now Just use a pump and pass the test now this be the acronym A is for the asthma king S is for the sorrow that I feel when it's attacking them T is for the temptation that comes with trying to firm this H is always hurting them M is for the many who try but couldn't manage it and that last day is for admissive Just know you got that pump right there for assistance I know how it feels to be wheezy So just take a breath and take it easy Yo, when I was young I had that smile Three pumps, couldn't breathe much It was that tough, still excelled on the pitch No catch up, sports over everything Yeah, I went that hard Me, there's no limit G like a black card Two allergies plus asthma Pet hair, couldn't go near, no air Now move like a G, no care All gone, I'm blessed I'm really I already know life ain't fair. Sad thing is, they don't care. Tight chest, plus I can't breathe. Trapped with no air, and I can't leave. <laughs>
Asthma can take away your life in a sec, so always have your pump on your side like a tech. It's so peak, it can take away your breath in a second. Leave you all blue in your face, watch your step, watch your step. When you race, watch your breath and your pace. Worst case scenario, step is a case. Can't catch your breath, leave you resting for days. Tight chest, fast heart, leave you stressing in ways. Hey. Hey. Asthma is your enemy. Don't stop, just take your medicine. And cause you're running out of breath now. Just use your pump and pass the test now. Hey, asthma is a long disease. Don't stop taking your medicine. If you wanna live your life now, just use your pump and pass the test now. This be the acronym, A is for the asthma king, S is for the sorrow that I feel when it's attacking them, T is for the temptation that comes with trying to firm decision, H is always hurting them, M is for the many who you travel couldn't manage it, and that last day is for admissive, just know you got the pump right there for assistance, I know how it feels to be wheezy, so just take a breath and take it easy. Yo, when I was young I had asthma, three pumps couldn't breathe much, it was that tough, still excelled on the pitch, no catch up, sports over everything, yeah I went that hard, me there's no limit D like I Black card, two allergies plus asthma. Pet hair couldn't go near no air. Now move like a G, no care. Move gone, I'm blessed. Can't speak, can't breathe, hold me through the roof. My finger tips and lips turning blue. Can't speak, can't breathe, hold me through the roof. My finger tips and lips turning blue. Life ain't fair, sad thing is, they don't care Tight chest plus I can't breathe Trapped with no air, and I can't leave <laughs> Have your pump on your side like a tech It's so peak it can take away your breath in a second Leave you all blue in your face Watch your step, watch your step When you race, watch your breath and your pace Worst case scenario, death is a case Can't catch your breath, leave you resting for days Tight chest, fast heart, leave you stressing in ways Hey, hey, asthma is your enemy Don't stop, just take your medicine and Cause you're running out of breath now Just use your pump and pass the test now Hey, asthma is a long disease don't stop taking your medicine If you wanna live your life now Just use your pump and pass the test now Acronym. A is for the asthma king, S is for the sorrow that I feel when it's attacking them. T is for the temptation that comes with trying to firm decision. H is always hurting them. M is for the many who travel couldn't manage it. And that last day is for admissive. Just know you got that pump right there for assistance. I know how it feels to be wheezy, so just take a breath and take it easy. Yo, when I was young, I had asthma. Three pumps couldn't breathe much. It was that tough. Still excelled on the pitch. No catch up. Sports over everything. Yeah, I went that hard. Me, there's no limit. G like a black car. Two allergies plus asthma Pet hair couldn't go near no air Now move like a G, no care Move gone, I'm blessed Can't speak, can't breathe, hold me through the roof My fingertips 
That comes with trying to firm the situation. I was hurting him. M is for the many who you never could have managed it. And I lost it. It's for admissive. Just know you got that pump right there for assistance. I know how it feels to be wheezy. So just take a breath and take it easy. Yo, when I was young, I had asthma. Three pumps couldn't breathe much. It was that tough. Still excelled on the pitch. No catch up. Sports over everything. Yeah, I went that hard. Me, there's no limit. G like a black card. And two allergies plus asthma. Pet hair couldn't go near. No air. Now I'm moving like a D. No care. All gone. I'm blessed. Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome to the afternoon session of this fantastic Ask About Asthma conference. I, uh, my name is Viv Marsh. I am your chair for the session this afternoon. Uh, I am an asthma nurse specialist and I'm the clinical lead for children and young people's asthma transformation in the black country, which is a very deprived area in the West Midlands. Um, we've got a fantastic session lined up this afternoon and our first session is a panel session about air pollution and asthma and we've got three absolutely amazing speakers. I'm really looking forward to this session and I think we'll just go straight on into it if that's OK. Um, I would just ask and remind everybody to pop any questions that they have at all in the in the chat and uh, we will be dealing with those um, after our three speakers. We're going to have a lively discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first um, speaker, who is Darush Attar Zada. And I'm Darush, I'm going to hand straight over to you for your session. Hello, everyone. So I'm uh, Darush and I'm a pharmacist based over in northwest uh, London. I'm currently involved with the Children and Young People's Asthma Network. Um, and I'm also, some of you may be aware of Right Breathe. So I'm a pharmacist uh, behind that um, um, very good uh, website. It's got lots, I mean, there's so many inhalers on the market these days. So the, the good thing about Right Breathe, it'll give you lots of information about the different inhalers. And also we can look at paediatric and adult adolescent li licensing, for example, of the different inhalers. So I'm going to be covering asthma and the green agenda in children and young people more than just inhalers and thinking more holistically. 
So choosing the right inhaler isn't always easy. And I think for a lot of us uh, who've been involved in inhaler technique coaching, I think it's, it's quite different when it comes to the different types of inhaler devices. It's hard enough to learn one inhaler technique for, for example, a meter dose inhaler and spacer, let alone um, a dry powder inhaler. Very, very different techniques. And I know there's been a lot of uh, noise in this area around um, trying to do our bit when it comes to um, the planet. And of course, there are inhalers that contain propellants in them, which um, have got uh, global warming potential. And what we need to think about is, of course, is looking at the planet, but also we need to identify um, patients who are well managed and well controlled. And of course, inhaler technique is going to be an important part of that. So next slide, please. One of the things we'll find with uh, poor inhaler technique is if a patient is not able to get the medication to the lungs, which is not that straightforward, um, there will be a lot of waste, of course. There'll be poor, poor disease control. You may find um, the clinician will have to step up uh, treatment, for example, give higher doses of, say, inhaled corticosteroids. You may find uh, patients um, uh, attending hospital or GP um, practices more uh, frequently. And of course, there's an increased uh, cost to the system. So inhaler technique coaching has been a real passion of mine for, for many years, and I think a lot for a lot of you as well in the audience. So it's just something that when we're thinking of the greener agenda, this is something we need to look at um, first as a priority. Next slide, please. So safety first. We, when we're thinking of any prescribed um, inhaler device, we do need to start thinking of the device as part of the medicine itself. Because I don't think um, for some, it may not, the device itself may not be um, considered a, a real priority. We need to involve uh, community pharmacy teams. So they, can, they can do things like the new medicine service and we need to work as a multidisciplinary team. And when I talk about inhaler, technique coaching, it's a matter of watching the patient um, and also correcting any sort of errors in their steps. So every opportunity, this has to be um, high, on, high on our agenda and the patient, of course. Next slide, please. So this is a, a, um, a poster that was presented actually at the Primary Care Respiratory Society, a, a big um, survey was done by the Task Force for Lung Health. Over a, a thousand patients were actually, um, and this is looking at uh, adult population mainly, but it, I thought it would be interesting, important for us to, to share this um, in this presentation, because in the last 12 months, well, during this survey that's taken place, over, well, 77% of um, um, patients have had their inhaler technique checked ever, yes. But in the last 12 months, only 24% had had the inhaler technique checked. And that's uh, obviously a worrying sign. So it's just it's just to, to make sure when we, again, as we're thinking of the greener agenda, we need to think about the importance of making sure the medicine gets to the lungs. And that's that coaching is, is completely necessary. Next slide, please. So how many of you are accessing the videos from Asthma and Lung UK and also from Right Breathe? Excellent uh, videos, but what we should think about is these videos are reinforcers. To reinforce what we're going to be doing as, as clinicians when we're coaching our patients, they're not there to replace um, our, our role because um, I've heard some situations and at the moment I'm supporting 45 PCNs across northwest London, but word gets out that uh, actually inhaler technique videos are being used to replace um, us as clinicians when it comes to coaching. And it's very hard um, just for a person to for us to assume a person knows how to use their inhaler when actually watching videos. We cannot make those assumptions. Next slide, please. So those of you um, who know about the UK Inhaler Group, there's um, something called the seven steps 
for a meter dose inhaler, seven steps for a, 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 a meter dose inhaler and spacer, but there's also seven steps for a dry powder inhaler. And I know there's been quite a, a lot of um, movement around uh, people using more dry powder inhalers in mainly in the adult population, but that is also possibly spreading into the younger population, which is fine if the if the if the child has got the right physiology to use a dry powder inhaler. But it's just to say that it's it's very different. If you're going to go from um, a person for a person who's maybe above the age of 10, 10 or above potentially, they may have sufficient um, inspiratory effort to draw the powder out of the device. So uh, one of the things you'll find with a dry powder inhaler, some of the critical errors that take place is preparing the device. Some dry powders need to, well, there's one dry powder that needs to be shaked, um, but the others don't need to be shaken. So it's really important that we prepare and load the dose. Emptying your lungs out fully before inspiration. This is very different to a tidal breathing technique using a, a spacer and a meter dose inhaler, because if you don't empty your lungs out fully, then you're not going to have um, that, that sufficient um, uh, vital capacity there to draw out the powder. So really important that um, a person can inhale quick and deep, we say over two to three seconds. And then that breath hold at the end for around at least um, five to 10 seconds is, is kind of really important as well. So these are some of the errors that um, have been seen when, when looking at dry powder inhalers. So some key, um, I think, headlines, which you'll see from greenerpractice.co.uk, really good uh, document. Um, it looks at uh, what our first priorities should be, which is to, uh, when we, identify people with poorly controlled disease and checking adherence to regular preventive treatment, inhaler technique, of course, and then the clinical and environmental harms of poor disease control. And this is a real big headline. Poor disease control will likely outweigh any benefits from use of different inhalers. Yes, dry powder inhalers don't contain these harmful propellants, but of course, if a person is not able to use that device, then of course that's going to be bad for the patient and also bad for the planet. So what we should be looking at is opportunities to identify poor control and optimise care. And so Saber over reliance is one of our um, our um, metrics we can look at. So if somebody's using their blue inhaler more frequently, then it, one of the indicators for that could be that they actually have poor inhaler technique. They're not able to use the device. So that's something we cannot um, make take for granted. The person can use that in an emergency situation, for example, or, or every day. Next slide, please. Oh, we jumped one. Here we go. So if you look at the different types of devices, these, these are, there's quite a lot of literature and papers around this. And, and one of the things I like to do in my consultations is, is to let patients know it's not easy to use these devices. Believe it or not, nine out of 10 of us healthcare professionals may make an error when it comes to the seven steps of using a meter dose inhaler. It's, it's not easy and this is why we offer this regular coaching service. And you can see on the left hand side that um, even if you get one error out of those seven steps, potentially zero to 10 percent of the drug could reach the lung, which is which is a problem. So none of none of the devices are perfect, as in we, we haven't got it spot on yet. But the thing is, if, if we can get those seven steps, then of course that's going to be great. But on the right side, you'll see that there's been some um, in the NHS long term plan, there's a real priority amongst. Um, there's quite a few respiratory indicators in this PCN DES, we call it the IIF, which is um, there's an incentive scheme, but a quality incentive scheme looking at trying to reduce the amount of, um, of, of salbutamol, for example, that contains high amounts of this uh, carbon dioxide uh, equivalent. Potentially, we can find uh, salbutamols that have lower um, volumes of these propellants, and that's something I'm going to talk about in a moment. We go on to the next slide, please. And it's just to say both of those two need to be done in parallel, inhaler technique optimization. 
as well as um, looking at the environmental impacts of inhalers. My concern is there are people getting involved with making changes to people's inhalers potentially that are not inhaler coaches themselves. And I think, um, I think, you know, that's if we're seeing it as, um, you know, a patient um, getting changed to an inhaler, but not by a coach, then we could potentially result in problems. And I know open prescribing on the left side, you can see that there's quite a few different areas where the amount of um, um, salbutamol, when you're looking at salbutamol prescribing, you can see actually the amount of um, uh, probably the, the ones which contain the most harmful propellant is reducing quite nicely, but it's just the manner in which people have been changed. Because on the right side, you can see we already have an existing problem where most of the prescriptions for metered dose inhalers are already short acting beta 2 agonists. I mean, preventative treatments should be much higher than, than this. So if, if people are being uh, having their inhalers changed without them knowing how to use the device, we may actually see that SABA prescribing going even higher because of poorly control, because of poor inhaler technique. So this is some information um, I got from Presquip, which shows the actual indicative uh, carbon footprint for the different uh, salbutamols. And you'll see there's some, some of them are dry powder inhalers and some of them are meter dose inhalers. Ventolin is got, has got a, a propellant in there, um, but it's the same as some of the other meter dose inhalers, but it's got a larger volume of this propellant in there. So there's been um, some work trying to sort of maybe move some people away from a Ventolin Evo inhaler to one of the other ones which contain maybe a propellant too, but a much smaller volume. So there's different options, or you may even consider dry powder inhaler. And uh, just what uh, I wanted to sort of really get across is, is it's very important to think about what matters to the person. You know, if we have that discussion with them uh, about the importance of the different um, differences between the inhalers, then um, that's good because then they'll be, if they know that they're going to be doing good for the planet and it's also going to be a device they can use, then that's fine. I think most patients will be up for that. So next few slides, there's going to be just press it a few times. It's just to say, let the person know what this new device looks like. Keep going, a couple, a few more. There we go. Just let the person know the differences. And then the next slide, please. And if somebody wanted to go for a dry powder inhaler, this is a very, very different technique. So um, this is where I'd have more concern about. But if, if that's the natural maneuver for that patient to do a when they're using their inhalers, then maybe a dry powder inhaler would be right for them um, if that's the, the, the right um, device for the patient. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of what the dry powder inhaler looks like. Yeah, OK, next slide, please. And so this is why um, working with um, the I was going to say Healthy London Partnerships, no longer Healthy London Partnerships, NHS England Improvement, the London region and a lot of the pharmacy subgroup. We've produced some patient information leaflets just to sort of really highlight that, um, you know, there's lots we can do to, to when it comes to let, letting people know about the different inhalers. And this is a really good leaflet, I think, that um, many of you will like. Next slide, please. But the key words are is for safety first and changing um, inhalers without the patient being involved as part of shared decision making is a real issue. Next slide, please. And this is one concern I'm having when I'm seeing websites that say inhaler swaps. Practice website wishing people good health, wishing you good health, inhaler swaps. This made me my blood boil, to be honest. Next slide, please. And just to say, let, let's say you have um, a patient here who's got really good asthma control on a, um, a meter dose inhaler and spacer. She's read somewhere that her inhalers are as bad as eating meat or driving from London to Sheffield. And she's read somewhere that it's really affecting the planet. Next slide, please. She's hardly ever using her salbutamol. These are the headlines she saw. Next slide, please. So what advice would we give Sophia? There's lots we can do. So next slide, please. This is the second half of the information leaflet. 
which highlights that good asthma control is good for you and good for the environment. Next slide, please. So look, returning inhalers, not help, how highlighting the patient actually good asthma control is good for them, good for the planet. Re look, trying to get inhalers with dose counters, returning inhalers to the pharmacy. There's lots of things that she can do. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I think I've hammered that message home. And next slide, please. So this is a real headline there. The greenest inhaler is one a, a patient can use and will use and shared decision. Putting ourselves in the person's shoes is key. Next slide, please. And this should be the last case study. If a person has poor asthma control, like this particular person has, and we're finding actually that the child is not bringing their space, using their spacer, they've got to a point where actually their natural manoeuvre is to do a quick and deep type technique. They're able to use that type of dry powder inhaler. We've assessed them using a, a, a say a turbo inhaler whistle, for example. Then this person actually may be better suited to a dry powder because look, they've, they're not um, at all in a good position when it comes to their current health. Next slide, please. So there's lots that we can do when it comes to technique of intranasal uh, technique, inhaler technique and various other things. So um, next slide, please. And this is our final summary, really. But um, I think absolutely right breathe or asthma lung UK videos are not to replace face to face or video coaching. I don't know how anyone's able to do telephone um, inhaler technique coaching. I've heard of that. Um, we should promote self-care and opportunities to ask questions throughout. Possibilities for maintenance and reliever therapy when it's right for that particular patient. That's the end. I could have got, I could go on and on, but um, I think my 20 minutes are up. <laughs> Thank you, Darush. That was a, a brilliant and whistle-stop tour of such an, a very, very important topic. Um, and we will be coming back to you in the panel discussion. So thank you very much for that. What I would like to do now is move on to our next speaker. And I am just so proud and honoured to be able to introduce to you all Rosamond Kissy Deborah, who is the founder of the Ella Roberta Foundation. And I am absolutely fascinated and can't wait to hear this presentation. So Rosamond, over to you. I think for me, I'm going to um after hearing that last presentation is quite interesting, but I don't think I'm going to comment on, on that for now, but I'm going to focus on the fourth ask, which is about um, the air we breathe and hair pollution and the impact on asthma. Um, I, I think I could actually let me go back quite a bit and actually say something about the whole um, the inhaler technique and um, young people, um, because the reason why I feel I actually need to comment is one of the issues with Ella was we thought her technique wasn't right, um, so many different medicines and to put it in a nutshell it was the air pollution in the area which we live in which was the issue and um, I, I don't know whether Stephen's on but I'm sure he would like to comment on that that I think he has sort of said to me once that he's not surprised that Ella's asthma um, pump wasn't working and I keep on saying that's something we do need to consider as, as well there is a lot of pressure especially um, on young people now my son also has asthma and as as a basis our basis we actually use is um, to try and keep him out of hospital so I do everything I can as his mother to encourage him his technique is fine he knows what's to what to do but I think if you live in an area of high air pollution it's incredibly difficult to actually control your asthma and I think there's nothing I can really say here to doctors who deal with young people day in day out who visit a and &E. but I think one thing I've become aware of and through my experience is if someone is coming to hospital all the time consistently and they say they are taking their medicine then I would actually have an actual look at where they actually live and have a look at whether that's an actual hotspot. I think that's something that we do need to actually 
consider uh, rather than because when my daughter was ill you, you always felt that you were doing something wrong because no matter what you did she was still going into hospital but now that we have learned more about air pollution and the impact on health I think we need to take it seriously now the reason why I'm quite glad that I'm focusing on this matter of air pollution. I was actually at the um, Conservative Party conference on Sunday and I was talking about this matter. And what concerns me is there is still a lack of acceptance about the damage air pollution is doing. I was actually um, on a panel with an MP who thought that air pollution now is not a problem at all. That is just something that happened with the smog in in the 50s, air quality is better than ever. Um, things things should be, you know, hunky dory. And yet, I wake up this morning, and what I was actually reading about was yet again new research that shows that the particulate matter, you know, black carbon, is actually impacting babies in the actual womb. Now, one of my issues about this whole topic with air pollution inhalers and everything is the message isn't consistent what we're telling people it is not there are mixed messages all over the place from the government saying to people that you know the pollution in the air is better than ever before till doctors now saying and a lot of doctors have come on board and saying no actually depending on where you live and when you live near a busy road like we do near the south circular the air pollution is terrible. I think we need to have some consistent messaging coming from people in health to the general public because I was at an, an event last night again in Brixton, one of the busiest roads again in London and the general population still is not aware of the impact of air pollution on health. So I think that is the first thing we actually need to do. I am still yet to see messages in hospitals or GP surgeries telling people about, about the impact of air pollution on health. Ella's death has helped with the awareness, but I still think there is a lot more to um, go. And I think I'll go back to the coroner's um, report and I think the first line actually where he said unless the government clean up the air children are going to continue to die and I don't think I need to go any further than that really I think my experience and next year will be 10 years since Ella um, passed away is this area is steeped in politics um, I thought it would be something simple. The government will get on board. I'm not sure when um, Chris Whitty's report is coming out about um, air pollution, but I hope it addresses some of the inequalities in, in, in health. What I find which is quite concerning is the more research that comes out saying that air pollution affects us, whether it's cardiovascular strokes, low birth weight, the more there seems to be a pushback saying the the air is cleaner than ever before. So I do ask myself is what message is the public getting from this? Because there is not joined up thinking. Um, and that definitely, 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 definitely concerns me. A lot of schools, as we know, are actually on main roads and the actual air pollution on roads, main roads, has actually increased. London in the last 10 years, the cars have actually doubled on the actual roads and that is an actual fact. And there seems to be a pushback from the government, that's what I saw on Sunday, is that everybody can get into their cars, everybody can drive and technology is going to solve everything. And I think when I even mentioned brake and tyre wear and particulate matter on Sunday, I felt a few people in, in, in the audience were jumping down my throat saying, this doesn't exist, you know, there is no such thing as break and tire wear. So I think part of the thing, I think my my advice uh, and what I tell parents all, all the time is, number one, to avoid busy roads. Um, I'm very, very, very clear, clear about that. I think if you live on a busy road, 
in any urban area, you can smell it and you can taste the air, air pollution. And I think we just need to give consistent messaging to parents. Um, a lot of parents feel as if they are under pressure. I did when my daughter was ill. Every time she had an asthma attack, I actually felt it, it was my fault. I think regarding the government, I think I would really appreciate medics treating this very similar to the way they treat tobacco and actually begin to put pressure on the government. I don't think this current government is going to take this matter um, seriously at, at all. And it will be very interesting what Stephen's um, views are. They are due to um, legislate targets by, I think they have by, by the end um, of this month. And I'm not jumping for joy at the moment at all. Um, there have been research that shows they can bring in more stringent targets um, by 2030. But my actual worry is that they're going to push the date back to 2040. If there isn't pressure on the government, they are just going to continue doing what they are doing. And after speaking to an MP on Sunday, my conclusion is this is a matter they're not taking seriously. So I am hoping that when Chris Whitty's report comes out, he will make it clear once and for all about the direct impact of air pollution on the public's health. And I actually believe if you look at the main diseases like cardiovascular strokes, obesity, um, dementia. Um, we recently also we have seen research that shows that there's an increase now in lung cancer from people who don't actually smoke. And the reason for this is again air, air pollution. And I don't understand why there seems to be a pushback from the government not wanting to, to take this on board. So I think medics are going to have to challenge the government and actually put them un under pressure. My concern is the targets they are going to come up with are not going to be strong enough and this is going to continue to be an issue. And I think we need to go back during the pandemic when um, transport was incredibly low and also admission to hospital for asthma was very low. I don't think anyone actually died during that period. So I think that is all the evidence we actually need. And even looking at COVID, you know, there have been various research that shows areas of high air pollution. COVID was more severe. Um, so I think for me, this, uh, this has turned into inverted commas a bit of a game. The government, I, I feel, does not want to spend the money because it's going to cost them quite a lot to clean up the air. And also, I think they are reluctant to um, tackle emissions because what that means is people driving less. And the government believes that everyone should be able to get into their car whenever they want and drive anywhere. Now, if 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 we come up with that approach, we are never going to solve this and children are going to continue to die. So I think medics now have to be quite vocal because, as, as I have said, my surprise on Sunday was not even acknowledging that air pollution is even an issue. And I was quite surprised because this was an MP who has a cabinet position. And I thought, my goodness me, if 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 he can't even admit this is even a problem, then people are going to continue to die. And that means children. I think there has been over 70,000 papers now linking air pollution and health. So I don't think we need any more research on on this matter. But I think between now and when there's um, the next election, we are going to have to fight very, very hard because I think the current government we've got is going to push back a lot on this. And I think the public trusts doctors they really, really, really do. And that's why I believe that doctors' voices are very, very, very important. I think what I've learned from Ella's death is it's better not to have an asthma attack at all rather than hope that, you know, if someone has it, then, you know, they're going to have subutamol or they're going to have all kinds of medicines. If you can avoid an attack, that would be my best advice. But I think 
you know, we need to start putting leaflets, we need to start being vocal, we need to start pushing back. And my hope is when Chris Whitty's report comes out, that will be an actual moment that all of us can join together and talk about this. Um, again, th th this morning, or I think this week, I got another piece of research that showed, I think it was from Friends of the Earth, that shows people of colour are more likely to live in areas of high air pollution. And I'm sure if we look at all the urban areas like Manchester, Birmingham, London, this is reflective in the people that show up in hospital. Um, I am going to continue to do my bit to raise awareness with the public. I think I was very shocked yesterday in Brixton um, talking to the general public that they are not connecting all the dots and I actually don't I don't blame them because if you have a government that say everybody can get in their car everybody can drive and they're not going to do anything to discourage it why would even people think about it my concern is the NHS waiting list as I'm talking to people who are in the know is only going to get longer and the quality of life I think the MP said, oh, our quality of life is better than ever before. I thought that's not true. Um, the gap between the have and the have nots is getting wider and, and, and wider. And I think medics, people will, will, will listen to the likes of Chris, Chris Whitty on this actual matter. And that's my concern. I don't know whether Stephen is able to tell us when the report will, will be coming out. Um, I don't know whether it's going to address indoor air quality because that's an area I am also concerned concerned about is we talk about outdoor air pollution and we seem to be ne neglecting indoor air pollution. Um, I know Stephen has done some research in, in, in this area, but I, I do feel as much as we can't control what's on the outside, indoor air is something that I believe parents can do something about. And maybe I think it's about time we started to talk about indoor air quality. I think in conclusion, what I basically want to say is, as far as I'm concerned, raising awareness is key, but the messages need to be consistent. And I'm hoping um, Chris, Whit Chris Whitty has mentioned this before. He believes there are solutions to air pollution, which is a little bit different from climate change. And my hope and my encouragement is to medics um, here is when that report comes out, please help the likes of me who are trying to raise awareness about this matter um, with the public. Please join me um, and do make your voices very, very loud indeed. I think a lot of the public, they are actually confused as to what is what is actually going on at all and I think you have such a strong voice and I would encourage you to use it. I think Mr Whitty's report will, will be out maybe at the end of October, beginning of November. Maybe Stephen can say a little bit more about that but I really think that will be an actual very 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 important moment for us. So that's all I actually wanted to contribute. It's really difficult to talk to doctors about asthma and uh, medicines and air pollution because you deal with that every single day and I don't want to sound patronising because I, I feel what can you tell a doctor that um, you know deals with a child every single day. So I think my thing will be just to join us campaigners, and so that we can get our verse, uh, our voices out there. Because I think the current government, their main focus is uh, you know winning an election, and public health, as I learned to my cost on Sunday, is very very low of their priority. I was quite shocked about that, but I'm still learning as I as I go along. So thank you for having me. But after seeing that detailed um, presentation before me about subutamol and things like that, I thought, oh, there's no way I can talk about that. So my thing is just to continue to um, raise with the public and especially children who come in consistently like my daughter did is to maybe find out where they live because I think that's really 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 um, important. I wish I knew um, now what you know back then that might have helped us but you know um hopefully this this work which i do um 
there are parents who 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 may hear about it but i'm hoping we can ramp up the information about air pollution because i still haven't seen that change which i am hoping for to inform parents who 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 are like me back then um because when i talk to them they they still aren't very clear about the impact of air pollution on health. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be, be, be done about that. And maybe just once a year doing this is it, it's not sufficient. It's something we are going to have to keep on doing day in, day out. So thank you for having me. Uh, and um, I hope you found my contribution um, useful. Thank you. Uh, Rosamond, actually, my thanks to you, um, and I think I speak on behalf of the um, entire audience here to say our heartfelt thanks for your words, and we are in awe of your strength um, for the work that you do and the inspiration and the change that you are leading. So thank you so much. We have questions coming through. We have comments coming through, so we will pick those up in the panel session um, after um, our next next speaker who I would now uh, like to introduce is Professor Sir Stephen Holgate. Um, welcome and uh, we're very much looking forward to your uh, um, presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much and uh, another inspiring talk Rosamond. Thank you very much for that. It was brilliant um, and uh, I'm agreeing with everything you're saying, but I thought it's quite important that people understand really how bad asthma can be and how serious this link to air pollution is and that's why I hope you don't mind but I do want to uh, try and explain to the audience uh, why uh, the second inquest that you asked for um, was so important and so relevant to, to the discussion today and that's the reason for this talk. Next slide please. This is a meeting about asthma, so <laughs> and it's like taking colds to Newcastle because you'll know more about asthma than probably I do or anybody else does because you're the experts out there. But I think the last 50 odd years we've learned an awful lot about this disease and we recognise, of course, that it's a combination of uh, reacting to environmental insults of one form or another and uh, the changes in structure of the bronchial tubes, which is shown on the right bottom side here, where the uh, smooth muscle of the tubes becomes twitchy and the uh, lining of the airways secretes too much mucus. And, you know, we're familiar with the sort of basic biological mechanism. So this is a summary, really, of the various environmental factors that have been biologically linked to driving the inflammation and what we call the remodeling, which is the increase in tissue structure, the change in tissue structure in asthma. And you'll see a wide variety of substances. But in the top right hand corner there, you'll see pollution. And it's quite surprising, although the uh, medical literature, as uh, Rosamond said, is absolutely filled with studies showing association between pollution and asthma. The actual impact of that in clinical practice and in public health is pretty minimal. And this is the issue I really want to focus on today. You'll see in the bottom right hand side that these environmental factors affect the development of asthma across the life course. And as uh, Rosamond said, the recent publication that came out yesterday or the day before showing black particles in the brain of children before they're born indicates that uh, the air pollution is able to cross over the placenta and reach the developing child. So we're talking about an entire life course exposure and response. And asthma, of course, is only one of the diseases which uh, is manifest. Uh, with this interaction. So these these um, statements, which I won't read out, are pretty embarrassing. I mean, we're meant to be a developed country uh, with a national health service. And yet we have some of the worst statistics for asthma uh, across Europe. And a legitimate question might be, well, why is that the case if we have a marvellous national health service? And maybe during the questions, we'll get some answers as to why 
the asthmatic statistics in the United Kingdom are so appalling, because they certainly are. And uh, if you compare our data with Finland or other Scandinavian countries, as an example, you'll see that our asthma problems are about three to five times worse than they have. So we have a very specific problem here in the UK, which I think we need to pay attention to. Now, we heard from uh, Rosamond about the number of studies uh, linking asthma to air pollution and linking any of these non-communicable diseases with air pollution. I've just listed five really influential studies here, which unequivocally state that asthma is not only triggered by air pollution, but is induced by air pollution. In other words, exposure to pollutants, as we've just talked about in pregnancy, makes the lung develop in a different way so that the child is more susceptible to the pollutants when the child enters the world at birth. And then across the life course, of course, we've got a variety of other environmental factors, including air pollution. Next slide, please. This next study, which is this one, is a massive study, 98,000 participants in two countries. And the reason I'm showing this, and I'm not going to read out these statements, is that it shows without question that exposure to air pollution well below the air quality limit values that our governments use triggers new asthma development in adults in this case, but also in children. So th there is no debate about this any longer. And I think what Rosamond said about her Member of Parliament is a real call to arms, I think, in terms of wanting to change the attitude of some of our political leaders. So that just summarises that most of this increase in asthma is fossil fuel related. Next one, please. Yeah, and so the health evidence has become so powerful now uh, across many different diseases that the World Health Organization has driven down further its air quality limit values. And so what we have on this table in the top are the particulates called PM2.5 and then about four blocks down nitrogen dioxide. And those are the two um, types of pollutant that diesel vehicles particularly emit and, and it would be uh, um, the, the chemicals that uh, Ella will have been exposed to living so close to the South Circular Road. And if you look then on the left hand side in red are the European Union and incidentally the United Kingdom limit values. And what you can see in 2005, the health related WHO values for PM10 were 10 micrograms per meter cubed, the annual average, and they've gone down to five. The EU and our current standard is 25 micrograms, five times their current health limit values. And the same is similar to nitrogen dioxide, four times the current new WHO limit values. So here we are, have unequivocal evidence that our major world related health organization is stating that air pollutant health effects can be detected at these levels and yet we are dealt uh, a bad card and having such high levels still uh, legally uh, set within this country which are meaning many people are exposed to health related levels uh, adverse levels of air pollution next slide please Right, so here you are, Rosamond, with your daughter, and I'm not going to read this again because you can, people can look at it. But this whole journey for me started on a train journey from Waterloo Station to Southampton uh, a good number of years ago now, when you, when you lost your daughter, and there was an article in the Evening Standard drawing you when you drew attention to this tragic death. And I read that on the train home and I identified with it, having spent 45 years of my life researching asthma here at the University of Southampton and at Harvard Medical School in Boston. So I think we got in contact with each other one way or another, and I can't quite remember how that happened. And we had a conversation and uh, I think it was decided at that time I might look through some of the notes uh, that uh, uh, related to Ella's illness and maybe make some comments about a possible re-enactment uh, of the inquiry into what caused her death. And this is the 
uh, statements that the Attorney General eventually approved, which was to have a second inquest, which is what took place in December 2020. Next slide, please. Thank you. And these are the various people who who did it. Now, this is a terribly complicated slide, but actually it's quite simple. You don't have to understand statistics to look at this slide. Each one of those blocks with writing in it at the top there relates to one of Ella's admissions to one of six hospitals uh, in London. And you can see along the horizontal axis is a, a three month time span during the late autumn and winter uh, of 2011. The top wiggly line in grey is the nitrogen dioxide concentration that was measured by a DEFRA air quality monitor that was about a mile away from where uh, Rosamond and Ellen and her family lived. Then the dotted orange line, which is the line below the top dotted line, is the annual average EU NO2 uh, limit value at 40 micrograms per metre cubed which was the value, which was the 2005 value. And you can see by looking at the grey line that almost an entire period across that uh, three months, uh, Ella was living in illegal toxic concentrations of NO2. And not only NO2, if you look at the line beneath the grey line, the two, the blue and the uh, and the brown line, you can see that during the middle of this period, the particles, the PM 2.5 and PM 10, were also uh, above the legal limits that she was exposed to. And at the bottom there, you'll see the new air quality guideline values for NO2 and 2.5. So look at that. They're the health related guideline values at the bottom and you can see what Ella and her family were exposed to uh, at the top. And so, you know, we're talking here about a very substantial uh, exposure to toxic chemicals in the air leading to adverse health. Next slide, please. And as we pass through spring, you'll see the air quality improves in London, which is well recognised. And so did Ella's bad asthma attacks, as you can see by those vertical lines. And then as we got into the summer of 2000, and that's, that's it. You can see that uh, uh, her attacks almost disappeared and that uh, the air pollution fell almost to within the uh, uh, legal limit values. Not always during the summer, but mostly. Um, now, if you put the next slide on, please. We wanted to find out what was causing Ella's bad attacks because she had nearly 30 attacks that led her into one of these six hospitals, let alone the number of attacks that she had at home. But it certainly wasn't exposure to allergens because although Ella was allergic, she wasn't allergic to allergens in the winter months. She was only allergic to allergens that we see in pollen and that shows the pollen count uh, close to where um, Rosamond and Ella lived and you'll see that during the peak pollen counts, there were no or very few of Ella, uh, there were no uh, hospital admissions for, for Ella. So it wasn't due to allergy. So that's the first point. So we went through these notes, which you can imagine were substantial. Uh, two and a half large boxes of hospital notes, plus another box of general practitioner notes, which took quite a long time to get through. But I was looking here for evidence of other causes of these nasty attacks. And obviously virus infection is usually the one that we try and look for. And, and Ella had so many different virus tests when she was in these hospitals and not one of them revealed that she actually had virus related attacks of asthma in the winter months. So there's another uh, environmental factor that we could exclude. Also bacteria, also fungi, because they look for those as well. Next one, please. And what we were left with was that the air pollution that Ella was exposed to was having a direct toxic effect on her lungs without going through these other pathways. And so uh, there is a mechanism for this, and I won't bore you with it, just the next slide to show you a picture, where the particles in NO2 in a, a person who's got a genetic susceptibility to uh, chemical irritation, which I think Ella had, you can see that these 
two pollutants can lead to inflammation of the airways and remodeling of the airways in a very dramatic way by activating what we call an inflammasome. It doesn't really matter what that is, but it leads to an intractable form of asthma that is refractory to corticosteroids. So here we have a very unusual form of asthma related to chemical insult, and the references of that chemical insult are shown at the bottom of this slide. The thing about this is that, as I showed on that very first uh, air pollution uh, hospital admission slide, Ella, is that in London, where uh, Rosamond lives, but also in other areas of London, air pollution is worst in the winter. And you can see here the UK and EU limit values uh, for NO2, 40 micrograms per meter cubed, and large periods of the winter. In fact, the entire winter period, we are living in illegal levels of pollution and it drops a bit during the summer and that wavy brown line gives you the average values showing that the air pollution drops in the summer but if you look on the right hand side shown in red in the squares are the hospital admissions and GP uh, consultations that uh, Rosamond uh, interacted uh, with Ella with uh, during the different seasons and you'll see that during autumn and winter uh, by far and away the majority of Ella's bad episodes occurred and this was really uh, the reason why we started to think very seriously that air pollution was in fact the issue here. Next slide please. And this is a summary diagram. Uh, Ella had a very special type of asthma uh, uh, because her airways were uh, oversensitive to chemicals through no fault of her own, possibly genetic, but we don't know that yet. But the thing is, is that this uh, susceptibility led to these intractable coughing that she used to get in the early hours of the morning, and that would lead her to stop breathing and, and having to go into hospital acutely. And uh, that was found subsequently to be not due to the muscle contracting in the airways, but more due to the mucus that would accumulate uh, during those winter months and cause her these devastating clusters of attacks. Next slide, please. So this was the conclusion uh, on December the 16th, 2020 of the second inquest, which Rosamond sat through, uh, which was incredibly brave of her. Uh, over 10 days of evidence and various people trying to convince the coroner that air pollution wasn't a problem when it clearly was. And his conclusions are shown in the um, in the brown there and I won't read it out because you can read it yourself. These are his words, not mine. And then at the bottom uh, you can see he was really quite exercised by all of this and he felt he needed to issue a prevention of future deaths report to prevent other children and adults suffering the same way that Ella clearly had done. And you can see the reasons why he came to those conclusions in the last bullet point there. Next slide please. And this is his final conclusion. And there's the death certificate on the next slide, please. And what uh, he said, and I think what our chairman, uh, a chairperson has said today, is what an extraordinary woman Rosamond is, because she sat through all of this. And had she not struggled to bring all of this to the public attention, then we would still be living, I think, uh, in the misbelief that there were other problems that caused Ella's uh, illness, when in fact it was caused by breathing toxic air. And therefore we had every good reason to thank Rosamond for all that she has done and continues to do uh, to try and clean up the air we all breathe. Next slide, please. So not surprising that uh, Rosamond has received lots of awards, very appropriately so, but she's not a person that goes in for awards. Rosamond is the sort of person who says it as it is, as you heard in the previous uh, talk. And I just want to acknowledge again, Rosamond, your incredible uh, energy and commitment to make sure that your daughter didn't die in vain and that we together, the health professions, uh, and you and the public need to get this higher up the agenda. So I'm going to end at that point and just say, no, we needn't have this now, uh, so you can take the slides off. I will end at this point 
only to say that we need a public health campaign. And we started that process, I think, in a discussion that we had at the Royal College of Physicians back in February this year, uh, where the um, Royal College, Royal Colleges uh, convened a meeting with the politicians and with uh, Chris Whitty. And Chris Whitty uh, at that meeting said this is soluble. So I would like to endorse before I finish speaking now that we can change behaviour, we can develop solutions if the will is there. And I think uh, Chris Whitty's report, Rosamond, should be a call to arms for a public health campaign to try and get greater recognition of the importance of air pollution on human health. And we've just talked about asthma today, not about dementia, not about cardiovascular disease, not about diabetes and all the other diseases that air pollution causes. So it was estimated that 40,000 people's uh, deaths in the United Kingdom were brought forward each year by air pollution. The latest figures suggest it's 92,000 deaths each year that are brought forward. So we have a serious health issue. In fact, the greatest environmental risk to human health. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sir Stephen. Um, so much uh, in that session. Um, and I, you know, you made the point very clear that there's no longer any debate about the impact of air pollution. The evidence is very clear. Um, the call to action is very clear and it's been powerfully made by yourself and Rosamond um, this afternoon. And, uh, you know, we've got a hugely interested audience this afternoon. You know, we've got so many people attending conference today that are interested in this issue. So um, thank you very much to all of our speakers. We have got lots and lots of questions, so it's my job now to um, introduce those to you. Um, some of the questions are for everybody, some of the questions are for spe specific people. Um, and we've got um, questions for all of our panel members, but just for now I'm going to stick on the theme of air pollution. Um, and what I want to do is come to Rosamond first, a question from our audience. Um, have you got any tips or what would you suggest that we do if a child does live on a main road, but there is no chance of them moving? Have you got any advice or tips, particularly for healthcare professionals, but also for children, young people and their families? No, because I actually live in the real world and the most a consultant can do is write to the local authority. Let, let's be really real, real about this. The only thing one can do is if they can walk down quieter streets to get to a school or a job or whatever, but that is incredibly difficult. I think that's why we are asking the government to clean up the air, because come on, let's be honest, uh, we have a cost of living crisis. People cannot afford to move. And people in healthcare know the type of people that come to hospital. They, they can't afford to move, so let's not kid ourselves. I think we really need to ramp up the pressure on the government and we need to get the government to stop saying the air is cleaner than ever before and everything is okay. But no, because that would be very disingenuous um, of me if you've got a family that are stuck on a main road. Um, as you know, it is life, but we can put pressure on the government because, as Stephen said, Chris Whitty said, some of these problems with air pollution, they are solvable. The government know what they need to do to cut emissions. This is what this whole thing is about and we need to put the pressure on and I must thank Steve, um, Stephen for the work he is doing to pressurise the government on this matter but we do need people in health I do think your voices are crucial on on this matter please don't say don't stay silent otherwise children will continue to die sadly yes Thank you, Rosamond. And, you know, um, I, I, could, I agree with you and I couldn't agree with you more, really. And, you know, we are our patients advocates and you made that point really, really clear. And I think it's important for everybody to understand that our voice is really, really important in that role. Um, it's, you know, it has to come from the bottom up as well as the top down. Um, and we all are working with our patients discussing their asthma triggers. Um, but um, 
Professor Sir Stephen, can I ask you about what we should do if uh, the same question really, if a child is living on a main road um, and there isn't uh, a chance of uh, them moving, have we got uh, any tips, any advice? What, what can we do? What should we be doing? Is it all about letters to housing? Uh, well, I mean, I think that is absolutely right. The answer here is to improve the quality of air that everybody breathes. Uh, and uh, that point has been made over and over again. And that doesn't just involve central government, it involves local government. So as general practitioners and as hospital doctors and nurses and physiotherapists, you know, we can, with our trusted voice, influence the behaviour of local authorities. And I think that's something that we need to do more of. And certainly in England, as opposed to the United Kingdom, we have these integrated uh, care systems that have been set up now where health related organisations like hospitals and primary care settings and wider public health and um, planning and industry organisations meet in common to agree what they should be doing to improve public health. And so surely here we have a fabulous opportunity with these new integrated care systems to be able to do this. There's 42 of them in England. They've only just been fully established. So this is our time to strike. And I think air pollution is low hanging fruit. Um, some would say that water pollution is equally low hanging, but that will be fixed very quickly. Air pollution is a more protracted uh, issue. The second thing I would say, Viv, is, is just coming back to Atazade's uh, comment. You know, one does have to make sure that people are taking the treatment that they're given. And I know that's I'm not trying to be patronising here, but so often, as is the case, you know, when you have a busy life, things don't actually always fall into place there as they should. And I think uh, Atazade's talk illustrated that we need to make sure that we get the best out of the treatment, as well as the environmental interventions that I've just talked about. Indeed. And thank you very much for that. Um, and actually, it leads us really nicely to you, Darush, um, building on from that comment. Have you got any tips about air pollution? Obviously, uh, we, we, you, you've been focusing on inhalers uh, and the, the very clear agenda from the NHS about uh, the impact of inhalers on the environment. Um, and further thoughts from you about this? I just think um, when when I'm doing my work with the 45 PCNs across Northwest London, it's definitely something that um, I bring up um, with with. I'm very passionate about treating tobacco dependency, for example, and mm. exposure to secondhand smoking, for example. And that 30 second approach uh, which we've got, which we call the ask, advise and act approach, um, ask if a person smokes or lives with a smoker, advising them if if they are interested in stopping smoking, um, combination of support and treatments available, and then acting, um, signposting. So 30 seconds to save a life is what we say. I mean, that's just, a, um, but I don't think many clinicians routinely do this still, even after all this training. So I'm yeah. really passionate about that. And then of course, um, if there's a, um, uh, it's been some really good th mentions in the chat about um, asking questions about people's um, housing and living conditions and th linking in with social prescribing link workers wherever possible within uh, primary care networks, just trying to see what we can do holistically, actively yeah. thinking about what it's like to be in that person's shoes has to be high on our agenda. Yeah, indeed. Absolutely. Um, you know, I work for an integrated care board and uh, in my area we have a very vibrant children and young people's asthma transformation network and the engagement from our partner organisations, particularly environmental health, is phenomenal. Mm. There is a lot of work going out on out there on the ground and what I'm finding from my partners in environmental health is that they want to know more about children and young people's asthma. Um, They've all heard about Ella. Everybody is, you know, shocked. And, you know, there is no doubt that Ella's story is having an impact. Um, uh, the work, as I say, that's going on at local level is phenomenal. But one of the things that, um, you know, 
strikes me is that NICE have issued guidance on what advice we should give as healthcare professionals to patients, to children, young people, adults who are uh, whose asthma is affected by air quality. And advice includes, amongst other things, um, shut your windows when the air quality indicators outside are, you know, poor for your for your child and for your asthma. But we forget about indoor air quality. If we close the windows to block out the bad air outside, we're ex increasing our exposure to the bad air inside. So to, you know, the mould, the smoke, possibly exposure that you talk about, Darush, which is so important for us to, to always remember. And I'm not sure, I think it's really important that we hang on to that message. So. Uh, yeah, I want to come back to you guys now and I'm going to, um, Rosamond, I'm going to come to you first again. What about indoor air quality? What, you know, is this something you alluded to that it's next for your foundation? And what are your thoughts on that moving forward? I think it's really, really, really Im important um, because the figure of 7 million from WHO that die prematurely, 3.8 million on that is indoor air. But indoor air, there are parts of it we can control. Um, like cooking, having a, a, a proper filter, candles. <laughs> when you said close the window, I thought, no, do not close the window. We don't close the window in 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 my house. Goodness me, no. Uh, but again, a lot of education needs to be had uh, uh, about that. Um, and Stephen has actually um, produced a really good report on that. See, Stephen, I'm plugging your study for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, but yeah, I think. I think it's best. I think we need to educate people about it. You see, I read so much, and a lot of the time I am overloaded um, with information because I have a general passion and interest in um, this area. But indoor air, I don't think we actually talk about it much, Stephen, do we? I, I don't think so, no. But I no, think we so, so th there is a refocus on indoor air. I'm uh, in one of my roles, I'm a, a what's called a UK RI clean air champion. And it's a, a 42 and a half million pound investment by the, the uh, uh, research councils on air quality research. And um, we've just uh, um, been rolling out what we call wave two, which is all about indoor air and getting new research on indoor air and indoor air and health. Because, you know, there is a saying that every house is a person's castle and that the government can't kind of walk through your door as, <clears throat> and start measuring things as they can outside. So in a way, uh, this has been a protected environment and because of that, all sorts of terrible things are happening in that chemicals are being brought into the house uh, and as you correctly pointed out, we're beginning to seal our houses now to keep energy in. But of course, moisture starts to increase and we start to get fungi and house dust mites uh, replicating. And, uh, you know, children are exposed to all of this. Um, so I think we need to shine a light on the indoor environment. And there will be over the next two years, a lot of new research being done in this country that will hit the newspapers and hit the news which I think will start to change the debate because it's the 24 hour exposure uh, every single day to air pollution that's important. And of course, there are no safe spaces unless you do live in a completely protected environment. So the only answer to this is to get the air pollution down. And so public need information on this. And as Rosamond knows, because she's been a great proponent of this, the public needs to know what they're exposed to and they need to have monitors in their locality, both outside and inside buildings, so that they can take appropriate actions. Yeah, can I just quickly say, um, under indoor you know, air, I'm going to have to mention the elephant in, in the room, which is wood burning. And anyone on this um, webinar who starts rolling their eyes or has <laughs> anything to say about it just put a monitor <laughs> in your house and then burn wood and watch the pm to and uh, you know nitrogen the, the, the dioxide climb um i've spoken to government about this and they are reluctant to legislate but i think wood burning again it will become one of those things like cigarettes sadly yeah. Um, it's really unfortunate that they are not willing to take it on, but, you, you know, we really do need, you know, sometimes we have to make really tough 
falls. And unfortunately, I'm not saying it because it is the Conservative government. I'm just saying that government sometimes just have to do these things. We found that wood burning is carcinogenic. Just call it what it is and inform people. But again, you see, they haven't informed the public about this, who this winter, sadly, are going to be burning due to we know very good reasons and it's quite sad so people are burning it to keep warm and yet it will impact health as well so that's where we are and it's a very uncomfortable feeling when you know what's going on really yes indeed i think there's something we're going to be hearing a lot more about as well uh, going forward um i just want to ask one more question really on this topic and i suspect i know the answer it's a quick answer from everybody but darush i am going to come to you first should we in asthma reviews be routinely asking patients about where they live and also about their indoor air quality as well do we have time for this do you have time for this in your consultations is it something you feel that we need to give more priority to um definitely I think the pressures are huge though in primary care and I think um, when I talked about 30 seconds to save a life with the bringing up the smoking for example we need to we need to have something along those lines for very brief advice around uh, indoor and outdoor air pollution I think we yeah. should have a model uh, a structure around that that we can mm -hmm. all use and practice and roll out. So I think that's a top tip there, a very brief advice, actually, because in the one hand, especially kids with asthma, they also have a lot of allergies. And, and you know, the, the standard allergy, indoor allergy advice is ventilate, open your windows. So actually, perhaps we need a bit more joined up thinking in terms of both um, outdoor and indoor air quality. Um, thank you, Darush. Um, Professor Sir Stephen, I have another question for you, a very direct question. If the inflammation caused by air pollution can be refractory to steroid, how do we prevent asthma attacks in this case? Yeah, so it's, we've got to build into the guidelines of asthma management environmental interventions. The most human diseases, whether it be diabetes, dementia, whatever, cardiac, hypertension, are caused by diet or environmental problems. And, and, and yet we have now a national illness service that supports the United Kingdom, not a national health service. Yeah. And so if we really want to make a difference, we've got to stop depending on drugs and, and surgery and start thinking about lifestyles and how we can clean up the way we live. And whether it's obesity on the one side or dementia on the other or asthma on another or COPD, it all comes back to how we behave. And I think, uh, you know, I don't see any evidence of this, by the way, happening in the NHS, which is very worrying. Uh, the NHS needs to, I think, completely redesign itself around maintaining health and not just treating illness. Um, and until we do that, we're not going to get the sort of attention uh, that uh, we need. But I think as health professionals, environmental interventions are things that we can do. And, uh, you know, green spaces, uh, lobby uh, our local authority for green spaces. Uh, as Rosamond says, you know, why should we be walking down polluted, busy roads, breathing toxic chemicals that can, you know, eventually lead to asthma or non-smoking lung cancer. I mean, you know, it's unacceptable. So we can take avoidance strategies, but the main push has to be on local and central government because it's only by reducing the air, uh, air pollution and cleaning up the air, just as it is with the water, that we're going to actually uh, create these impacts uh, on health that we urgently need. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Um, I want to come to uh, Darush again, just for, uh, I'm conscious that we haven't really picked up too much on um, inhalers in the panel session. So I do want to ask you a question. And I'm so glad that somebody in the audience asked this question because this was one of my questions as well. Um, but uh, what is the role that community pharmacists can play in ensuring children and young people use their inhalers correctly? 
Um, so in, in my experience, you know, we're, we're all constantly hearing about the importance of community pharmacy. And of course, it's so much more accessible um, in many cases. But actually, you know, a question, are our community pharmacists actually trained to check inhaler technique? Um, is it something that we should expect all community pharmacists to be able to do, to have the skills to do? And do they have the capacity to do that, do you think, Darush? Very good question, and I think um, the actual it's going to be one of those um, that I think if I was involved in working in a GP practice, I would want to get to know my local community pharmacies and, and find out what training they've had in this area. Now, I know that um, there's a, a, an organization called CPPE where they which is Center for Pharmacy Postgraduate Education where they'd have to do an online module. They'd have to um, learn about the inhalers. It's quite a comprehensive training. They go online and they learn about the different inhalers, etc. And um, they hopefully then go on to become practice being a coach. But I have to say, um, I think attending skills based workshops face to face would be ideal to complement yeah. that. That might not necessarily happen. Um, and it might be that actually children and young people is an area they're not so confident about. They're probably yeah. used to doing a lot of adults. So the good news is there's a new medicine service, which is a remunerated service for the pharmacy. So there will be definitely um, a what's in it for me from the pharmacist. And yeah. there's also a, a pharmacy quality scheme that's just going live yeah. Yeah. around that as well. So it's. Um, yes. I think that will motivate them to get more involved and do a lot more upskilling and training, and that will hopefully have a knock on, a good positive knock on effect to our children, young people, Thank and you. their families. Thank you, Darush. Key message there is to get to know your community pharmacist. Yeah, brilliant. Um, we are out of time, but Rosamond, I want to come back to you for a final word. Um, top tip from you about what we can all be doing on a micro level in uh, for our contributions to uh, improving air, outdoor air quality. Have you got something that you can give us in 20 seconds? Yeah, definitely short journeys. There's been research that shows people are willing to walk up to two miles. So where you can uh, bin the car really. And I know this is going out to people in rural areas. Um, so obviously I'm not including them because I get shouted out over that, but where you can really just don't drive. That is absolutely amazing. And actually somebody in the chat mentioned um, um, Mums for Runs, I think it's called. So have a look in the chat about that because that's a fantastic initiative around reducing journeys, particularly around school gates and things. Um, well, can I just say to the entire panel on behalf of the audience, what a fantastic session on air pollution and asthma. Thank you to each and every one of you. It has been absolutely brilliant. Your questions, your contributions, everything has been fantastic. Thank you so much. And we are now going to move on to our uh, next agenda on uh, item on the agenda, and it's another panel session. And in this uh, panel session, we're going to focus on teens. Um, and I'd like to introduce our first speaker to you all. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to Louise Porter, who's the national lead nurse for the Burdett National Transition Nursing Network. So Louise, over to you. Thank you. And thank you for asking me to come and present for you today. And there's been some absolutely fantastic presentations. And after each one, I've thought, how are they going to follow that? And now it's my turn to follow it. So I will try. So um, thank you very much. I am um, part of the Burdett National Transition Nursing Network, and there are four other regional nurse advisors who work in the network with myself. And some of them should be on the call today. So if there's anything that you want to ask, maybe put it in the questions and they'll be able to pick them up or I'll be able to pick them up. So I've been asked to talk to you about improving transition pathways and reducing health inequalities in transition clinics. So if we just go to the next slide, please. So just thinking about um, transition and the healthcare transition is, um, the definition is the purposeful planned process of preparing, empowering and supporting young people when they're moving from a children's um, centred service into an adult orientated service, but also takes into account the medical, um, educational, vocational needs and the emotional support of young people as well and psychosocial support. So just thinking about health inequalities, I'm not going to define it because we've heard a lot about that today, but just thinking about it in the context of transitions, lots of different health inequalities that um, 
you know, sit with transition. So there's lots of differences between service provision. So there's differences within service provision within one organisation. So um, transition offer looks very different um, service by service across an organisation. And it looks even more different across um, a system approach as well. And just thinking about um, kind of finances and how services are funded. Some services historically have had a lot of charity funding, so they might be seen as the richer service and then you've got the poorer service. So actually the richer service might have um, more resources for transition, more time, um, more personnel. We've also got that postcode lottery across the country as well. So where young people might be moving um, from kind of schools into colleges and universities, there might be very different provision when they're moving forward. Um, thinking about support for parents as well, that can be very different depending on which service they are and which area they're in. And also what I've seen as well is that um, we have sometimes children's services holding on to some patients and it might be just their opinion that they're not quite ready yet, but some patients sometimes are held on to because um, they might be the easier patients or they moved across quicker because they're more difficult patients. So there's a mix of um, kind of reasons why we might hold on to them or let them go quicker. And also health literacy as well. So where um, we have got very poor health literacy, then sometimes actually, um, you know, these patients might not do so well when they move across the adult service, because actually if they don't have good transition support, then they're kind of trying to navigate those services and access services on their own or with the guidance of the parents. It depends on what their health literacy is like of how to access services when needed. So we do need fairness for all and we have to think as well about the groups of patients that might have a learning disability or autism and do we actually provide reasonable adjustments for them so that actually the, the kind of um, fairness is there but actually you know the support is very specific to that young person and that family. Next slide please. So just thinking about um, the transition pathway and what is a transition pathway it is more than an age range but we do have to put an age around it so we talk about transition starting from that move from primary school into high school so around 11 12 up until about 25 which is um, when we think that the brain is fully developed so that's the current thinking that it fully develops around about mid 20 so we go up to 25. So there's three distinct stages to transition as well. So it covers the children's service and the adult service, but also some people have young people services. So it covers that as well. So the three distinct stages are the preparation in the children's service um, and in the young person's service. And then there will be a point of transfer. So the point of transfer is the official move across from children's into the adult service, that handover of care. And then it's a support in the adult service to get settled and embedded and engaged with that, that adult service. It also requires that full multidisciplinary approach. It can't just rely on, on one person because if something happens to that one person, so if they leave or if they're unwell, then transition tends to fall down. And it does need to be everybody doing their right, the right job for that young person. So everybody will have a different skill within transition to share with that young person. Next slide, please. So what are transition clinics? So transition clinics, um, we call them lots of different things and can happen at different times. There isn't really a right and wrong about what we call them, but what we need to do is make sure that everybody understands what we mean by the term that we're using and everybody understands their role within it. So transition clinics really are set up to help prepare and support young people um, going getting ready to go to the adult service, but also supporting them when they're in the adult service, so that engagement when they move through. The transition programme should be used within that transition um, clinic. So the transition programme doesn't have to be a specific one, but we've used the example here of Ready, Steady, Go. And a lot of you will know that that came out of Southampton um, following some work that um, Janet McDonough did in a research project. So actually, um, that is a really good tool to be able to set out the steps through transition. So the things that should happen in a consistent way. So if we have a transition program in place, then we can get consistency. We can have a look of transition that looks the same. So if we're using that through multiple services, then it looks the same. But actually, it's flexible enough to be able to be delivered on a person centred basis. Another example of that would be the growing up and gaining independence um, model that they use in Great Ormond Street as well. So transition um, clinics also should have some kind of holistic assessment of the young person. We can use heads if we're not using um, a transition program that specifically covers all of that. Um, and the children's and adult service should work together and they should ideally have a joint cl clinic, but it doesn't have to happen. And we'll talk a little bit more about joint clinics later on. So the questions we want to ask ourselves is if we're having a joint clinic as well, is it a one off clinic or is it a, a series of um, clinic appointments over time? And actually, do we specifically need a transition clinic for our service 
or can we deliver a good transition without a transition clinic? And I would say, yes, you can, because the transition programme can go through any clinic setting and it should follow that young person through. Next slide, please. So just thinking again about health inequalities and in transition, um, we've talked about social group and that matters. You know, it does make a difference to how well they do through transition. Finance is definitely an issue. So it could be the finances of the family. It could be the finances of that young person. So can have they got enough money to come to clinic? Have they got enough money to get on the bus or taxi or are they able to drive themselves? Or are the parents able to drive? Paying for short breaks if they haven't got um, packages of care that will do that. And it can be the added extras that people talk about, the kind of additional things that would help with transition. And um, if you've got better standards of living, generally um, we're seeing that they, they can do better um, with transition support. Peer support is another thing, you know, if we can't um, get them there, then they can't access that support from other people. And peer support comes in very different um, guises. So it could be anything from kind of a meetup for an hour um, at clinic, or it could be bowling, or it could be an hour bound weekend. But also it could be for the complex needs patients in a hospice. So it might be kind of a set up as a, as a day centre and go along and spend time. And you might not get any other time with anybody else with you know, any kind of uh, condition that you've got. And actually, if they haven't got their own transport to get them there, then the hospice might not have the transport to get them there either, so they can't go. Explaining treatment, care and operations. Um, I did have um, a consultant say to me once that actually, if they go to a clinic in kind of a middle class area, they ask loads of questions, so clinic always overruns. But if you go into a deprived area, they don't ask so many questions, so you kind of finished on time. So we have to ask ourselves as well, are we kind of then explaining things properly for the people who don't ask questions? And that young person might not ask questions, they might sit quietly. So actually, are we asking them questions in a way that they then want to answer or able to answer and are we kind of checking their knowledge and their understanding are they really taking on board what we're saying long-term conditions as well can create vulnerabilities and these young people can be bullied because actually they've had a lot of time away from schools so their friends have moved on without them so they become excluded um, from kind of groups that are happening or it could be that they look different so they might be taking their inhalers so it makes them stand out or they could be having I don't know, gastrointestinal problems and there might be that child at school which is classified as that one that smells. I remember from school it was that that child that was overweight and that child that smelled but actually have they got a condition that makes them like that and actually what can we do to support them? They can be more susceptible to um, you know, risk taking behaviour. We know that young people do have to take risks. It's part of their learning. But actually, um, is that then affecting their health? You know, is it smoking? Is it, you know, going out to festivals and, and drinking and they haven't got anybody with them? Um, they also could get involved in violent crimes. So we have seen that actually where um, young people have been excluded from social groups and they haven't really felt like they've got anybody, then they kind of get involved in gang activity because actually that is their um, kind of little network of friends and it's like a little family that they get drawn into. Next slide please. So barriers to getting it right as well. So there's lots of barriers to getting it right. We know there's a difference in provision and thresholds of care from children's to adult services. It's not necessarily wrong but how do we kind of frame that in the conversation um, with young people and how do we plan and prepare for that as professionals and understanding each other's service as well. We've talked about the rich and poor services, some services are better funded than others and hopefully with the work that we're doing with NHS England we'll be able to improve that in the future and have some funding for transition. We know that there is a postcode lottery as well so you get different provision in different parts of the country. And there is a difference um, in transition delivery through primary, secondary and tertiary care. And there's a difference in understanding and interpretation of transition as well. So for mental health services, they, might, they work to a recovery model. So they don't want to start transition early because they never want to assume that they're going to go into an adult service. So their transition sometimes is really quite short. Um, acute services work on episodes of care and GPs are an all age service that don't always um, recognise that transition um, is part and parcel of what they should be doing as well. Transition and transfer. So the words often be, are used interchangeably, but they mean two different things. So transition is the process. So that's the whole process of um, support from 11 to 25 or whenever they're diagnosed to 25. And transfer is an event that happens within that. So that's the formal move of the patient across to the adult service. And again, um, you know, the transition clinic and joint clinic, the terms are used interchangeably and we just need to define what it is that we're trying to achieve. Next slide, please. 
So um, just to reduce health inequalities as well, we're just saying that not one size fits all, but actually um, we're saying the look of transition could be the same. So if we use ready, steady, go, it can look the same, but actually that is flexible to adapt to that person. So we have that person centred approach. Communication is the key. So if we've got good communication across all professionals with the young person and with the families as well, then we should be able to get transition right. But we need to communicate across organisational boundaries as well. We really need to listen to young people and understand young people, understand what's important to them, who influences them, so who are the key players around them to influence change in their behaviour and acceptance and, and um, compliance with their treatment and care. And thinking about their hopes and goals for the future, you know, their hopes and goals won't be the same as yours. You're focusing on asthma and actually their hopes and goals might be something completely different. And asthma just wants to be a small part of their life. But actually, how do we attach our agenda to their agenda as well? And thinking about their um, challenges and barriers within their life, you know, what is their situation and what's going to help them going forward? And don't forget the parents. They need transition as well, but it needs to be in parallel with that young person. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to kind of talk about um, Leeds, really. So my previous role was um, transition leader, Leeds Teaching Hospitals. So just to kind of put it into context and just to try and get you to think about your services and how you might see transition through your services, I was just going to use the examples that I've got of lived experience of supporting services in Leeds to develop um, transition pathways and clinics in particular. Next slide, please. So just thinking about um, kind of my experience and the number of different kind of clinics that I saw. So there was a lot of joint clinics um, and some of the clinics were used to share professional opinions rather than just transition. Um, some of them were for transition and they were used to meet the new team. So it was a bit more of a handover clinic rather than a, a transition clinic per se. There was lots of different models that I came across. So there was one clinic appointment or there was a series of clinic appointments. Um, and then there was one held in children's and one's held in adults. So that was for the joint clinic, meeting those adult professionals. NICE does say that if you can do it in adults, it is better, um, but it depends on your setup and how you're able to do that. So I would say that actually um, it's whatever meets your patient group and whatever works for your service would be the right thing. There isn't really a right and wrong. Next slide, please. So it's just thinking about actually your patient groups and what you need. So if you have one joint appointment, um, you'll definitely have the children's team there. So there could be three people um, and you could then have people from the adult service. So it might be one person, so it might just be the consultant or just the nurse, but you could have the whole team. So if you take that into context, you could have about eight people in that in that room. And if you're having um, a clinic where you're, all, you're seeing all those professionals together, it might feel really intimidating for that young person to speak and say anything. It might work really well if you've got a good relationship with that young person. But if you haven't, just think about actually what would that feel like if you were that person sat at 15 in front of all those other people? Would you be able to share the things that you were really worried about and consider whether it's face to face or virtual. The feedback that we've had is that virtual do work well where you know your patients really well, but where you haven't got a relationship with them already can be quite difficult for them. And I would say ask the young people, you know, give them the flexibility of, of choosing if you've got that option, but actually find out from them how they feel about it and the location of the clinic as well. So where is it going to be children's or adults? If you're going to have um, everybody separately, that sometimes works better and it means that you can extend that clinic appointment. So where you're short on time, you've only got 20 minutes for that appointment. If everybody splits up into different rooms, then you could have an hour to an hour and a half with that young person, everybody seeing them and not having to extend any of that kind of clinic time. And just think about who um, is familiar to that young person. So if you're having it in the adult side, who would go with them? Um, is there somebody from Children's that wants to accompany them as somebody to support? Um, next slide, please. So just thinking about the series of appointments, it could be phased over time. That definitely helps your complex needs patients or patients with learning disability or autism where they struggle with change. It really helps if you can do them over time. So you could have three appointments jointly in children, you could have three appointments jointly in adults, and then you've got six appointments to kind of share that across. And it can be really beneficial to families as well. And we hear sometimes that young people transition really well, but the families struggle. And it's sometimes that the family's voice hasn't been heard in that and they haven't had time to talk about their worries and concerns separately. So just thinking about um, safety as well. So actually you might want to do this phase approach for your high risk patients, a bit like asthma patients. They don't take the medication, they're at risk of death. So actually it's really important that they engage with the adult service. And just thinking about um, who is familiar with them um, and how to how to do that handover and promoting that um, collaborative work in next slide please
there's a bit of delay on this. <laughs> Moving to the next slide. So a series of appointments. Yeah. So a series of appointments can be done, but then you can also have a transition event. So just thinking about the different type of clinic appointments. So um, if you can't have like that joint clinic because you haven't got a clinic time to do it, you could have a transition event, which might be in an evening or in the weekend. And it does help um, patients and families because they can get peer support, education, and, and you can gain feedback from them as well. But it helps the organisation as well, because sometimes it saves time because you've got high, high volume teaching. So you've got everybody in one room. It can help with the assurance and equity and consistency so you're giving the same message to a lot of people and it can reduce cost as well um, next slide please and it can help with engagement and prevents dna so it does reduce cost so that's just an explanation really of the different ways that you can do it um, i would just say from this point of view it could be an opt-in or opt-out so if you kind of asking them to opt in then you might not get a good take up on the appointments you might want to class it as a clinic appointment next slide please so just to how to make transition clinics work, um, we just need to think about our target audience and basically getting the three things right. So is it right information by the right person at the right time? Um, so that's the kind of key essence of transition really is that we, it is a full MDT approach and everybody's taking responsibility and getting it right. Next slide, please. So right environment, you know, just thinking about what is there for young people, getting them to sit together, having space to sit together and given developmentally appropriate information in a holistic way and encouraging conversations and ensuring that um, rooms are soundproofed as well. That's the other thing to listen out for young people saying, actually, I'm not going to talk because everybody in the waiting room can hear. Making sure you're getting feedback from young people and thinking of creative ways to develop clinics as well. Next slide, please. So just examples of different um, things that people have done. So this was a cardiac um, children's clinic and they put a sofa in there for young people to have a waiting area. Next slide, please. The next one is an example of an adult waiting area. You can see how different that looks and how sparse it looks. They actually had the telly on because you could hear everything in the clinic rooms and they weren't soundproofed. So the telly to muffle the noise, but it was actually on a news channel, so it wasn't interesting to young people. Next slide, please. So it's just thinking about the different ways. This is, we'll send the slides out to you and you can have a look at this, but this is, was an example of the renal team and how they made their um, service really young person friendly. Next slide, please. So the things they did was um, they created an area that looked young person friendly and they created, they developed a film as well and a booklet for young people. So this was the young adult clinic and it just looked really friendly and welcoming to young people. So it was set in an adult setting that looked really adult, but actually made it look like young persons. Next slide, please. They created a film and you can follow the link. It's on Leeds Children's Hospital TV to have a look at the film. And it was just a welcome to film made on iPhones by the uh, by the professionals themselves and just edited in to just be a nice welcome. So if you can't come across and meet the professionals, you can watch a film, you can see what they look like and they will get their foot in the door if they've already seen you beforehand. Next slide, please. So this is just the difference, really. Um, so we'll send this out to you. You can have a look at the issues with transition and some of the solutions that I came up with to be able to get over those barriers to creating transition um, clinics in renal. Next slide, please. This is an example of a pathway and just to make sure that you've got your transition clinic right at the point of um, kind of that whole process, but your joint clinic is right at the point of um, transfer. Next slide, please. And this is just how to measure success. So I think this is the last slide now. So just thinking about actually how are you going to measure that transitions going well within your services? So things to think about is your kind of DNAs, the experience of your patients, your staff satisfaction within that and any kind of local um, kind of measures that you can look at. So asthma control and um, you know the kind of measures around their compliance with treatment and um, taking their inhalers and how well that is going as well that's so that's that's it and over to you that is amazing louise and i'm sorry i was rushing you a little bit there towards the end we've got two more speakers to come in this session but i'm really really glad that you're going to be able to share those slides we've got questions coming in and i've got a burning question as well for you so in the panel panel session um at the end but thank you very much louise so now it's time to move on to our next speaker and i'm really pleased to introduce um katie puplett who's the uh, senior policy manager children and young people's policy manager for the um children and young people's um, transformation program at NHS England. So Katie, over to you. 
Thanks, Viv. Um, yeah, so as Viv mentioned, I work for the National um, CYP Transformation Team and can very conveniently, for the purposes of this um, conference today, I lead on asthma and transition. So I've got a nice blend there. Um, and what they've asked me to talk about today is trying to think about um, health equity when we when we talk about transition and obviously relating that to asthma. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. So this is just telling you a little bit about why we created the programme at NHSE. So we know that there are pockets of fantastic transition services like the one um, that Louise spoke to around the renal, the renal clinic in um, Leeds. But generally, on the whole, um, children and people tell us that their experience of transition is poor. Um, it's often poorly planned, poorly executed, and this as a consequence means that young people disengage from services and this can be really detrimental to their physical health condition or their mental health condition. And the transition uh, process for young people with long term conditions such as asthma can be particularly challenging. And I think this is a time that's also really challenging for healthcare professionals who are having to think about um, interventions for very young children with asthma and then also those moving into adult services when they're having to think about some very different um, topics of, of conversation and consideration. If you consider things like um, smoking, drug use, adherence to therapies, emerge, emerging mental health conditions, all of these things that are perhaps much different to the sort of the paediatric, classic sort of paediatric asthma patient. And when you compare um, the presentation of asthma between uh, young ch younger children and young adults, the, the, the presentation symptoms and management is quite different, um, making it even harder for healthcare professionals as well. Um, and addition, in addition to that, um, the management of, um, uh, it's, you know, you've got you've got to think about the whole spectrum of toddlers, school aged children um, and adolescents and, and how, how different that is for for physicians. Um, I think one of the main um, issues is that there's there is a lot of guidance out there, um, but and there are and there are nice guidance around transition, but I think there's a huge gap between policy and and real life inflammation, and I think that's due for due to a lot of reasons, and I've listed um, sort of four of them there. <laughs> so these are um, this this slide just shows you that actually. For young adults, in terms of outcomes, there's a real sort of peak around um, uh, admissions and uh, exacerbations of asthma um, in young adults, um, which is quite poor in, in this country in particular. And there's again a variety of reasons reasons for that. Um, a lot of a, a lot there's a lot of reports around adherence, poor adherence to your inhaled corticosteroids, um, and that. And that um, ranges from sort of 25 to 35 percent. And obviously not using your preventer ICSs are uh, strongly associated with poor outcomes and even deaths. And, and, and the sort of when you when you ask a young person, this is the types of things that they say um, why they're not taking their inhalers. So that, you know, they, they question their diagnosis. They probably don't have a great understanding of it. If it's not been explained to them very well. There's, a, there's been a big study that shows that many people and young people think of asthma as a very intermittent condition. It's not a chronic condition and it's sort of, oh, I'm fine most of the time and I only need my inhaler when it flares up. Um, so they're not sort of prioritising their, their treatment, um, particularly as Louise talked about when they're sort of starting to experiment and, and their lifestyles are changing and potentially leading quite a bit more of a chaotic um, lifestyle than perhaps as they were a bit more sort of nurtured as, as younger, younger children by parents and paediatric teams. Next slide, please. So um, in the long term plan, there was a commitment to develop a 0 to 25 model of care. This is what we said we were going to do in the long term plan, and this is why our programme has prioritised transition. And there on the right is just our vision that the, you know, these child's children and young adults will not feel lost. Um, and there's a, they, young people talk about a cliff edge when they sort of reach um, transition age, and that's, that's um, evident in asthma clinics as well. 
And this is our, our sort of timeline of events. And as you can see, we work really closely with Louise's team and Louise has been so helpful in, in sort of building our programme and her expertise has just been integral to, to all that we've done uh, within the policy team. So these are all the bits and pieces that are going on nationally to try and um, improve transition. And these obviously apply to um, uh, young people transitioning in all, all work streams. But I just wanted to talk about um, ra rather than just asthma, but you, you know, we're trying to think about um, transition across every uh, clinical condition. So uh, we have written a national framework for transition, which has been, has been approved by a number of different stakeholders. Um, and it's currently sitting with the publishing approvals team um, and we're hoping to get that published within the next few weeks. And similarly, the other document that we've produced is a core capabilities document, and that's been formally consulted on with over 1200 responses. And we had a large uh, young person steering group that helped us to develop both of those documents. Um, what we want to do alongside that core capabilities is to provide some training. And that's, again, something that Louise is working on for us um, so that when we eventually publish these um, documents, there is a way of fulfilling them. What we don't want to do is obviously send these documents out um, as sort of gold standard, but they um, we're setting uh, clinicians up to fail because there's no ways of no way of achieving them because the training just isn't kind of out there as, as the way we'd, we'd, we think it should be at the moment. There's a project going on in uh, the northeast around seamless transition in diabetes, and that's quite that's a sort of a QI improvement type project that we've commissioned working with young people as they move from um, child to adult services with diabetes. And that's just undergoing some evaluation and they're having a think about how they can sort of scale and spread that up. We're in the really early stages of talking about a transition currency. So what we finally what we know is that the way things get implemented is if people are paid to do them. So we want uh, to make sure that people are paid for doing transition well. So we're working with the community currency team to build a currency for transition. And at the moment we're thinking about transition as sort of a um, a mild, uh, mild, moderate and more complex um, payment. So that um, in the in the community, you'll get paid um, depending on how many children you, you could potentially have sitting in each one of those categories of transition. So if they've got lots of service involvement then they're likely to need a much more complex transition pathway. And we want to again make sure that the communities get appropriately paid for that. Um, Louise has talked about her work with the Burdett nursing nurses, so I don't need to go in that. We also know that so money helps to get things done, and we also know that inspections help to get things done. So we are working with the CQC. And we're doing that because at the moment the CQC only inspect children's services on transition and we do know that um, the only way that transition services work well is if they're jointly commissioned and jointly supported by adult services. So we are working with them at the moment to create a brief guide to transition for adult services so ultimately that adult services will get inspected on transition as well. Um, there is a pilot that's just started with the diabetes team and they are they have a focus on transition and I've put a little bit of detail about those pilots in the appendix so you can go and uh, go and have a look at those. And the other thing we're trying to do is to think about a digital flag so we can, can actually identify those young people as they're in that transition space because at the moment it's really hard to um, obviously identify those young people and then if they're not identified how do we a pay for it and b make sure they're getting the treatments and interventions that they need. This is just a an example of what a little bit of a key summary really of what the framework looks like so it's just giving some examples and some key recommendations on this slide and like I say this is in in uh, with the publishing team at the moment and we'll keep more posters as to when that finally gets published. What we wanted to do within the um, framework as well is to make it very clear about the expectations around for regions, integrated care systems and then providers. And that's what we've broken that down to. So again, I'll let you read this in your own time. I'm not going to talk through every single one of these slides in, in super loads of detail. This is on the um, this is in the framework as well, and it's what I like to call our pyramid of hope around ensuring that um, these are the sort of the principles of care that we have assigned to good transition.
And within the core capabilities that I described earlier, we we've, we identify sort of the main skills and knowledge that we think healthcare, the healthcare workforce needs to deliver high quality transition. And in there, we talk specifically about um, understanding uh, health inequality space by these groups of young people. Within the, and hopefully most of you will have seen this or on this call, so we published the um, National uh, standards of care for children, National Bundle of Care for Children and Young People with asthma back in September. And there is in those resources, there is minimum standards for, of um, uh, severe, severe and difficult treat asthma services, which obviously include quite a detailed description of um, transition and making sure they are transferred smoothly into adult services for, um, for asthma as well. Within the uh, framework that we're in the process of getting uh, published at the moment, we've also got some minimum standards for transition and they align quite nicely with what the severe asthma framework for um, transition uh, moving into adult services looks like as well. And these are exactly all of the things that Louise just talked about. So what we want to do now is we've got all of these great pieces of work going on. We've got some fantastic documents. We've had some really amazing engagement from young people and their families. And now we need to think about how can we actually implement this on the ground floor? How do we transfer sort of these sort of more high level policy and documents into delivery and real change for young people? So we've got a strategic implementation group which is a very small group and we, and we deliberately did it that way because we've had such a lot of engagement over all of the transition focuses up till now, but we wanted to make this group really quite small and with some key players who could really influence change on the ground floor. So we've got some key partners working with us to think about that delivery and implementa implementing all of the, the excellent work that's sort of come to date from, from all of those different groups that we've, I've talked about already. I think that might be my last slide. Oh, this is just to say what, what the strategic implementation group is about. So again, these are all going to be, my understanding is these are all going to be available to have a look at. If you've got any questions um, or you want any more detail or would like a conversation about any of this, then do just drop me an email. That's it for me though. These, I think these are all just in the annex, so you, you can skip through those. They just a little bit more about the, diet, the seamless transition service and a little bit more about the pilots that are going on in the diabetes work as well. But if you want, Ed, I'm sort of trying to skip along, I'm conscious that um, Rob's talking next. So any sort of details, obviously, I can answer them in the panel. And if you want to drop me an email and talk about any of the stuff I've gone through in more detail, I'll be very happy to do that. That's brilliant, Katie. Thank you so much. What a roundup of what a huge amount of work you guys have been doing. And it's great to know that there is such policy work going on um, and that we're going to be hearing more and more about this. I think it's hugely important. So thank you very much, Katie. Um, OK, we're going to move on to our uh, next uh, speaker now, um, which is all about transition and adherence. Of course, we couldn't think about um, our uh, this age group without thinking about adherence. And I'm really delighted to introduce Professor Rob Horn, who's a, a professor of behavioural medicine. And I'm sure many of us, including myself on this call, have read much of Rob's research work uh, in the past. So I'm really looking forward to this session. Um, thank you. And Rob, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Vivian, for that invitation and to Katie for the amazing work that's been done around uh, the transformation. I'm very pleased to say that training on adherence is, is a part uh, of that programme and some of the stuff I want to talk about now can be found, uh, you know, incorporated into the training materials uh, that, that have been provided. So this question of um, adherence. Next slide, please. So, you know, we, we know that engagement with treatment, adherence with treatment is a huge issue in asthma. And for all ages, much of what I'm going to talk about applies to adults, children and, you know, adolescents during transition. And but we know from the seminal work uh, of the Royal uh, College, Royal College of Physicians report on asthma deaths uh, led by Mark Levy that actually miss the sort of inappropriate use of treatments was actually linked to asthma deaths within that report. 
And overuse of relievers was a key feature, with 39% prescribed more than 12 SABA. Coupled with the underuse of preventers, 80% were prescribed less than 12 ICS per year. You know, so if you're taking it regularly, you should be having more than that. And 38% less than four ICS. So that's data presented for the year before death as the percentage of patients in whom prescribing information was available. So the management of asthma has traditionally been characterized by overuse of SABA relievers and underuse of preventers. Now, the other issue that's really relevant to this is GINA 2019, which basically recommended a complete sea change, a paradigm shift in the way in which asthma is managed. And that's recommending that we actually move pretty much away from SABA as a method of controlling asthma symptoms alone, and with much more emphasis on asthma as an inflammatory condition. So even for the relief of symptoms, patients need to get ICS. So these are key behavioural challenges around how we can optimise and get the best from asthma treatment. And if you look at Gina, it's basically saying, use less SABA, use more ICS. So we know that this is going to be really problematic. We know that many people struggle to actually follow uh, this recommendation. And solving um, non-adherence, which is, you know, it's a real issue in asthma, as I'm sure you all recognise, but it's also an issue across long-term conditions, where WHO estimates that about half of medicines prescribed for long-term conditions are not taken as advised. So, you know, that's pretty inefficient. It's like having a car that starts 50% of the time, half the time. I should know, I used to have one. So how do we solve that? It's like a fault line in medicine and it applies in asthma as well. Well, there are two key big challenges that make this difficult. The first one is that there's no such thing as the non-adherent patient. Adherence rates vary not just between individuals, but within the same person over time and across treatment. And in fact, I think we need to see non-adherence as the norm rather than the exception. Most of us are non-adherent some of the time. So we need to understand this not in terms of some characteristic that defines a deviant patient, but rather that it's a human condition. It happens to all of us and we need to understand it in terms of the interaction between a particular individual and a particular condition and treatment because they might be highly adherent to one treatment for their asthma and low, you know, have low adherence to another. Next slide, please. The second big challenge is that there's an information action gap in healthcare. So simply providing clear instructions about what to do and telling the patient what we recommend doesn't result in action. So what's in between? information and action. Well, this is where we need to apply behavioural science to understand why non-adherence occurs in the first place, to step inside the patient's shoes and see it from their perspective, and then that will help us to develop more effective solutions to the problem. So there was a recent um, systematic review which looked at the correlates of non-adherence and found that there were over 850 in the literature. So it's a really complex problem, 850 kind of reasons demonstrated in research. Now, what are we going to do with that? Well, that's very difficult, but actually when you look more closely at it and step back, those 850 factors boil down to two key issues. There are really two reasons why we don't take treatment that's recommended. We can't or we don't want to. Now, that sounds entirely obvious, doesn't it? You know, but actually failure to apply that is why we've still got such high rates of non-adherence and why asthma through non-adherence continues to impact on people's lives and in some cases endangering their lives. So if we could just apply this better, I think we would improve asthma outcomes. Let's unpack that can't, don't want to. If we look at the right hand side, um, a lot of the non-adherence is intentional, unintentional, unintentional. 
The patient wants to follow it, but they can't because of barriers that are beyond their control. They might not have understood. They might not be able to use the inhaler or build a routine. They may not be able to afford co-payments. Um, lots of reasons that reduce the person's ability to take the treatment. And these are the practicalities of adherence. And we need to pay attention to them and support people to be able to do what we're recommending. But even when we do that, we still get high levels of non-adherence. And that's because even within the same individual, many of the reasons for non-adherence are related not to can't, but to don't want to. We could look at these as kind of intentional processes, <clears throat> which affect our motivation to start and continue with the treatment. And to understand that, we need to look in a different place and understand the beliefs, emotions, and background biases that lead us to the conclusion of whether it's a good idea or not for us to take that treatment. Now, the circles overlap because they're not separate. If we're more motivated, it makes us more able to overcome practical barriers. Likely, if something, also, if something is easy, it may make us more motivated to give it a try. And these occur in the same individual. Now, how are we going to deal with this? Let's, the one that seems most difficult is the beliefs. You know, are we suggesting that we invite each patient to lie on the psychologist couch and tell, tell us about their childhood? Well, no, it's not that kind of belief. What we're talking about here is the common sense way in which people understand, think about and experience conditions like asthma and how they think about treatment. And a lot of research that my colleagues and I have done over the years is focused in this blue circle to try and understand better how people actually think about and deal with illness and treatment. So if we look more closely in the blue circle, this is my interest was stimulated by a background. I started life as a clinical pharmacist um, in the 80s and 90s and started doing ward drums at the Royal London in the 80s and they're on respiratory wards and I can remember a case where Neil Barnes who was the consultant at the time said look Rob we've got this um, young girl she was 17 she'd been admitted to intensive care with life-threatening respiratory depression and the doctors suspected that she wasn't taking her regular steroid inhaler which had been prescribed I think three or four times a day you know the highest dose they said look if you don't manages the pharmacist to talk some sense into her, then we're going to have to send her to a psychiatrist. So this was before I started studying behaviour, did a PhD in psychology, etc. And I went to talk to her and I just said, look, um, the doctors think you're not taking your brown inhaler. Is that true? Next slide. And what she said to me made a lasting impact and was one of a number of patient cases that prompted me to go into this field of behavioral science. So she said this, she said, look, whenever, she said, yeah, you're right, I don't take it, would you? And I said, well, yeah, probably, but tell me more. She said, well, whenever I'm in hospital, they inject me full of steroids. I put on weight, my face swells up, and it takes me ages to get rid of it. So there's no way I'm taking steroids once I'm out, because I found out that there's a steroid in that brown inhaler. Since then, I've done a lot of research in this topic and what we can conclude from it is what really came across there was that when there was nothing crazy about what she was thinking and doing from her point of view, it made complete sense. It was entirely logical. But the problem is the one thing she hadn't been told, no one had bothered to ask her. The one thing she hadn't been told was the amount of steroid in the inhaler is thousands of times less than she was having when she got in. And just a short explanation of that seemed to change her mind. And in fact, now there's lots of research in this field looking at patients' beliefs about asthma and asthma treatments and other conditions. And these issues are still relevant now. And there are two key beliefs from this work that stand out. The first one is necessity beliefs. 
That's not the same as believing the treatment's effective or will be beneficial. It's rather the answer to two questions that we all ask ourselves when we're faced with a, a medication. How much do I really need to do this to achieve something that's important to me? And the second question is, can I get away without doing it? The reason we ask the second one is we're all creatures of habit and we'd rather take the easy path. Most of us would rather not have to take a regular treatment, but also because we often have concerns about the harmful effects of treatment and sometimes concerns about the meaning of that treatment. If I'm on a regular treatment, it's a threat to sense of self. We have to ask ourselves, do patients with asthma like the idea of having asthma? Does it make them feel more attractive to people they want to be attractive to? No. And if you sign up to the daily treatment, you're kind of signing up to the condition. So many patients just want to avoid asthma and put it into the background. And a good mechanism for doing that from their perspective is to not engage with the daily treatment. So we need to understand these two key beliefs to really get a grip on adherence. Does the person really believe they need it? And what are their concerns? And incidentally, they can have two ideas. I like and trust and the clinician and believe what they're saying, but I'm not sure I like and trust the treatment. And it's often hidden because they don't want to admit to concerns or doubts about the treatment because they think that will be interpreted by the clinician as a doubt in them. And we don't need to look at this in detail, but these are just some of the concerns that patients report about inhaled corticosteroids. By far the most common are long-term effects, worried about being too dependent on the treatment, just general dislike of treatment. It'll be less effective when I really need it, if I take it every day, etc. These common beliefs are now really well known, but we often don't take account of them when we explain and discuss treatments with patients. And doing so would help reduce the concerns that lead often to non-adherence. And of course, we see this in adolescents and children. This is a qualitative study uh, done um, by um, Christine Pierce, Louise Fleming, colleagues. And here are two examples of things patients in the study said about their inhaled corticosteroids, which reinforce the points I'm saying. So the other issue that we have in contrast to this is reluctance, skepticism, concern about steroids that in some quarters has almost been labelled as steroid phobia. On the other hand, people often perceive their SABA much more positively. So this is in an internet sample of over 400 adults with asthma, perceptions of SABA inhaler. And what you see in the blue here is the percentage of the sample who agreed or strongly agreed with each of the statements going down the left hand side. Using my reliever to treat symptoms is the best way to keep on top my asthma, over 70%. Benefits of using the reliever massively outweigh any risk, 60%. I don't worry about asthma when I have my reliever around, over 60. And I prefer to rely on my reliever than my preventer, over 60. So you can see that Trying to deliver the message of Gina, hey, stop using your SABA and use ICS instead, is going to be quite challenging. And these, so, but what we need to understand here, it's not just a matter of telling patients the alternative. We have to tell the story in a way which can overcome what I call common, se common sense defaults. These are common beliefs about asthma and its treatment which if you don't change them, will tend to make non-adherence the most sensible idea for that patient. And here are some examples. We've already talked about them. You know, my asthma comes and goes, don't see why I need a regular treatment. I can rely on my blue inhaler, that's enough. No symptoms, no problem. And concerned about steroids. I just want to reiterate that this doesn't mean that patients are at odds with their clinicians. Often they'll be very accepting, very, uh, you know, of the clinician who's giving them the message, but not quite trust them that the message applies to them. And therefore, one of the first things that we need to do when we tackle non-adherence is to make it okay to have a no-blame approach. 
to recognise that it's all of us who do this and to enable patients to have an open and honest discussion about it. Um, I think there's another build in next slide, please. So, you know, and the reason we need to do that is that most of this is under the surface. You know, it's like an iceberg. We need to bring it to the surface so we can deal with it. And when we're dealing with non adherence, there are three things that we need to consider. I often people ask me, you know, would it be, do we need an extra nurse in the clinic? Do we need a digital solution? Well, in a way, it's the wrong question because that's the channel. It's a delivery vehicle for the intervention. We also need to think about what we're saying and doing to support patients and also what's the context? What other things they're receiving? Are there cultural or health system factors which may mean that something that works in one uh, context may not be as effective in another? So there are three C's that we need to optimize. The core of the content is belief change. We really have to tackle this problem that we have around necessity and concerns. Currently, patients have high perceived need for SABA, low concerns about SABA. Forgive me, that's my dog Frankie in the background. Low perceived necessity for steroids, SABA works fine and I don't have symptoms all the time and high concerns. Where we need to get to, in our communication of asthma is lower necessity for SABA, higher concerns, overusing SABA could be bad for me, higher necessity for ICS, even for symptom control, and lower concerns about low dose ICS, as opposed to high dose OCS, which people should be concerned about. And we have now a range of tools to help us to do this. Um, my colleagues and I have developed uh, an asthma balance model, which is a new way of communicating asthma, which addresses many of the beliefs that patients have about asthma. It's medically accurate, but it changes the way in which we describe asthma and it's acceptable to patients. And we've shown in early studies that it changes necessity, beliefs and concerns for the treatments in the way that I've just identified. There's no time to go into this in detail. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. And so in conclusion, applying GINA is a behavioural challenge at the core of asthma care. We can do it, but it requires a no blame approach that recognises patients' beliefs about SABA and ICS and attachment to SABA. We need to develop persuasive messages that communicate asthma as an inflammatory condition and the need for anti-inflammatory treatments, not traditional symptom relief. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Rob. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, really important for us to think about those beliefs. Um, and also, I'm hoping we'll get a little bit of time to discuss further um, in the panel the, um, you know, the the intermittent reliever and ICS therapy uh, as well. So uh, absolutely brilliant, everyone. Thank you so much for all of your contributions. Now, Louise, I'm aware that you're you need to leave us soon, so I want to come to you first, if that's okay. There's lots of questions about transition, um, and also there's lots of um, comments as well in the chat, and I, I think you've probably picked up on some of those already, so that's fantastic. But there is a particular question which I think is really interesting. So if we, uh, you know, you 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 talked about ages of transition, and you know that sort of ages to start and what's more traditional, etc. But if we relate transition specifically to asthma um, and in terms of asthma treatment, um, children aged 12 and above are considered adults in the BTS sign guidelines for treatment purposes, but also the asthma control test, the, the, the children's version goes up to 11 years of age and then the adult version is from 12 years of age. So, you know, what's your thoughts on the starting of the transition period at this age or do you feel it should be a little bit older? Yeah, so I would say um, that kind of move to from primary school into high school is, is the ideal age to start having the conversation. So it is around that 12 age. Um, so it is just introducing the concept at some point they've got a condition that will need to be looked after in the adult service. So starting to then talk about actually transferring that knowledge from the parents to them, getting them involved in their care, understanding their health history and the backgrounds, all the treatments that they've had, any any side effects and then 
kind of unpicking that and, and building that up over time so that when you get to the transfer point, then they are ready to take on that responsibility and be able to talk in clinic on their own, um, along with the parents. It's not about excluding parents completely. It's about just move, shifting that level of responsibility across that young person. I would say the start point varies with wherever your transfer point is. So all the services transfer at different ages. So it could be 16, 17, 18 or 19 with more services. If you're transferring at 16, I would say it's definitely start at 12. For the services that are going at 18, you can kind of get away with the 13, 14 starting. You just need to have an adequate amount of time to be able to kind of do all that preparation, empowering and teaching and training in, uh, in that time period. It does take a few years. You can't really do it in one year. So sometimes people will say, oh, we want to start transition at like 15, but we're moving at 16. And I would say that's just now an impossible. It's more an organised transfer rather than a, an, a proper transition process. So it kind of depends where your transfer point is, I would say, as to where you want to start and how frequently you're seeing the patients. If you're seeing them every three months, then you can, you've got an opportunity every three months to kind of build on that information. If you're only seeing them annually, you have to think about how you're going to set your program up to be able to give that uh, kind of information on an annual basis. Yeah. Absolutely. That's some really um, valuable insights there. I really appreciate that. Um, we, we've got a question and I'll come back to it in, in a moment with you, Katie, but it's an interesting point that, you know, we're talking about uh, transition and transfer um, in within services, within secondary or tertiary care, but of course the vast majority of children and young people with asthma are managed in primary care. So I want, I do want to come back to that in a minute, but before you need to leave us, Louise, could I just ask, do you have a key piece of advice to make sure that children, that young people don't slip through the net as they transition to adult services? Yeah, I would say, um, kind of make sure that we've got good relationships between children's and adult services where possible. So we need to have that monitoring of what's happening with that patient and that's like handover and a way of knowing that they're definitely turning up. So what we used to do in Leeds was have a register of patients. It is ideal if you've got kind of the children's and adult service under kind of one umbrella so you can then just share that information across. So once they've moved from the children's register they went onto the adult register. So people had eyes on actually making sure that they hadn't slipped through the gap. Um, but it's looking at actually how you can have that kind of security knowing that people have not fallen through the gap and I think the one piece of advice with transition is communication. I think that's where it all goes wrong is that we don't communicate well as professionals and we definitely don't communicate well with young people and we need to be talking to young people and checking their knowledge like Robert was saying you know what is their understanding um, so I think communication if I had to put it into one word would be the one. Yeah. And that's that's fantastic. And thank you so much for that. And I, I would echo, echo that really strongly. And it's not, you know, it's it's obviously it is with our um, children, young people and their families and and within our own teams, but between teams as well is extremely challenging between, you know, children and young people services and, um, and adult services. So, yeah, thank you for that, Louise. Thank you very much. Um, Katie, can I come to you on that point, really? Um, you've talked a lot about policy um, and you've you've shown a lot of policy, but what about primary care? Is that reflected in your policy? Um, you know, as I said, my experience um, is that the vast majority of children and young people's asthma is managed in primary care. But even in secondary care, when children are getting to that sort of transition type age or even getting close to transfer age, very often that's the point at which paediatricians will decide, OK, we're going to discharge these children to um, primary care now because, you know, for whatever reason, they don't meet the thresholds or they don't need to go on to adult services. So, you know, is policy picking up on that and, and what can we be doing about that? Yeah, I think um, what Louise was talking about was is it will help with that anyway. So if you're having those conversations with the young person, if they're informed about what they should be expecting for transition, they understand um, what the expectations of their care should be, even if that is slightly different. And it's about having those joint conversations. So involving primary care in conversations with secondary care is vital. And I think the, you know, the the sort of the hard levers and enablers that I talked about are going to be the things that, that get things done. This or the the the, the 
the, the nice to have. So the, the communication that the, all those soft measures that Louise talking about is, is absolutely what we should be doing. But also now, you know, um, services are going to be inspected upon and they're going to be and they're also going to be paid to do it. And those we know those are the things that get that, that implement real change on, on top of all those nice to haves. And I think what we what we are doing as well, as like I say, is, is there is this training that we're going to provide that's going to be free to free to access. And again, we would encourage primary care um, practitioners to take that up as well. So then they feel better equipped. So it, it should be about support as well as as well as stick, really, in terms of what we what we provide as a, from, a, from a policy perspective. But um, we want we want um, clinicians to feel that they are, you know, have the skills and they're equipped to be able to have those conversations and to meet the needs of the, the young person transitioning um, and then um, and only then can we say, you know, at this point we should be monitoring how many people are trained in transition and we're hoping to get that onto sort of the, the dashboard, the CYP dashboard that we've got at a national level as well. So we can see, you know, where there's some, some gaps potentially in the country around um, people getting appropriate training. Yeah. But we've had some fantastic uptake of training already, actually, which is really, really exciting to see. Um, uh, around some of the other, particularly around the asthma, and there are some um, elements of transition in the asthma uh, in the asthma training modules that you've done, Viv. So we know that um, those are those are being um, those are being taken up as well. So I think once we've got the transition training on top of that as well, that will be really supportive for for clinicians beyond just asthma. Yeah. I was really interested. Thank you, Katie. I was really interested in the CQC brief guide to inspecting adult services on transition. Obviously, that's again secondary care or tertiary care focused. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, well, CQC do inspect GPs and primary care as well. Yeah, and I don't know. Do you know? And I don't know the answer to this. Do you know the answer? Is there anything in there on uh, young people's services um, within the CQC inspection? Um, you know, and and also how much awareness is there um, about things like the Your Welcome criteria to make um, primary care services friendly for children and young people? And I think you know they're hugely important levers that perhaps we don't shout enough about. But your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, so um, we haven't developed it yet, <laughs> the CQC brief guide. <laughs> so what we were doing is we were, they wanted to wait until all of our documents were finished. So we needed to wait until both the framework and the capabilities were published. And then we're going to co-develop a brief guide with them. And that will be something that we will, again, sort of put out for consultation as well to make sure that people feel we've included all the things that is, are relevant for young people, but also realistic to achieve in an environment where, you know, pressures and, and particularly around primary care are um, really, really difficult. And I think we are um, we're quite quick, I think, to 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 blame primary care, which I don't think is fair because they have such a massive um, scope compared to, you know, the more specialist conditions where perhaps if they're able to focus on transition with a bit more of a, a narrower lens. But I think um, yeah, well, we want we want to be able to support primary care. We want to be able to provide them with some training. We want to be able to feel that they 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 can they can be they can be equipped. Um, but once we've yeah once we've got the documents ready, we're going to work with CQC to develop that, and and hopefully we'll, we definitely will engage all those key stakeholders from across the state uh, healthcare system, obviously as well as children, young people, and their families. Yeah. Thank you, um, Casey, and I'm sure we'll all look forward to hearing more about that in the future. I was really pleased to hear about the 0 to 25 model, um, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I have a 22 year old with asthma, so I resonate with what Louise was saying. I resonate with everything that Rob was saying, um, <laughs> you know, about necessity and beliefs. Um, and, you know, it's really, really challenging. Um, so I, I, I think that model is really important. Actually, this morning I um, was talking um, it, with an adult respiratory physician in, in my area about trying to get children and young people's asthma on the agenda for the respiratory uh, leadership and learning network in my area. And um, they didn't see it as something as a, an, an ongoing necessity and maybe a one off slot. So that's definitely an ongoing piece of work there. And actually some of the, the, the messages from the presentation today might be really helpful in that argument. The fact that, you know, what we really need to be thinking about is the, um, the not just the physical, but also the psychosocial and emotional development of our young adults up, right up to 25 years of age. Um, and also some of the evidence that we've seen today about poor outcomes for um, our not just adolescents, but young adults compared to other countries um, in the world. So 
really brilliant stuff. Um, Rob, can I come to you? <laughs> Firstly, I just want to, um, but before I get into some of some of the the questions that I'd really like to ask, um, I want to ask you a question from a, a sort of a, a, a personal background in some of the work that we've done within this network over the last sort of two years. And I don't know if you've heard about the Wright and Haler image campaign, um, but I'm quite sure you're familiar with seeing appalling images um, representing people using inhalers in the media um, and, and we kicked off a campaign uh, uh, some of the people that will be on the call today a couple of years ago called the right inhaler image campaign because um, you know we wanted to challenge this and try and make some changes to this but you know do you believe that um, me poor media images influence the public perceptions um, about asthma. So we always see blue inhalers, for example, being used. Do you believe that that's in influencing our public and is it detrimental? Um, I, I, I believe I don't have scientific evidence to support this, but my hunch is, yeah, it does have an influence because we're influenced by all sorts of things in our environment and it reinforces. But the reason it has the influence is the fundamental concept that we hold as our common sense idea of asthma and asthma treatment is flawed, right? So the reason that has an effect is that it reinforces a set of ideas about asthma, which for many patients has been also their whole experience of asthma. Their first encounter with asthma was the fear and the distress of being breathless. Then the thing that rescued them from that was a blue inhaler. Right. So, you know, it comes on top of an already experiential experience, uh, sorry, experiential positivity about that inhaler. So just changing the images in the media alone, the bad news is just doing that isn't going to fix it, but doing it is worthwhile because it's part of the environment that is reinforcing a bad set of ideas. I think the you know, what I'd like to see as a as the, uh, uh, alongside that is also the sort of things I mentioned in the talk, but didn't go into in detail, is around about transforming the way in which we speak about asthma and asthma treatment. I've, I've sometimes called it rebranding asthma. And this balance model thing does that by, by you know, in various ways, uh, which if there's time I'll talk about. But, but yeah, so I, I do think that whole focus on imagery and the media is very worth doing but it needs more than that as well yes i absolutely agree it's part of that whole package isn't it i'm really hoping somebody can pop a link to the right inhaler image campaign in in the q a for everybody if in case anybody um in the audience today isn't aware about it because there's some really useful resources in there but yeah um Rob, one of the things I was interested in, you talk about the the, the gap between um, information and action and, you know, um, you know, we, I work a lot with um, on the Impart programme with Hilary Pinnock and, and we do, you know, a lot of this work about uh, supporting self-management with patients. And there's so many different perceptions amongst healthcare professionals around what supporting self-management is. You know, is it just education? Is it an asthma action plan? But really, for me, it's that bit that sits within that gap there. And I'm just wondering if you've got any tips and can you share any ideas around that practically that we can be doing? Um, um, when you know we're all very busy and we've got short appointment times etc yeah so i think that some of this needs to be a resource that is available to patients uh, outside the clinic that patients can be linked to rather like the work that hillary's doing the sort of work we've been doing in parallel around this very focused issue about how people think about the necessity and concerns of the two asthma treatments could actually slot in that as a kind of additional product. Um, it's very difficult to do it in the, in the clinic alone, but the main components of the balance model are, it addresses like common reasons why patients think it's not, it, it's a good idea to avoid steroids and the ICS will do. So one of them is about asthma and many young people just wanna put asthma into the background they don't want a management plan. They just want to be able to forget about it. And 
as long as they can do that, you know, unless asthma is really intruding, hey, that's fine. They can just put it into the background. Maybe they wake up a bit earlier a few times, uh, at, you know, at night a few times a week. Doesn't really bother them that much. So we describe asthma as a tendency. People with asthma, you think of illness as a weakness. They, they reject the idea of chronic illness. I'm strong, I'm young. So we talk about it as the lungs overreacting. They react too strongly to stimulation. And that brings the, the bad news is that brings the body out of balance. You need to correct, you can't notice it, but it can do damage long term. To correct that balance, we use nature's way, which is medical steroids, which mimic the body. So it goes on in that way. It gets into a bit more detail, but it sort of builds on common beliefs. Um, about medicines and about asthma and corrects misconceptions and sort of rebrands asthma not as a chronic disease but rather you react too strongly you need to bring it back into balance mm -hmm. that sounds really interesting i would look forward to hearing more about the um, asthma balance model it sounds like it could be something practical that we can use to support therapeutic conversations with our children and young people so and their parents of course fantastic thank you um, I'm going to finish up on a final question. Um, it's about apps. Give you both the heads up, get your thinking caps on about apps. We're talking about young people. We're talking about adolescents, teenagers. Everybody thinks digital is the way forward and they want an app. Everybody wants an app. Do you believe that's true? And also, are there any apps that you would like to recommend or talk about being explored at the moment and I'm going to come to you first Katie if I may. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't yeah I, I probably uh, like uh, like Rob really I wouldn't claim to have any scientific evidence on the use of apps so I don't think it would be fair to comment on that and um, I'm going to be very uh, apolitical and say we can only recommend apps that are listed on the NHS digital library and um, there is a there is two on there one's free and one isn't so um, Guess which one we recommend more <laughs> um so yeah there is a fantastic one on there called um digital health passport and um, so do go on there and have a look and i know that is being further and further developed to um i think there's sort of various pilots going on around the country that um they've they've received a, a quite a lot of grant funding to extend the scope of those and there's varying levels at which you can um get the app and there's a certain a certain sort of level that is three free and then as you sort of build onto it and um, PCNs or practices can pay for um, like a more interact interactive version of the app where um, patients can sort of input their symptoms and that go comes back to the um, clinician and they can have that kind of two-way conversation on the app so um, and that's also linked to a lot of um, fantastic advice that's um, been created by uh, the B asthma team so there's some videos on there there's some there's a digital uh, personalised asthma action plan and um, so if you haven't checked that out already that's definitely worth doing. That's brilliant thank you so much. So Rob I'm coming to you last really for the final word Um, you said that young people just want to forget about the fact that they've got asthma they want to put it in the background so where do you sit with apps then? <laughs> well I think first thing I'd like to say about apps is we have to be careful of the app trap because an app is only a channel for delivering good stuff. The type of, and we often, you know, sort of come to the conclusion, oh, they're young, they love, you know, their phones, they love a health app. But what they, the apps that my young, uh, well, they're, they're young people and teens now, my kids like is social media apps. They don't want to do disease management apps. Yeah. You know, they want to like link with their friends and all that. But I do think that apps have a, place if they contain really good content right and the way we need to start thinking about apps i think is as ways in which they can augment what goes on in the clinic yeah. rather than replace them so one of the things that um we're working on is a sort of app that can triage right patients by taking account of what their concerns belief doubts are about okay. their treatment and then addressing them tailoring messages in the app but not that it kind of that's it but rather yeah. that, that can be a triage so that if it doesn't solve the low-hanging fruit questions they can then speak to a healthcare practitioner but also that it can prepare them 
for consultation. So I think that's where some nice innovation could happen in future is around the use of the app as an adjuvant tool, right? Yes. But I'm always wary of the app trap. Yes, the app trap. I think we will close on that very point. Thank you so much. You've both been brilliant and Louise as well in this session. I think it's been a really uh, fantastic session. Thank you both guys. Um, we're actually um, for the Thank audience you. now we're going into a break um, which will last until um, 3.15 and um, during the break we will be showing a film called Preventable which is made by young people for young people to help support those with asthma. So thank you everybody, I'll see you all again in 10 minutes time. Nathan, are you up yet? Nathan? Nathan, are you awake? Mom! It's okay. Okay, Nathan, read this in for me. Come on. Come on. Can you breathe for me? Oh, come on, Nathan. I don't think this works. My mobile's on my desk. Can you ring 999? I can do. South Central Ambulance Service. Is the patient breathing? No, he's struggling to breathe. What's the address? It's uh, 64 Little Avenue, I think. Yes, yes. Greensfield Academy, the school. Okay, and what's happened to the patient? Well, he's in my class, year 11, and he's struggling to breathe. I think it's an asthma attack. I don't know if he's got asthma. I need you to stay on the line with me. An ambulance is coming as fast as it possibly can. Okay, they're coming. I'm 
Have you had this before? Do you do you know he's had this before? Um, no. Not as far as I know. His friends think that he may have asthma, but okay. I really don't know. Cool. Thank you. Five grams. Just going to check the chair. Oh. I'll wait for the pie. Is that staying now? It's very low. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We'll get ready to go to yeah. the soon. Right. What is it? It's improving with her? Yeah, it's Cool. Shall we go with Apple Shop Gym too? Yeah. Yeah, let's go for it. essentially means that his lungs are not stable and not able to work for themselves. As such, we're having to support him in the ICU. Um, over the next few hours, we'll see how he goes and obviously keep you updated. But would you like to go see him now? Yes, please. I think Nathan's having an asthma attack. Oh, Nathan, you are in my asthma register. Don't panic. Grace, do you know where it's inhaled? It's in here. Okay, don't worry, Nathan. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Thank you. Right, you just stay nice and quiet and calm, the rest of you. Thank you. All right, Nathan. Okay, I'm going to give you one puff every 30 seconds. Here we go. Okay, let's see if this one. Right. Can you hold him up? Hold him up. Okay, you should be feeling better after 10 days. You're feeling any better. Okay, okay you're still poorly. All right, uh, Aaron and Grace, can you hold him? If he's sitting up and back, I'm going to call 999. And can you check the time? Yeah. Because if the ambulance aren't trim on him for 15 minutes, we'll see you Okay. I think we'll, it's, it's good that you're feeling better. All right, I think we'll still take you up to the hospital anyway to get checked over, just, just to be safe. All right, 
Yeah, I'm, it's all right. I feel so tense. Okay. Oh. Oxygen levels are still. Yeah. Really? Yeah, your oxygen oh, levels are still the same. So pleased to see you and looking so well. A bit of a near miss that was, but I, it looks like they followed all the things that we wanted them to do as far as your personalised asthma action plan was concerned, and it all went well. Yeah, it was scary, but, but okay. Yeah, it was, it was, it was calm as far as I can tell. Come on. Wow, what a thought-provoking film that is. I always think that every time I see it, how um, shocking it must be. Ooh, that, yeah, thank you. How shocking it must be and scary it must be for school staff in uh, to ever find themselves in that position. And so I'm sure that's going to be a really useful resource. And also don't forget that tier one training for your um, school staff as well um, is incredibly valuable. Right, welcome back everybody for the final session of this fantastic conference and um, it's really my pleasure to introduce to you now Tiffany Watson Kozel and um, who's going to talk to us about children and young people's asthma data dashboard and this is going to be really um, interesting. I know lots of people are asking questions about the data at dashboard. So um, Tiffany's um, going to explain everything to us, give us a presentation and then also uh, we've got good time for questions um, when Tiff finishes. So if you do do have questions don't forget to pop them in that Q&A box and hopefully we'll be able to get through them all. So Tiff over to you thanks ever so much for joining us today. If you could go to the next slide please. Now this is an overview of uh, our prospective dashboard and this is at national level and it's based on the SUS status so that's the secondary care user commissioning data set and it's also based on the primary diagnosis of asthma so it's not on the HRG it's not on somebody uh, on whether or not you were admitted with asthma and something else your primary reason for admission admis admission is asthma now what we've done here is it will open up with an overview with a pre-selection of under 16s this is our front page and gives you an overview nationally of all the regions, how that's split over the time period of 2016-17 right up to current date. And as you can see here, we want to be able to show the breakdown by region, ethnic category, that is a high level grouping that we have at the moment, and the IMD. And at the moment, what you're seeing there is the whole time period. Could we see the next slide, please? So this one here, we've selected the national overview, but now we're actually looking at the transition age group. And as you can see at the bottom corner, you can actually see that split by the two age groups that we have in transition. So the gray area are those who are likely to be in the early transition and quite probably still to be being looked after by paediatric services um, and obviously the 20 to 24 age group are more likely to be looked after by the adult services. Lovely. And now you can see here on the drop down, you can look quite detailed at different years so that you can actually see the month on month age group. This is showing again the under 16s. And if you want to go to the next slide, I'm giving you a quick dash through because I'm not doing a live demo here. So we might change slides quite quickly. OK, so now you can actually see the uh, different uh, deprivation levels split and you can see in the top corner on the donut how that actually over time and over each region uh, is represented. As you can see there, the uh, Northwest is showing 11%, uh, Midlands next, and then London in third place. Sorry, I'm saying London third place, Northeast and Yorkshire is in third place with London behind. This shows that there is a discrepancy between the populations that we think 
live in each area and uh, the actual uh, population of children. And also, as you can see here, this is the higher deprivation group. If we go to the next slide, that will show where we're actually looking at a region specific. Now, again, we're looking at, and we've cut this just by the under 16s. You have the ability to pick any of those age groups and or including the um, transition age group and as you can see it's a stacked graph and when you hover over that stacked graph at the top there that's over the time series you will actually see the numbers behind that so you can look at it and it will show you by month the activity and you can play that time series if it wasn't a flat um, presentation and you're actually looking at the live dashboard which is why it's got the little pause and play buttons at the top and what you can then also do is you can select different um, categories and also the IMD deciles so that you can look at your region in more detail you can actually go down to ICB level which we'll show you in a moment we're also going to add in which won't be in our next phase which we're looking to actually publish in um, the next few weeks uh, we want to add in a more granular level of the ethnic categories because we're very aware that any white background actually hides um, also and includes the uh, traveller population and quite a few uh, white ethnicities who would be in the um, immigration or the immigrant category such as um, the more recent uh, arrivals that we've had from uh, the Ukraine. Can we go to the next slide, please? This one here is showing any white background and all the uh, deprivations. As I've just mentioned now, as you can see, that's quite a large proportion. But as I've just mentioned, when we actually add in the more granular level, you'll actually be able to get a better idea of whether or not the deprivation is related to um, all the different uh, ethnic groups that we're actually hiding by that high level category. Could we go to the next slide, please? And here I've selected any Asian background. And as you can see there, we're starting to get into smaller numbers and we're getting quite big. You can see the dips when we were actually in lockdown um, in 2020 and 2021 and the recovery um, that uh, of patients start coming back into hospital again, whether they're socialising out uh, with school or with friends after lockdown finished. And then you can also see at the bottom there the deprivation percentage for that uh, ethnicity group. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, this here gives you an overall high level view by year for each region. And this doesn't give you any ethnic or deprivation opportunities, but it does give you an idea as to whether or not that region is improving over time or whether or not it's actually stagnating. Some of these areas, as you can see, bounce back straight away after 2021. Others actually looked as though they'd made quite a, a bit of improvement in the care in the, of their asthma patients. So if we now go to the next slide, please. Now, this one here is actually showing this by registered population. Now, this is for the age, the full age group, um, and you can select whether or not you want to look at the under 16s, the transition group, or the, the whole under 25s. We are looking to actually include the asthma patient population and that's something that we will be working for for our future releases and of course all of these things are subject to the data being validated so that will be a future ask uh, that we will be able to provide if you could go to the next slide please 
Now this one, as I say here, you'll be able to see how this breaks down and we've had to hide the figures because this is still in test, um, but at the point, and this was for the whole of the time period and it was for the under 16s from 2016-17 to date, and this was extracted in August. So there's quite a lot of patients were non-electively admitted, admitting this is not patient count at the moment, this is actually admissions. And you can then see by region, then you can pick a region and drill down to the ICE, well, it was ICSs, we've now moved over to ST, um, was STPs, we've now moved over to ICSs, and then we have the provider name. Now this is not on commissioning basis, this is actually on um, where the activity took place. And then when we go to PCN, of course, that's where the patient is registered. So you can actually look at the university hospital and see where all those patients came from. Uh, in future, we do want to go to the registered asthma population so that we can see the proportion of patients who will, who are being admitted. And we also want to be able to add in the number of admissions per patient. So the patient admission ratio, that's a future goal for one of our future versions. And if you'd like to go to the next slide, please. And this here is where we actually are able to look at a region. We've selected the Midlands region, the under 16s and for one year. And you can see where the focus and the higher level of admissions are. And as expected, they're in a more non-rural area. So the more in the inner city area where you've got higher proportions. We are aiming to actually be able to again add in the patient population local um, to GPs so that we can actually look at how relevant this is to the actual population rather than just in actual numbers. And that's something that we're working on at the moment and should be available for our release in two weeks time. And uh, the um, Birmingham and Solihull, could we just go back again? Sorry, thank you. The Birmingham and Solihull ICB has shown the highest asthma admissions for the whole of the Midlands region. However, there has been a 22% reduction since 2016. So when you go through the years, you can actually pick the different financial years and see how that changes over time, if that's your area that you want to focus on and have a, a look at. If we could go to the next slide, please. OK, so now we're looking at the, this is where we start being able to actually look at the uh, detail for the different age groups, the ethnicity and IMD combined. So you can see over the time period we're looking at for England here. So you can say, see each year and we've moved the blank IMDs to the front so that they sit next to the most deprived because the understanding is that we don't have the IMD, that the patient isn't registered and they're more likely to be at a of a lower IMD or higher deprivation. And it's quite interesting to see that over time that there hasn't been a great deal of movement uh, when you look at the table underneath there. And we've included all of the information there for all ethnicities. The next slide we're going to go to, if you could move that slide on for me, please. Now, this one is showing any white background for under 16s. And again, there is an understanding that this is actually hiding quite a uh, mixed group of patients in the higher deprivation groups. As you can see here, there's still quite a high 15 um, to 16 percent. And when you add those figures up, it makes up quite a high proportion of the activity. If we could move to the next slide, please. And this one is showing the under 16s 
um, of the Black, Asian and ma minority ethnic group. And this is where it becomes quite stark. And you actually see that, yes, in 2021, the figures dropped. And please bear in mind that the 2022-23 figures are only year to date. And that was less than six months worth of data when it, this was uh, produced. But you can see quite a stark difference in the percentage of patients in those first three um, IMD deciles. And then, of course, you've still got 5% in the unallocated uh, deciles there as well. Now, if we can go to the next slide, this gives you uh, an overview of what we have planned. So this was just our non-elective secondary care. We've started with the available data. And the aim is to slowly but surely bring in other information. We know that people have been using already our very um, simple spreadsheet. And the aim was to be able to give you the deprivation and uh, ethnicity so that you could actually support reducing healthcare inequalities in your areas as soon as possible. So we focused on that and our next phase is to look at the prescribing by region, ICS and PCN rates for the preventers, relievers and oral corticosteroids and also to be give you a ratio of patient um, and the high risk ratio in your area. And then we also want to again be able to add the ethnic population level. Um, that will come in in the phase two and if we're if it's possible but we're doing a proof of concept at the moment we'd also like to be able to add the number of asthmatics in there as well i haven't added that in because at the time we weren't sure if it was going to go and phase three and this will come in around next christmas we have a wider cyp um, dashboard and that's going to come in and bring in the emergency care centre admissions for asthmatics. And again, we'd want to add in the ratio so that you know how many patients are actually accounting for those admissions, not just the account of patient uh, attendances at ED, their reattendance rates. And then the next element will be asthma calls to 111, a breakdown of their outcomes, whether it was to CGP, referral um, to ED, ambulance called, and whether or not it was just a repeat prescription being provided. And if we also in the future would like, but these things are in our aspirational list to be able to include personalised asthma action plans, pheno testing and spirometry. All of these things, as you're all aware, are part of the COF. Um, and when we get access to this level of data, we'll be working to bring these into the dashboards as well. And I know that these things are actually a lot of them available locally. If we could just go to the last slide. And just these are things for a couple of questions, Tiff. So is this your last slide? This is my very last slide. Wonderful. We'll have two so, minutes for questions then. It's been a bit of a death by slides. If I was doing a power, if I was doing a yes. live demo, I could just zip through them. I know. So um, we also want to bring in air pollution data and we're working with the uh, Imperial College to look at something that will allow you to see whether or not you are seeing patients in a higher air pollution area, which of course will then um, support messaging. Uh, we'll also working to bring online a new version of the difficult to treat and severe asthma registry. Of course, that data when it flows will take time to come through. And as I've already mentioned, the GP system data. So we can now go to questions. Sorry if I overran slightly. Yeah, thank you ever so much, Tiff. Um, there are some questions for you in the chat. I'd be in the question and answer box. I'd be really grateful if you'd pop in and answer them in there once once we finish, just because we're a tad short on time. I think really, though, what people are asking and if you could, you know, we've literally only got two minutes for this now, but um, how do you see clinicians using the information in practice? Could you just give us a couple of examples? Uh, 
Well, for me, it's about understanding their population. This is not to replace a local system at patient level, but it's to give them an idea as to whether their population is actually at higher risk than another area. Perhaps another area is able, um, has less of their asthma patients being admitted, but has similar air pollution, geography um, and deprivation. So perhaps then they can go and speak to their local peer group, find out what they're doing. Is there something that they can actually adopt locally? Is it messaging and sharing good practice? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I know in my own work how important data is and how important this real, you know, it's it's about profiling our populations and understanding our population. Am I right in thinking there's no, at this stage, no aspiration to be able to get down to patient level with this particular dashboard? No, um, as a national dashboard, it's there to actually provide that benchmarking and comparison to your national um, peers and see how different regions are comparing. So it's more of a higher level, but that doesn't mean to say it can't be used more locally yeah. for people to get that feel for their population. And we also want to add in information that allows you to compare how similar uh, and alike your population is to another and to see whether or not the treatments and support that they're receiving is equal and is there something that you could do and adopt that they're doing and do things uh, you know to improve outcomes for patients that's brilliant thank you so much a huge piece of work huge undertaking very challenging i'm quite sure um but as i say there are just a couple of specific questions in the chat i'd be really grateful if you'd go and answer them in there thank I you will. so much but thank you excellent. very much okay lovely thank you thank you and um, thank you tiff Okay, so we're actually going to um, move on now to our final presentation of the day. And this is a pre-recorded presentation. Um, and I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Satish Rao, who's a consultant paediatrician um, and the deputy chief medical um, officer in my area. I know Satish very well. He's absolutely brilliant, brilliant leader in our area um, at Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital. And he's going to talk about a national bundle, putting it in to action and a clinical update. Now Satish can't be with us today but um, his uh, colleague Prasad Nagakumar, another brilliant paediatrician from Birmingham Children's Hospital, is with us today to um, answer questions at the end. So I'm really looking forward to this and I will leave it to the team to um, play the recording now. Thank you. Good evening everyone and welcome to this session uh, I would uh, like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you all um, about clinical update on aspects of asthma. That is what the first half of my talk will concentrate on. And the second half, we will look at um, putting National Asthma Bundle into action. So for those of um, you who don't know me, I'm a consultant respiratory pediatrician based at Birmingham uh, Women's and Children's Hospital, and I'm also the medical director for innovation and transformation uh, for both uh, Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital as well as for Birmingham and Solihull Integrated Care System. Um, I would like to start my talk with um, a big list of acknowledgements. This is um, an absolute team effort um, from um, various parts of the healthcare uh, as well as from the non-health sectors. We have uh, the schools, the early health from Birmingham Children's Trust, that's part of Birmingham City Council, uh, George Collar Asthma Charity, uh, and then we have colleagues from acute trusts from primary care, uh, as well as from the integrated care system. In this talk, in the first um, few minutes or so, I would like to concentrate on what's new in the area of preschool VS. Um, then a bit about asthma diagnosis um, and touching on asthma treatment um, and severe asthma. And then the last 15 minutes or so, looking at uh, implementing the asthma uh, bundle. Preschool V's, we've all come across those uh, toddlers and preschool children with VZ episodes. 
they constitute quite a big pro proportion of the primary care consultations uh, as well as secondary care consultations. They make up quite a big proportion of acute presentations, both at primary care as well as in the secondary care. Now, preschool, uh, we um, about 60% of the children become symptom free uh, by the time they start school. This had led us to uh, think that uh, the preschool visa is a fairly benign condition. However, there are a number of longitudinal studies from past as well as present, uh, which are essentially demonstrating that this isn't the case. The longitudinal studies show that reduced lung function in preschool years continues into adulthood. And when you look at it from the adult perspective, if you look at group of adults in their early adulthood with poor respiratory outcomes and increased mortality, quite a significant proportion of them have had low FEV1, that is forced expiratory volume in first second in childhood. So it looks like the airway remodeling starts fairly early. And therefore, although the symptoms settle down, it may have resulted in long term sequelae. And therefore, preschool V's is an extremely important condition. It probably is more important than school V's, uh, to be honest. There are various difficulties with managing preschool V's. Number one, there is enough evidence to say that the care that these group, this group of patients receive, the follow up, um, is not as good uh, even when compared to children with, uh, with asthma in the school age. So the National Asthma Group is working on this particular aspect, and there are uh, there is a proposal which probably will come fairly soon of labeling preschool V's as preschool asthma so that that enables us to capture these group of individuals and make sure that they receive the right treatment. In the meantime, though, preschool V is, is, is a heterogeneous condition. So whilst there will be a group of children with asthma in this, in this uh, uh, group, there will also be children with various other pathologies other than a viral induced V or a preschool V. The first and foremost question that I often ask when I see a toddler or a, or a child a uh, three or four year old child with this problem, especially if I'm seeing them in clinic, is to in fact verify that what parents mean by V's is indeed um, what we as physicians and clinicians would, would think about as V's, that is an expiratory noise. This is a clever study that was done by Heather Elphick from Sheffield, which shows that a lot of times the rattliness or rattliness as it is described is mistaken for V's. Now, in this study, when parents were asked to describe their child's symptom, about 40% of them described them as V's. But as you go through, as they were given more details, the proportion of V's uh, in the group started to decrease. When they were given a list of other differentials, it dropped even further. When the clinician imitated V's as this expiratory noise, <laughs> that sort of an expiratory noise, that drip dropped even further. And finally, when they were sh shown video, you can now see that about half of children, the number of children reported as having V's dropped by half, whereas those children who now had rattliness increased quite rapidly. So it is important to now make sure that what parents described as wheezing is indeed a wheeze and it's not rattliness. As I said before, because this group consists of fairly heterogeneous um, it, conditions, it is important to be aware of some of the red flags which should make us worried. And this could be a list of red flags that one might need to consider um, and either if they are present, either investigate accordingly or if they are absent, then it gives us that bit of reassurance that we are dealing with uh, with a condition perhaps not as severe as some of these other conditions. So antenatally detected abnormality might might be a, a bright bubble, which might point us towards cystic fibrosis. If they have had stormy neonatal period, especially a term baby, then that might indicate some of developmental lung disorders. Earlier the onset of symptoms, more we need to be worried that there may be an alternative diagnosis. 
chronic wet cough with no periods of remission is indicative of a separative lung disease and the most common cause of separative lung disease in this part of the world is cystic fibrosis it is important to remember that although all children in in the uk get screened for cystic fibrosis we do miss um, a number of, a small number of these uh, children um, uh, with a current screening program especially those from ethnic minorities if they have abnormal signs if they do not respond to the treatments if they have history of vomiting uh, or wheeze associated with feeding might point us towards an airway problem similarly if they have had sudden onset symptoms might suggest foreign body uh, and so on and so forth so once you've ruled out the red flags um, then this algorithm might be helpful in deciding who needs regular treatments and when i say regular treatment this is treatment with inhaled corticosteroids so the inhaled corticosteroids is to target that group of preschool wheezers who might have asthma or who have asthma and what we are trying to do with inhaled corticosteroids here is not only improve their symptoms decrease their um, uh, exacerbations uh, but also minimize the airway remodeling that might happen in the longer term this is more easily implementable um, in secondary care because as you can see this particular algorithm seems to suggest uh, looking for or confirming aero allergen sensitization which is um, which is not that easily available or uh, perform we cannot perform that with that great ease in primary care now the national group is working on an algorithm similar to this that should come out in the coming months but during that period if clinically there is a history of aero allergen sensitization then it might be um, quite reasonable to give a low dose inhaled corticosteroids um, or intermittent high dose inhaled corticosteroids and leukotriene antagonists um, but as i said there will be more guidance coming out in this area from the national group in in the coming weeks and months so i will now move on to asthma diagnosis asthma diagnosis is still a clinical diagnosis um, so the diagnosis is based on presence of supportive signs and symptoms uh, it's a dry tight cough um, it is not a persistent wet cough persistent wet cough is a separative lung disease as i've said before this applies for children over 5 years of age too if there is a physician diagnosed wheeze then it makes our uh, diagnosis a little bit more tight there is associated shortness of breath in some instances or in majority or in quite a big proportion there may be other atopic symptoms hay fevers eczemas pet allergies so on and so forth in addition to this we look for absence of signs and symptoms that may suggest an alternative diagnosis like a cystic fibrosis or primary ciliary dyskinesia and so on so the symptoms to watch out for are persistent wet cough if there is wet cough and if it is persistent that needs further investigation if uh, they have poor growth again this would suggest an alternative diagnosis an asthmatic is never clubbed if there is clubbing then that would again suggest in lung context it would suggest a, a, a separative lung disease and that needs further investigation there is more emphasis on objective assessment um, and objective confirmation um, of diagnosis of asthma there are various algorithms that have come into operation uh, that have been suggested whether it is gina guidelines nice guidelines that encourages use of spirometry and uh, exhaled nitric oxide now this is a good idea but then it comes with quite a lot of limitations first and foremost these investigations are not available widely across primary care or even secondary care and let's assume for a second that these investigations were available widely we know that a normal lung function and uh, exhaled nitric oxide uh, does not rule out asthma um, so if the symptoms were present you would still probably treat them as asthma and then monitor their progress so what becomes then more important is that clinical history and clinical examination um, and then the follow up of these children looking at response to the asthma treatment becomes more important than the actual investigations themselves 
what about those group of children who may not have many symptoms much symptoms at all but who may have lowish lung function are we going to miss them well yes theoretically it is possible but that can again be minimized by good history examination attention to drug history such as how many salbutamol inhalers have they picked up in the last year have they been picking up as many inhaled corticosteroid inhalers uh, so on and so forth um so my feeling is please do not hold back treatment waiting for spirometry we do see referrals in our clinics where uh, they have been referred in for a spirometry uh, to confirm diagnosis of asthma as i said a normal spirometry will not rule out diagnosis of asthma uh, where the treatment has been withheld these kids and youngsters have not been started on inhaled corticosteroids or, or the other appropriate treatments and i would encourage us not to hold back treatment Uh, because asthma can still be diagnosed clinically of course there are a group of children where objective assessment uh, needs to be um, uh, more of a central focus uh, but for vast majority the treatment can be commenced without these investigations um so there is also a concern from uh, this paper that i have quoted there that we may under recognize asthma diagnosis if it is solely based on spirometry um, so therefore um it is not as clear cut as some of these guidelines actually suggest uh, i would still encourage clinical discretion we have shown in this particular pilot project which i'm going to come to in a at a later stage by um concentrating on essential asthma care that i define as good history good examination starting on right treatment and the right education we have shown in 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 this pilot project that asthma control has improved in this pilot project we did not introduce uh, lung function tests such as spirometry or exhaled nitric oxide for all children they were available for a group of children where there was a diagnostic uncertainty or those kids who were not improving so there is still quite a lot that we can tighten up on through essential Uh, uh, uh delivering good quality essential asthma care i will now move on to the treatments in terms of asthma so the asthma pen pendulum in the 1960 from 1960s um, to the present time has swung back and forth a bit so in the 60s it was a lot of use of beta uh, beta 2 agonists that was mostly symptomatic treatment um but as we came into the 2000s inhaled corticosteroids became available uh, so more use of inhaled corticosteroids as a preventative treatment um but the difficulty still remains that the uptake of inhaled corticosteroids is it remains poor so that means a number of a significant proportion of patients either adults children they are using salbutamol inhalers as a reliever without paying much attention in some instances to taking inhaled steroids uh, regularly and that is where the interest of using a combination of inhaled steroids and a longer acting beta 2 agonist such as formitrol is now of um, is 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 gaining uh, more popularity so this is then such a strategy of use of formitrol which is a long acting beta agonist and inhaled corticosteroids would actually treat both inflammation steroids would treat inflammation and bronchoconstriction would be treated by the long acting beta 2 agonists this is reflected in the gina guidelines both for 12 plus as well as uh, 6 to 11 years of age where um, one of the pathways is to treat in steps 1 and 2 Uh, instead of just using salbutamol as prn to use low dose inhaled corticosteroids and formitrol for reliever medication and then that continues through the other steps as well so there is low dose maintenance dose of inhaled steroids and formitrol but the reliever therapy is low dose inhaled steroids and formitrol and just not salbutamol on its own um similarly gina recommends this as a possible approach for 6 to 11 year olds as well um so the implications of this is the inhaled steroids and and long acting beta agonist combination might become the norm in few years time and we may not be using salbutamol just on its own uh, for 6 years and over but at this particular point in time there is lack of right dose and the right device for 6 to 11 year olds 
Institution of dry powder device requires more training and better follow-up, which I will touch on again. So for now, this might be a very good strategy for selected individuals over 12 years of age. So using inhaled steroids and long-acting beta agonists as both a preventer as well as a reliever therapy. The other common problems persist. So in this study that we performed at Children's Hospital as well as in the region, um, we have shown that quite a number of our patients do not know when their inhaler is empty, irrespective of whether the inhaler has a dose counter or not. As we know, the salbutamol inhaler does not have a dose counter, and we found that about three-fourths of the patients um, deemed an empty inhaler either as being full or partially full. So this is quite dangerous. So in our clinics now, part of our excess, uh, uh, you know, education involves uh, the dangers of having this inhaler, uh, empty inhaler as well as the dangers of not being able to spot this. Similarly, even with those steroid inhalers, uh, which have a dose counter, we showed that about 18% with those on preventative inhalers with a dose counters, in fact, were empty. The other thing that we have highlighted in this study is that a majority of the inhalers are disposed of in a dustbin. So this is, we need to be aware of this. Again, these charts, these tables, essentially highlight the same points that I have made uh, in the previous slide. Um, educating um, the uh, families about empty inhalers is extremely important and safe disposal, returning it back to pharmacy is also important. Of course, we hope that very soon the salbutamol inhalers will carry a dose counter as well. Um, however, this is work in progress. We've all seen the recent guidance on dry powder inha inhalers as well as its positive impact on uh, the environment. And I, I know there is going to be a talk around this um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the meeting. Um, there is a word of caution here. Um, it is quite clear that a number of children and youngsters are unable to use dry powder device. Uh, therefore, changing them uh, from a meter dose inhaler to dry powder device needs proper assessment. Patient's choice has to be taken into account. It is well known that dry powder device requires at least three times the education compared to a meter dose inhaler used with a spacer. Um, and also ongoing follow-up is, is important because we do find that some youngsters will start off all right using dry powder device, but in a few weeks time, um, in fact, they, have, they will start struggling um, and then that needs to be picked up and they need to be switched back to meter dose inhaler with spacer. So uh, I would not recommend a blanket change, uh, but this needs to be underpinned by um, getting the foundation structures right, where there is a proper education, proper follow up in place before we do this for children and youngsters. Otherwise, we will be putting these children and youngsters at risk. Um, so please. Um, take this with uh, with a bit of a caution. What's happening in uncontrolled and difficult asthma? Um, now, various nomenclatures um, are there um, that I have demonstrated there. Uh, majority of the uncontrolled or difficult to treat asthma have modifiable factors, just, just, just such as poor adherence. Um, they may not be taking their inhalers the right way, and so on and so forth. When all of these modifiable factors have been addressed, there will remain a small proportion of children and youngsters who have truly severe treatment refractory asthma. Um, and they require, uh, they may require um, more and more medications and the biologics um, uh, really. But even in this group with severe disease, uh, quite a lot of them still do have these modifiable factors. They may have periods where they have adherent to the medication, but then that adherence drops down, the technique drops down. So we've got to get that foundation right, uh, even for this group of children. So the in difficult to treat asthma, there is quite a complex interplay of various issues, adherence, stress. We know post-COVID, there is an increase in mental health issues. 
particularly among uh, among the youngsters dysfunctional breathing um, we are seeing more and more of this and some symptoms of anxiety is actually mimic asthma so we've got to really understand take a detailed psychosocial history in these kids there's quite a lot of safeguarding concerns in this group in a proportion of patients um, so this requires um, quite a holistic multidisciplinary assessment so who needs to be referred to severe asthma service then so those children and youngsters who are on maintenance oral steroids who have been admitted to intensive care treat, uh, unit for treatment of a severe exa life threatening exacerbation and who are on high dose inhaled steroids um, and they are still have a poor symptom control and then the national asthma bundle defines the symptom control it gives more information on that so the severe asthma service is really an mdt approach uh, this is what we do in west midlands um, the the q code here takes through takes uh, you to a list of documents that we have produced um, and a list of approaches that we have produced so feel free to um, use them uh, as you see appropriate and again there is list of resources that comes with the national asthma bundle and i'm i'm quite pleased to say that some of the documents that we produced in our region have been formed the national asthma bundle too but the problem still remains that despite all of these um, uh, advances, uh, the essential asthma treatment and monitoring remains suboptimal. And, and if we can actually get this right um, collectively as healthcare as well as non healthcare sectors, we will make a big difference to the lives of our children and youngsters with asthma. I would like to take you through some of the pilot projects that we have put he here at Birmingham and Solihull integrated care system um, in order to make headway towards this. So how do we um, implement the National Asthma Care Bundle? Because let's face it, quite a lot of things in the bundle, um, well, quite a lot, most of it is nothing new. It is just that we have not been able to implement what we have known for a long, long time. So what we wanted to achieve um, in terms of our asthma I don't think any of you will have any objections to um, uh, to the outcomes that I have put here. But what we wanted to do is start with focusing uh, at risk children, because how do we bite size this problem? So we sort of thought about some of these groups as at risk children. They are at risk of having more exacerbations and they could potentially have more serious and life threatening exacerbations too. In terms of our preventative agenda, we wanted to focus on indoor and outdoor air, uh, air quality. We have devised um, or evolved our, own, our risk stratification approach here, which is a modification of the national risk stratification approach. And this has been supported by some big data too, wherein using this risk stratification, we can identify children and stratify them into a red, amber, and green risks um, uh, from the primary care system. So we have evolved a methodology where for each particular practice or a primary care network or a partnership, uh, we can use this risk stratification to give us the baseline of the problem that we are essentially trying to solve. And in terms of integration, we want to take expertise out to where it is required but then build expertise and capabilities as a system. So in fact, in order to, for us to look at this as a system resource and move away from the traditional thinking of this is primary care, this is secondary care, tertiary care type of approach. Of course, this needs to be underpinned by absolute co-production engagement with children and youngsters and communities. Um, and we are linking in very heavily with schools, school as a way into get, getting a, a potential way or a gateway into the community. Um, we are looking at data and we are underpinning some of this with some qualitative as well as quantitative research. And I won't bore you with these work streams. There is a clinical work stream data. School and community is a big work stream for us. And the thing that I would like to point out here is school as a resource of community engagement. And particularly, we are looking at engaging schools in careers in NHS because this is one something that schools have been crying out uh, loud. Um, they have engagement from other uh, businesses, whereas 
as NHS, we hardly engage with schools and some of our asthma projects are linked with workplace experience placements projects uh, for secondary school and six farmers. So we've got three pilots going on at the moment, but I have reserved uh, results on all three of those pilots, but in interest of time, I'm going to take you through to one of the pilots and this is the work before I do that. This is the work that we've been doing with one of the schools there uh, spending a lot of time looking at education, uh, looking at having basic asthma uh, infrastructure at school, as well as creating that bit of champions in school among staff, amongst pupils, as well as families. So let me talk through the East Birmingham locality asthma project. It is in one of the most, East Birmingham is in one of the uh, most deprived areas. In fact, about 40% of Birmingham population is in the 20% most deprived areas. Um, uh, so, you know, this becomes very important when you look through the lens of health inequalities as well. It is ethnically and culturally very diverse. Um, there are at least seven to ten different languages spoken um, in this part of the city. And what we have done here is a health integration project that has involved seven primary care networks, two acute hospitals, early help, um, as well as schools. We launched this program in March 22, but bearing in mind that we lost two weeks for Easter as well as few weeks for school holidays, um, you know, although in theory this project has been going on for six months, the uh, it has really been less than six months uh, since the launch of this. We have seen um, this is the data as it was on the 7th of November. Um, so we don't, uh, I'm still looking at the data from last two or three weeks. We had seen more than 200 patients in this clinic and 77 of these patients have had further appointments in this clinic between four and eight weeks after their first visit. Um, most patients are under 11 of years of age. There's quite a big proportion of under fives in this group as well. 67% um, majority of the patients had inappropriate equipment. Um, they were either on the wrong spacer um, uh, uh, and they were and the and obviously they were given the right equipment at the clinic. Majority of them um, was changing over from a yellow aero chamber with a mask to a volumatic spacer with a mouthpiece. Although 95% of them had reliever medication when attending the clinic, um, only about 64% of them had a preventative medication on attendance. And out of these, um, you know, about half of them were not using their preventers correctly at all, and they were not on the right dose. So quite a big proportion of these children did not have, were not on preventative medication. So 61 of them were, uh, 61 patients, that's 31%, were given a new preventer or, or a dose adjusted. Um, but, you know, majority of them who were on preventer therapy were not using it properly. None of them could actually show us an acute management plan. This doesn't mean that they haven't been given one and haven't been discussed, but they were unable to explain acute management plan uh, when we saw them in the clinic. So by getting our basic or essential management rights, we have shown we, we have shown results of improvement in asthma control tests. Uh, we have repeat asthma control tests in about 69 patients. At baseline, the median was 14, that has gone up to 19, and with a significant uh, p-value. Uh, and we have more and more data come out um, with the asthma control tests um, in the last few weeks as well. In terms of user feedback, we have this information now. Well, as, as was 7th of September, we had feedback from 44 families. The feedbacks we looked at is not only service evaluation, but also uh, the impact of the clinic consultations on, on patient and parent understanding of asthma. And I'm pleased to say that uh, almost all of the feedbacks have shown positive uh, movement, both in terms of the service provision as well as in the asthma education we've given. And there are a number of comments such as these that we have received from the families. And as I said, you know, I've got another two or three weeks worth of data to add to this, um, uh, to this data. We've been working with local schools in that area, um, and one particular school that I want to highlight is where we have piloted asthma-friendly school program. 
we have done the asthma policies, asthma registers. Um, this particular school has high non-attendance due to asthma. And in next two weeks, we'll be holding our first asthma clinic at school um, uh, here. And this model is now being rolled out, uh, rolled out, sorry, to another two schools in Birmingham. So the intention is that some of these asthma annual reviews can be delivered in the community and in the schools. So what we have essentially shown in East Birmingham pilot is a way of actually health responding to health inequalities. We have shown that we can bring health integration, um, you know, primary, secondary and tertiary care together. And we have focused on access to health care. Um, it is a locality service. Uh, so where, uh, you know, it is easier for the families to get to these clinics. Um, and with us launching the school clinics, that access should get even more easier. And the access into this, uh, we uh, our ambition is to have multiple access points into this service through school teachers, et cetera, et cetera. We have shown that by delivering high quality care, that is really by removing unwarranted clinical variations um, in essential asthma care, um, come and connect, we can connect to communities, and we are still very early in developing asthma champions in the community. So just by getting our basics right, we have essentially shown that there has been a short term improvement in the asthma outcomes. Now, in order to sustain this, this needs to be now plugged into non health sectors such as councils, schools, etc. a lot more robustly because health promotion, health prevention comes into equation when we are now talking about sustaining these changes. What we are now evolving to is, as I said, this is just one of the pilot projects. We've got another two pilot projects that are showing similar kind of results. We are now developing a BSOL, Birmingham Solihull heat map for asthma, common templates against primary care, which makes data collection a lot more easier, asthma clinics at school, as well as integration with non-health sectors, as I said before, particularly focusing on air quality and healthy living. So what I would like to end by saying is that more than the new knowledge, more than the clinical up, uh, new clinical update, I think it is successful implementation of current knowledge that is the need of the hour. That requires an health, it requires a very much an integrated approach. And the model that we are involving in Birmingham Solihull Health for health inequalities is around accessibility, removing unwarranted clinical variation, integrate with local resources, and then empower community. And that is essentially where we are now uh, concentrating on. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Satish. Brilliant presentation, overview of all of the current clinical thinking and issues um, in uh, diagnosing, assessing and managing children's asthma. And I think what that presentation demonstrated is how hugely complex it all is. It's just not simple. It's uh, everything needs to come together. And that's why this integrated approach is so important. Um, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Prasad Nagakumar right now. Um, I don't know if you're able to pop your camera on, Prasad, and unmute yourself. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so Hi, welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Prasad. So um, you, you've you volunteered to step in and answer any questions on Satish's behalf. <laughs> you work closely with them at Birmingham Children's Hospital. And um, I would just like to say I'm delighted to see you here. You're a, a great colleague of mine on a uh, Birmingham Children's Hospital. And you and your team are a huge support for the work that we're doing in the black country. So thank you for that. Um, we have some clinical questions coming in and there's much for us to discuss, but we do only have 10 minutes. So I know you've answered a couple of questions already in the chat. So if um, anybody hasn't seen those, please go and have a look at them. I think we still need to touch again on diagnosis. I think it's the real big issue. It's a really huge and difficult issue. Um, and, and for me, the real issue is that we have all of these guidelines, all of this evidence that's telling us that um, we have high rates of misdiagnosis of asthma in children and young people and we need to be doing more objective tests and then we have nice guidelines, British asthma guidelines, the ERS children's asthma guidelines all saying do objective tests, well perhaps less so BTS, but do objective tests and start with spirometry 
And then on the other hand, when I speak to people who are very experienced at managing children and young people's asthma, for them, it's all about the clinical picture. Um, and in primary care, which is where the vast majority of children and young people certainly are seen in the first instance with suspected asthma, you know, they are also being driven by targets like QOF targets, which say that um, a diagnosis must be confirmed in children over six from six years of age. Diagnosis must be confirmed by objective tests, starting with spirometry. Would you agree it's a mess? And how on earth can we unpick it? Thanks, Bill. <laughs> it's a good start, isn't it? For the very simple question. Thank you. Yeah, very simple. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. It's it's a mess. Um, and I, I think what uh, 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 you might have heard me saying the same thing many times before. I think it's, it's good to see that we're moving towards um, looking at some objective tasks, uh, which which I think is important. Asthma, you know, we you know probably it's like fever. You know, it could be sort of it could mean a lot of kind of different things. But I, I think if you go back to things like diabetes, you know, you can do a fingerprint test and hopefully in majority of cases you know if someone is diabetic or not and, and we don't have that kind of a test and it becomes very difficult particularly in young children in primary care for the you know primary care team to give them a diagnosis yes you know th this is asthma without any objective test um, but do we have one do we, but unfortunately there is no gold standard objective test to, to, to diagnose asthma and, and and yes, it's really good to see a lot of guidelines coming out saying that you know, this needs to be done. Uh, there are two aspects here. One is um, I don't think any of these tasks are definitive. Uh, for example, if I see someone, a child who has symptoms suggestive of asthma, but has got a normal spirometry and pheno, how confident I am in saying that your child doesn't have asthma, don't take inhalers, go away. So I don't think sort of in a way these tests are able to sort of in a way tell us, particularly when they are normal. And the current guidelines, I mean, I would recommend people reading Claire Murray's fantastic paper in Lancet. If you look at uh, looking at her big data, the proportion of patients who who would have been diagnosed with asthma using the current cutoffs, it's very, very small. So what are we going to do with the others? Are we going to say you don't have asthma, stop your treatment? I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and we haven't fully agreed on 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 the cutoffs um, uh, of, of, of each of these parameters. That's one thing. And the second crucial thing is the implementation. It's well enough to have all this sort of in a way nice flow charts and graphs, which is very important because a lot of effort has gone in um, um, in producing these documents. And it's good to see that there is more evidence based documents coming out. But implementation is very difficult. Again, Claire Murray, she, she, she has shown very sort of nicely. Uh, and even in from my experience working in a specialist children's hospital where we got trained pediatric physiologists, getting a pheno in a seven year old nowadays making children breathe normally is very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so you can see that in, in a primary care setting when you've got limited resources, limited time, um, you know, asking people to do this this in a really large scale, uh, it is it is really challenging. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what the answer is going to be, but I think it's good to know that there is a mood towards people thinking about it rather than giving inhalers to everyone, saying that it's asthma. You know, if, if you get better, you know, you carry on. And then for parents, from our feedback, what we get to some of our research projects is that they would like someone to tell them definitely, particularly the younger children, whether yeah. they've got asthma or not. Um, yeah, it, it is a mess, but but it's good to see that there is some focus on generating evidence and clearly the national asthma transformation work on particularly getting the diagnostic hubs and things like that. They may provide more information. Uh, just to finish off, if you look at some of the adult data, what I've seen, these hubs, they are able to pick up more adults who don't have asthma, have COPD or something else than actually diagnosing asthma. Yeah, yeah. So it remains hugely challenging. Um, yeah, but we will keep trying. Um, thank you. So we have a, a comment and a question here. Very great work for Satish and the team. Um, I was wondering if your team encountered barriers like language and cultural beliefs and how any targeted interventions surmounted these with some of the project work that you're doing. 
Uh, thank you. I mean, uh, we are looking into sort of in a way, for example, if you things like asthma plants, and um, this has again come out to, to, to patients, we, we give them the asthma plan, but actually it's not in their language. If, if you go to the families that they're unable to read, and I think less than 12 year olds, so I don't think we have sort of uh, asthma plants in uh, other languages except for English. So, so, so through the George Collar charity, which Satish was mentioning, we, we, we and Sue Frost, uh, we've been working on developing uh, uh, so, so some action plans or getting some videos so that people can understand. So these are all part of the ongoing work. But for the specific question about how we uh, are uh, breaking these barriers, I think it's about in involving the communities, get someone who can sort of uh, speak their language in a sense. It's, it's not literal language, but also make them understand. Uh, and, and that's a huge, huge piece of work, which which I think is going to take a lot of our time over the next two years. Yes, indeed. I think so, but we've heard so much about this today. Um, health inequalities was a big focus this morning, and um, we're obviously all becoming increasingly aware of, of the importance. Um, a question, I think this is a simple one for you to answer. Could school nurses be a key partner in engaging schools? Absolutely. I mean, I'm Definitely, it's, it's it's a shame that a lot of funding has been taken out of uh, this really vital service. Um, and then, and then the part of the work which we are doing, so sort of, uh, we, we do clinics and GP surgeries, and as part of uh, the, the the pilot projects which we are doing, they all have an MDT meeting, which involves local school nurses who can now, courtesy to COVID, everything we're doing it virtually so so it's easy for them to sort of join in for 15 minutes 20 minutes and then particularly the challenging um, cases or the difficulties we we have in getting gathering more information or trying to understand what's going on that school nurses play a really vital role um, yeah. and then let's hope that that services is kind of you know, it's going to carry on uh, yeah with robust funding support yeah, indeed, and I, I would echo that wholeheartedly. And um, Prasad, I've just got one last question. Um, I've got one minute for this. Um, I just, you know, I want you to just pick up on the point about knowing when inhalers are empty. I know it's a subject that's very dear to your heart. You've led on this research and, and Prasad, um, Satish mentioned it in the presentation, but, you know, how can we how can we take this forward? How can we get to the stage where children and young people know when their blue reliever inhaler is empty um, and make sure that, you know, we reduce risk for children thinking there's still medication in their inhalers and there's not? I am, again, there's no simple answer to this. So, I mean, um, I think highlighting the importance of of, of, of of this issue is, is I think is quite vital. Um, it's also important to bear in mind that say any inhaler for most of them say they contain 200 doses, that's what is recommended. So the 201st and 202nd dose, I suspect they do have some medicines yes. and I don't want people to be alarmed that it's completely empty, but we don't know what, what, what proportion. It's clearly not going to be same, but but I'm sure that there's going to be a few extra doses which do have medicines. Um, I think it's high. But that's what sort of in a way, you know, thanks to you and a lot of other people, we have been highlighting this this issue, which is kind of in a way. Um, the first thing is to, to to make sure that there is increased awareness uh, for 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 not for families, healthcare professionals. I think yeah. that's quite vital. And as I said, as part of your essential asthma care, this needs to be. You know, you mm. talk about inhaler technique. Along with that, I think we also have to kind of discuss with them to, to be mindful um, of, of this issue. How do we move forward in an ideal world with this information, having dose counters? I think it would be crucial, but just having dose counters without the information is not going to work because we have shown very clearly every week in my clinic, I see one kid who, who is using sort of an way an inhaler and you can't blame them because parents want to use it because yeah. they don't want to waste it. They think yeah. there are medicines, they press it, they see something coming out, they carry on using. I think both combination of dose counters on, on the sort of uh, highlighting the issue, making everyone aware, I think probably would be the way forward. Yeah, 
excellent. I think that's a great point to finish on. Um, and just to maybe tell everybody that we're involved in updating the national inhaler standards with a children and young person's perspective. And we're very much going to make sure that that message about educating our patients to understand that even though an inhaler will continue to puff, um, it may well be empty of medication. So thanks ever so much, Prasad. That was um, excellent to have you with us today. So Thank you. This brings us to the end of the day, everybody. It's been absolutely fantastic. You can see on the screens we've got a final Mentimeter question. It would be really great if we could get you to answer this now. What will you change following today's event? If there's one thing you can take back to practice, what will it be? And can you commit to doing that is what I would um, urge you to do. And while that's going on, um, I think it's just really an opportunity for me as the afternoon's chair to, uh, I'd love to sum up the whole day, um, but to really focus on the afternoon. We've had so many fantastic speakers and I'd like to say thank you to all of them. I think Darush, you really highlighted the um, and, and brought home some of the important things to think about alongside this green inhaler agenda that we're all hearing about, that it's all about the right inhaler for the right patient at the right time. Um, and Rosamond, what can I say? Your presentation about air pollution and you know the, the, that the fight must go on regarding that is absolutely vital and thank you so much for that. Um, Professor Sir Stephen Holgate, you really made the case for that and you show that the evidence was, um, you know, it's insurmountable now and we really there's no further argument about it. That was a brilliant session on air pollution. And then we talked about um, transition in our adolescent population. We had some fantastic stuff um, and offers of support as well in the Q&A with links from the Bidet National Transition Nursing Network. So do please engage with that. Katie, a brilliant policy um, update. There's loads of work going on uh, at national level and some really insightful messages from Professor Rob Horn um, about intentional and uh, non-intentional um, poor adherence or non-adherence. The preventable film I think was really um, thought provoking for all of us and it was great to hear from TIFF about the data and we'll all be watching this space for future de um, um, developments in that. And then finally we had a brilliant update, a clinical update really from Satish and from um, Prasad, um, our two paediatricians at Birmingham Children's Hospital. Thank you so much. I think you really, what you really highlighted was how complex it is and uh, you know we've all been working very hard but there's still a lot of work to be done. So I think um, that's really it from me. That's a sum up. Thank you for your um, uh, engagement with the Mentimeter. It's really great to see um, all of those comments coming in now. Obviously, we learned earlier, the, the, the bigger the comment, the more people are talking about it. So transition is a big one and rightly so. Um, pollution, indoor pollution, I'm looking at a focus on air pollution. I'm really glad to hear that. I think it's really important. Um, lots of mention of air quality, but also patient um, education and inhaler technique, which really sums up the afternoon very, very well. So I think thank you, everybody. And um, in closing uh, the conference today, I think it's really important to thank you to the organisers, a huge team of people involved um, in this. So thank you, everybody. Um, you've done really, really well. And when there's been the slight technical glitch, you've handled it really well as well. So great work. And if I could ask everybody to complete their evaluation forms, it's really enormously helpful um, in developing the programme for next year. And I'm sure we'll see you all again next year. Thank you very much.